Jem would struggle the rest of an evening through the speeches of Henry W. Grady. Link, that boy might go to the chair, but he's not going till the truth's told. Atticus's voice was even. And you know what the truth is. There was a murmur among the group of men, made more ominous when Atticus moved back to the bottom front step and the men drew nearer to him. Suddenly, Jem screamed, Atticus, the telephone's ringing! The men jumped a little and scattered. They were people we saw every day, merchants, in-town farmers. Dr. Reynolds was there. So was Mr. Avery. Well... Answer it, son, called Atticus. Laughter broke them up. When Atticus switched on the overhead light in the living room, he found Jem at the window, pale, except for the vivid mark of the screen on his nose. Why on earth are you all sitting in the dark, he asked. Jem watched him go to his chair and pick up the evening paper. I sometimes think Atticus subjected every crisis of his life to tranquil evaluation behind the Mobile Register, the Birmingham News, and the Montgomery Advertiser. They were after you, weren't they? Jem went to him. They wanted to get you, didn't they? Atticus lowered the paper and gazed at Jem. What have you been reading? he asked. Then he said gently, No, son. Those were our friends. It wasn't a... a gang? Jem was looking from the corners of his eyes. Atticus tried to stifle a smile, but didn't make it. No, we don't have mobs and that nonsense in Maycomb. I've never heard of a gang in Maycomb. Ku Klux got after some Catholics one time. Never heard of any Catholics in Maycomb either, said Atticus. You're confusing that with something else. Way back about 1920, there was a clan, but it was a political organization more than anything. Besides, they couldn't find anybody to scare. They paraded by Mr. Sam Levy's house one night, but Sam just stood on his porch and told them things had come to a pretty pass. He had sold them the very sheets on their backs. Sam made them so ashamed of themselves they went away. The Levy family met all criteria for being fine folks. They did the best they could with the sense they had, and they had been living on the same plot of ground in Maycomb for five generations. The Ku Klux is gone, said Atticus. It'll never come back. I walked home with Dill and returned in time to overhear Atticus saying to Auntie, in favor of Southern womanhood as much as anybody, but not for preserving polite fiction at the expense of human life. A pronouncement that made me suspect they had been fussing again. I sought Jem and found him in his room, on the bed, deep in thought. Have they been at it? I asked. Sort of. She won't let him alone about Tom Robinson. She almost said Atticus was disgracing the family. Scout, I'm scared. Scared of what? Scared about Atticus. Somebody might hurt him. Jem preferred to remain mysterious. All he would say to my questions was, go on and leave him alone. Next day was Sunday. In the interval between Sunday school and church, when the congregation stretched its legs, I saw Atticus standing in the yard with another knot of men. Mr. Heck Tate was present, and I wondered if he had seen the light. He never went to church. Even Mr. Underwood was there. Mr. Underwood had no use for any organization but the Maycomb Tribune, of which he was the sole owner, editor, and printer. His days were spent at his linotype, where he refreshed himself occasionally from an ever-present gallon jug of cherry wine. He rarely gathered news. People brought it to him. It was said that he made up every edition of the Maycomb Tribune out of his own head and wrote it down on the linotype. 
This was believable. Something must have been up to haul Mr. Underwood out. I caught Atticus coming in the door, and he said that they had moved Tom Robinson to the Maycomb jail. He also said, more to himself than to me, that if they'd kept him there in the first place, there wouldn't have been any fuss. I watched him take his seat on the third row from the front, and I heard him rumble, Nearer, my God, to thee, some notes behind the rest of us. He never sat with Auntie, Jem, and me. He liked to be by himself in church. The fake peace that prevailed on Sundays was made more irritating by Aunt Alexandra's presence. Atticus would flee to his office directly after dinner, where, if we sometimes looked in on him, we would find him sitting back in his swivel chair reading. Aunt Alexandra composed herself for a two-hour nap and dared us to make any noise in the yard. The neighborhood was resting. Jim, in his old age, had taken to his room with a stack of football magazines. So Dill and I spent our Sundays creeping around in deer's pasture. Shooting on Sundays was prohibited, so Dill and I kicked Jem's football around the pasture for a while, which was no fun. Dill asked if I'd like to have a poke at Boo Radley. I said I didn't think it'd be nice to bother him and spent the rest of the afternoon filling Dill in on last winter's events. He was considerably impressed. We parted at supper time, and after our meal, Jem and I were settling down to a routine evening when Atticus did something that interested us. He came into the living room carrying a long electrical extension cord. There was a light bulb on the end. I'm going out for a while, he said. You folks will be in bed when I come back, so I'll say good night now. With that, he put his hat on and went out the back door. He's taken the car, said Jem. Our father had a few peculiarities. One was he never ate desserts. Another was that he liked to walk. As far back as I could remember, there was always a Chevrolet in excellent condition in the car house and Atticus put many miles on it in business trips, but in Maycomb he walked to and from his office four times a day, covering about two miles. He said his only exercise was walking. In Maycomb, if one went for a walk with no definite purpose in mind, it was correct to believe one's mind incapable of definite purpose. Later on I bade my aunt and brother good night and was well into a book when I heard Jem rattling around in his room. His go-to-bed noises were so familiar to me that I knocked on his door. Why ain't you going to bed? I'm going downtown for a while. He was changing his pants. Why? It's almost ten o'clock, Jem. He knew it, but he was going anyway. Then I'm going with you. If you say no, you're not. I'm going anyway, hear? Jem saw that he would have to fight me to keep me home, and I suppose he thought a fight would antagonize Auntie, so he gave in with little grace. I dressed quickly. We waited until Auntie's light went out, and we walked quietly down the back steps. There was no moon tonight. Dill will want to come, I whispered. So he will, said Jem gloomily. We leaped over the driveway wall, cut through Miss Rachel's side yard, and went to Dill's window. Jem whistled Bob White. Dill's face appeared at the screen, disappeared, and five minutes later he unhooked the screen and crawled out. An old campaigner, he did not speak until we were on the sidewalk. What's up? Jem's got the look-arounds. An affliction Calpurnia said all boys caught at his age. I just got this feeling, Jem said. Just this feeling. We went by Mrs. DeBose's house, standing empty and shuttered, her camellias grown up in weeds and Johnson grass. There were eight more houses to the post office corner. The south side of the square was deserted. 
Giant monkey puzzle bushes bristled on each corner, and between them an iron hitching rail glistened under the street lights. A light shone in the county toilet; otherwise, that side of the courthouse was dark. A larger square of stores surrounded the courthouse square. Dim lights burned from deep within them. Atticus's office was in the courthouse when he began his law practice, but after several years of it, he moved to quieter quarters in the Maycomb Bank Building. When we rounded the corner of the square, we saw the car parked in front of the bank. He's in there," said Jem. But he wasn't. His office was reached by a long hallway. Looking down the hall, we should have seen Atticus Finch, attorney at law, in small sober letters against the light from behind his door. It was dark. Jem peered in the bank door to make sure. He turned the knob. The door was locked. Let's go up the street. Maybe he's visiting Mr. Underwood. Mr. Underwood not only ran the Maycomb Tribune office; he lived in it, that is, above it. He covered the courthouse and jailhouse news simply by looking out his upstairs window. The office building was on the northwest corner of the square, and to reach it, we had to pass the jail. The Maycomb Jail was the most venerable and hideous of the county's buildings. Atticus said it was like something cousin Joshua Saint Clair might have designed. It was certainly someone's dream. Starkly out of place in a town of square-faced stores and steep-roofed houses, the Maycomb Jail was a miniature Gothic joke, one cell wide and two cells high, complete with tiny battlements and flying buttresses. Its fantasy was heightened by its red brick facade. And the thick steel bars at its ecclesiastical windows. It stood on no lonely hill, but was wedged between Tyndall's Hardware Store and the Maycom Tribune office. The jail was Maycom's only conversation piece. Its detractors said it looked like a Victorian privy. Its supporters said it gave the town a good, solid, respectable look, and no stranger would ever suspect that it was full of niggers. As we walked up the sidewalk, we saw a solitary light burning in the distance. That's funny," said Jem. "Jail doesn't have an outside light." "Looks like it's over the door," said Dill. A long extension cord ran between the bars of a second-floor window and down the side of the building. In the light from its bare bulb, Atticus was sitting propped against the front door. He was sitting in one of his office chairs, and he was reading, oblivious of the night bugs dancing over his head. I made to run, but Jem caught me. Don't go to him, he said. He might not like it. He's all right. Let's go home. I just wanted to see where he was. We were taking a short cut across the square when four dusty cars came in from the Meridian Highway. Moving slowly in a line, they went around the square, past the bank building, and stopped in front of the jail. Nobody got out. We saw Atticus look up from his newspaper. He closed it, folded it deliberately, dropped it in his lap, and pushed his hat to the back of his head. He seemed to be expecting them. Come on. Whispered Jem. We streaked across the square, across the street, until we were in the shelter of the Jitney Jungle door. Jem peeked up the sidewalk. We can get closer, he said. We ran to Tyndall's Hardware door, near enough, at the same time discreet. In ones and twos, men got out of the cars. Shadows became substance as lights revealed solid shapes moving toward the jail door. Atticus remained where he was. The men hid him from view. He in there, Mister Finch? A man said. He is. We heard Atticus answer, and he's asleep. Don't wake him up. In obedience to my father. 
there followed what I later realized was a sickeningly comic aspect of an unfunny situation. The men talked in near whispers. You know what we want, another man said. Get aside from that door, Mr. Finch. You can turn around and go home again, Walter, Atticus said pleasantly. Hectates around somewhere. The hell he is, said another man. Hex bunch is so deep in the woods, they won't get out till morning. Indeed? Why so? Called them off on a snipe hunt, was the succinct answer. Didn't you think of that, Mr. Finch? Thought about it, but didn't believe it. Well, then, my father's voice was still the same. That changes things, doesn't it? It do. Another deep voice said. Its owner was a shadow. Do you really think so? This was the second time I heard Atticus ask that question in two days, and it meant somebody's man would get jumped. This was too good to miss. I broke away from Jem and ran as fast as I could to Atticus. Jem shrieked and tried to catch me, but I had a lead on him and Dill. I pushed my way through dark, smelly bodies and burst into the circle of light. Hey, Atticus! I thought he would have a fine surprise, but his face killed my joy. A flash of plain fear was going out of his eyes, but returned when Dill and Jem wriggled into the light. There was a smell of stale whiskey and pig pen about. And when I glanced around, I discovered that these men were strangers. They were not the people I saw last night. Hot embarrassment shot through me. I had leaped triumphantly into a ring of people I had never seen before. Atticus got up from his chair, but he was moving slowly, like an old man. He put the newspaper down very carefully. Adjusting its creases with lingering fingers. They were trembling a little. Go home, Jem, he said. Take Scout and Dill home. We were accustomed to prompt, if not always cheerful, acquiescence to Atticus's instructions, but from the way he stood, Jem was not thinking of budging. Go home, I said. Jem shook his head. As Atticus's fists went to his hips, so did Jem's, and as they faced each other, I could see little resemblance between them. Jem's soft brown hair and eyes, his oval face and snug fitting ears were our mother's, contrasting oddly with Atticus's graying black hair and square cut features, but they were somehow alike. Mutual defiance made them alike. Son, I said go home. Jem shook his head. I'll send him home, a burly man said, and grabbed Jem roughly by the collar. He yanked Jem nearly off his feet. Don't you touch him! I kicked the man swiftly. Barefooted, I was surprised to see him fall back in real pain. I intended to kick his shin, but aimed too high. That'll do, Scout. Atticus put his hand on my shoulder. Don't kick folks. No, he said as I was pleading justification. Ain't nobody gonna do Jem that way, I said. All right, Mr. Finch, get him out of here, someone growled. You got fifteen seconds to get him out of here. In the midst of this strange assembly, Atticus stood trying to make Jem mind him. I ain't going. Was his steady answer to Atticus's threats, requests, and finally, please, Jem, take them home. I was getting a bit tired of that, but felt Jem had his own reasons for doing as he did, in view of his prospects, once Atticus did get him home. I looked around the crowd. It was a summer's night, but the men were dressed, most of them, in overalls and denim shirts buttoned up to the collars. I thought they must be cold-natured, as their sleeves were unrolled and buttoned at the cuffs. 
Some wore hats pulled firmly down over their ears. They were sullen-looking, sleepy-eyed men who seemed unused to late hours. I sought once more for a familiar face, and at the center of the semicircle I found one. Hey, Mr. Cunningham! The man did not hear me, it seemed. Hey, Mr. Cunningham! How's your entailment getting along? Mr. Walter Cunningham's legal affairs were well known to me. Atticus had once described them at length. The big man blinked and hooked his thumbs in his overall straps. He seemed uncomfortable. He cleared his throat and looked away. My friendly overture had fallen flat. Mr. Cunningham wore no hat, and the top half of his forehead was white in contrast to his sun-scorched face, which led me to believe that he wore one most days. He shifted his feet, clad in heavy work shoes. Don't you remember me, Mr. Cunningham? I'm Jean Louise Finch. You brought us some hickory nuts one time, remember? I began to sense the futility one feels when unacknowledged by a chance acquaintance. I go to school with Walter, I began again. He's your boy, ain't he? Ain't he, sir? Mr. Cunningham was moved to a faint nod. He did know me, after all. He's in my grade, I said, and he does right well. He's a good boy, I added, a real nice boy. We brought him home for dinner one time. Maybe he told you about me? I beat him up one time, but he was real nice about it. Tell him hey for me, won't you? Atticus had said it was the polite thing to talk to people about what they were interested in, not about what you were interested in. Mr. Cunningham displayed no interest in his son, so I tackled his entailment once more as a last-ditch effort to make him feel at home. Entailments are bad, I was advising him, when I slowly awoke to the fact that I was addressing the entire aggregation. The men were all looking at me. Some had their mouths half open. Atticus had stopped poking at Jem. They were standing together beside Dill. Their attention amounted to fascination. Atticus's mouth, even, was half open, an attitude he had once described as uncouth. Our eyes met, and he shut it. Well, Atticus, I was just saying to Mr. Cunningham that entailments are bad and all that, but you said not to worry. It takes a long time sometimes that you all would ride it out together. I was slowly drying up, wondering what idiocy I had committed. Entailments seemed all right enough for living room talk. I began to feel sweat gathering at the edges of my hair. I could stand anything but a bunch of people looking at me. They were quite still. What's the matter? I said. Atticus said nothing. I looked around and up at Mr. Cunningham, whose face was equally impassive. Then he did a peculiar thing. He squatted down and took me by both shoulders. I'll tell him you said hey, little lady, he said. Then he straightened up and waved a big paw. Let's clear out, he called. Let's get going, boys. As they had come, in ones and twos, the men shuffled back to their ramshackle cars. Doors slammed, engines coughed, and they were gone. I turned to Atticus, but Atticus had gone to the jail and was leaning against it with his face to the wall. I went to him and pulled his sleeve. Can we go home now? He nodded, produced his handkerchief, gave his face a going over, and blew his nose violently. Mr. Finch? A soft, husky voice came from the darkness above. They gone? Atticus stepped back and looked up. They've gone, 
he said. Get some sleep, Tom. They won't bother you any more. From a different direction, another voice cut crisply through the night. You're damn tootin' they won't. Had you covered all the time, Atticus. Mr. Underwood and a double-barreled shotgun were leaning out his window above the Maycom Tribune office. It was long past my bedtime, and I was growing quite tired. It seemed that Atticus and Mr. Underwood would talk for the rest of the night, Mr. Underwood out the window and Atticus up at him. Finally, Atticus returned, switched off the light above the jail door, and picked up his chair. Can I carry it for you, Mr. Finch? asked Dill. He had not said a word the whole time. Why, thank you, son. Walking toward the office, Dill and I fell into step behind Atticus and Jem. Dill was encumbered by the chair, and his pace was slower. Atticus and Jem were well ahead of us, and I assumed that Atticus was giving him hell for not going home. But I was wrong. As they passed under a street light, Atticus reached out and massaged Jem's hair, his one gesture of affection. Chapter 16 Jem heard me. He thrust his head around the connecting door. As he came to my bed, Atticus's light flashed on. We stayed where we were until it went off. We heard him turn over, and we waited until he was still again. Jem took me to his room and put me in bed beside him. Try to go to sleep, he said. It'll be all over after tomorrow, maybe. We had come in quietly, so as not to wake Auntie. Atticus killed the engine in the driveway and coasted to the car house. We went in the back door and to our rooms without a word. I was very tired and was drifting into sleep when the memory of Atticus calmly folding his newspaper and pushing back his hat became Atticus standing in the middle of an empty, waiting street pushing up his glasses. The full meaning of the night's events hit me, and I began crying. Jem was awfully nice about it. For once he didn't remind me that people nearly nine years old didn't do things like that. Everybody's appetite was delicate this morning, except Jem's. He ate his way through three eggs. Atticus watched in frank admiration. Aunt Alexandra sipped coffee and radiated waves of disapproval. Children who slipped out at night were a disgrace to the family. Atticus said he was right glad his disgraces had come along. But Auntie said, nonsense, Mr. Underwood was there all the time. You know, it's a funny thing about Braxton, said Atticus. He despises Negroes, won't have one near him. Local opinion held Mr. Underwood to be an intense, profane little man whose father, in a fay fit of humor, christened Braxton Bragg, a name Mr. Underwood had done his best to live down. Atticus said naming people after Confederate generals made slow, steady drinkers. Calpurnia was serving Aunt Alexandra more coffee and she shook her head at what I thought was a pleading, winning look. You're still too little, she said. I'll tell you when you ain't. I said it might help my stomach. All right, she said, and got a cup from the sideboard. She poured one tablespoonful of coffee into it and filled the cup to the brim with milk. I thanked her by sticking out my tongue at it and looked up to catch Auntie's warning frown but she was frowning at Atticus. She waited until Calpurnia was in the kitchen. Then she said, Don't talk like that in front of them. Talk like what in front of whom? he asked. Like that in front of Calpurnia. You said Braxton Underwood despises Negroes right in front of her. Well, I'm sure Cal knows it. Everybody in Maycomb knows it. I was beginning to notice a subtle change in my father these days that came out when he talked with Aunt Alexandra. 
It was a quiet digging in, never outright irritation. There was a faint starchiness in his voice when he said, Anything fit to say at the tables, fit to say in front of Calpurnia. She knows what she means to this family. I don't think it's a good habit, Atticus. It encourages them. You know how they talk among themselves. Everything that happens in this town's out to the quarters before sundown. My father put down his knife. I don't know of any law that says they can't talk. Maybe if we didn't give them so much to talk about, they'd be quiet. Why don't you drink your coffee, Scout? I was playing in it with the spoon. I thought Mr. Cunningham was a friend of ours. You told me a long time ago he was. He still is. But last night he wanted to hurt you. Atticus placed his fork beside his knife and pushed his plate aside. Mr. Cunningham's basically a good man, he said. He just has his blind spots, along with the rest of us. Jem spoke. Don't call that a blind spot. He'd have killed you last night when he first went there. He might have hurt me a little, Atticus conceded. But, son, you'll understand folks a little better when you're older. A mob's always made up of people, no matter what. Mr. Cunningham was part of a mob last night, but he was still a man. Every mob in every little southern town is always made up of people you know. Doesn't say much for them, does it? I'll say not, said Jim. So it took an eight-year-old child to bring them to their senses, didn't it? said Atticus. That proves something, that a gang of wild animals can be stopped simply because they're still human. Hmph. <laughs> Maybe we need a police force of children. You children last night made Walter Cunningham stand in my shoes for a minute. That was enough. Well, I hoped Jim would understand folks a little better when he was older. I wouldn't. First day Walter comes back to school will be his last, I affirmed. You will not touch him, Atticus said flatly. I don't want either of you bearing a grudge about this thing, no matter what happens. You see, don't you, said Aunt Alexandra, what comes of things like this? Don't say I haven't told you. Atticus said he'd never say that, pushed out his chair and got up. There's a day ahead, so excuse me. Jem. I don't want you and Scout downtown today, please. As Atticus departed, Dill came bounding down the hall into the dining room. It's all over town this morning, he announced, all about how we held off a hundred folks with our bare hands. Aunt Alexandra stared him to silence. It was not a hundred folks, she said, and nobody held anybody off. It was just a nest of those Cunninghams, drunk and disorderly. Oh, Auntie, that's just Dill's way, said Jem. He signaled us to follow him. You all stay in the yard today, she said as we made our way to the front porch. It was like Saturday. People from the south end of the county passed our house in a leisurely but steady stream. Mr. Dolphus Raymond lurched by on his thoroughbred. Don't see how he stays in the saddle, murmured Jem. How can you stand to get drunk four eight in the morning? A wagon load of ladies rattled past us. They wore cotton sunbonnets and dresses with long sleeves. A bearded man in a wool hat drove them. Yonder's some Mennonites, Jem said to Dill. They don't have buttons. They lived deep in the woods, did most of their trading across the river, and rarely came to make them. Dill was interested. They've all got blue eyes, Jem explained, and the men can't shave after they marry. Their wives like for them to tickle them with their beards. Mr. X. Billups rode by on a mule and waved to us. He's a funny man, said Jem. X is his name, not his initial. He was in court one time 
and they asked him his name. He said, X Billups. Clerk asked him to spell it, and he said, X. Asked him again, and he said, X. They kept at it till he wrote X on a sheet of paper and held it up for everybody to see. They asked him where he got his name, and he said that's the way his folks signed him up when he was born. As the county went by us, Jem gave Dill the histories and general attitudes of the more prominent figures. Mr. Tensor Jones voted the straight prohibition ticket. Miss Emily Davis dipped snuff in private. Mr. Byron Waller could play the violin. Mr. Jake Slade was cutting his third set of teeth. A wagon load of unusually stern-faced citizens appeared. When they pointed to Miss Morty Atkinson's yard, ablaze with summer flowers, Miss Morty herself came out on the porch. There was an odd thing about Miss Morty. On her porch, she was too far away for us to see her features clearly, but we could always catch her mood by the way she stood. She was now standing arms akimbo, her shoulders drooping a little, her head cocked to one side, her glasses winking in the sunlight. We knew she wore a grin of the uttermost wickedness. The driver of the wagon slowed down his mules, and a shrill-voiced woman called out, He that cometh in vanity departeth in darkness. Miss Morty answered, A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance. I guess that the foot washers thought that the devil was quoting scripture for his own purposes, as the driver speeded his mules. Why they objected to Miss Morty's yard was a mystery heightened in my mind, because for someone who spent all the daylight hours outdoors, Miss Morty's command of scripture was formidable. "'You going to court this morning?' asked Jem. We had strolled over. "'I am not,' she said. "'I have no business with the court this morning.' "'Aren't you going down to watch?' asked Dill. "'I am not. It's morbid.' watching a poor devil on trial for his life. Look at all those folks. It's like a Roman carnival. They have to try him in public, Miss Morty, I said. Wouldn't be right if they didn't. I'm quite aware of that, she said. Just because it's public, I don't have to go, do I? Miss Stephanie Crawford came by. She wore a hat and gloves. Mm, 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 she said. Look at all those folks. You'd think William Jennings Bryan was speaking. And where are you going, Stephanie? inquired Miss Morty. To the Jitney Jungle. Miss Morty said she'd never seen Miss Stephanie go to the Jitney Jungle in a hat in her life. Well, said Miss Stephanie, I thought I might just look in at the courthouse to see what Atticus is up to. Better be careful he doesn't hand you a subpoena. We asked Miss Morty to elucidate. She said Miss Stephanie seemed to know so much about the case, she might as well be called on to testify. We held off until noon, when Atticus came home to dinner and said they'd spent the morning picking the jury. After dinner, we stopped by for Dill and went to town. This ends Disc 6, To Kill a Mockingbird, Disc 7. It was a gala occasion. There was no room at the public hitching rail for another animal. Mules and wagons were parked under every available tree. The courthouse square was covered with picnic parties sitting on newspapers, washing down biscuit and syrup with warm milk from fruit jars. Some people were gnawing on cold chicken and cold fried pork chops. The more affluent chased their food with drugstore Coca-Cola in bulb-shaped soda glasses. Greasy-faced children popped the whip through the crowd, and babies lunched at their mother's breasts. In a far corner of the square, the Negroes sat quietly in the sun, dining on sardines, crackers, and the more vivid flavors of knee-high cola. Mr. Dolphus Raymond sat with them. Jim? said Dill. He's drinking out of a sack. 
Mr. Dolphus Raymond seemed to be so doing. Two yellow drugstore straws ran from his mouth to the depths of a brown paper bag. He never seen anybody do that, murmured Dill. How does he keep what's in it in it? Jem giggled. He's got a Coca-Cola bottle full of whiskey in there. That's so's not to upset the ladies. You'll see him sip it all afternoon. He'll step out for a while and fill it back up. Why is he sitting with the colored folks? Always does. He likes them better than he likes us, I reckon. Lives by himself way down near the county line. He's got a colored woman and all sorts of mixed chillin'. Show you some of them if we see them. He doesn't look like trash, said Dill. He's not. He owns all one side of the river bank down there, and he's from a real old family to boot. Then why does he do like that? That's just his way, said Jem. They say he never got over his wedding. He was supposed to marry one of the, the spender ladies, I think. They were going to have a huge wedding, but they didn't. After the rehearsal, the bride went upstairs and blew her head off. Shotgun. She pulled the trigger with her toes. Did they ever know why? No, said Jem. Nobody ever knew quite why but Mr. Dolphus. They said it was because she found out about his colored woman. He reckoned he could keep her and get married, too. He's been sort of drunk ever since. You know, though, he's real good to those chillin'. Jem, I asked, what's a mixed child? Half white, half colored. You've seen him, Scout. You know that red, kinky-headed one that delivers for the drugstore. He's half white. They're real sad. Sad? How come? They don't belong anywhere. Colored folks won't have them because they're half white. White folks won't have them because they're colored. So they're just in-betweens. Don't belong anywhere. But Mr. Dolphus now, they say he shipped two of his up north. They don't mind him up north. Yonder's one of them. A small boy clutching a Negro woman's hand walked toward us. He looked all Negro to me. He was rich chocolate with flaring nostrils and beautiful teeth. Sometimes he would skip happily, and the Negro woman tugged his hand to make him stop. Jem waited until they passed us. That's one of the little ones, he said. How can you tell? asked Dill. He looked black to me. You can't sometimes, not unless you know who they are. But he's half Raymond, all right. But how can you tell? I asked. I told you, Scout. You just have to know who they are. Well, how do you know we ain't Negroes? Uncle Jack Finch says we really don't know. He says as far as he can trace back the Finches, we ain't. But for all he knows, we might have come straight out of Ethiopia during the Old Testament. Well, if we came out during the Old Testament, it's too long ago to matter. That's what I thought, said Jem. But around here, once you have a drop of Negro blood, that makes you all black. Hey, look! Some invisible signal had made the lunchers on the square rise and scatter bits of newspaper, cellophane, and wrapping paper. Children came to mothers. Babies were cradled on hips as men in sweat-stained hats collected their families and herded them through the courthouse doors. In the far corner of the square, the Negroes and Mr. Dolphus Raymond stood up and dusted their britches. There were few women and children among them which seemed to dispel the holiday mood. They waited patiently at the doors behind the white families. Let's go in, said Dill. No, we better wait till they get in. Atticus might not like it if he sees us, said Jem. The Maycomb County Courthouse was faintly reminiscent of Arlington in one respect. The concrete pillars supporting its south roof were too heavy for their light burden. The pillars were all that remained standing when the original courthouse burned in 1856. Another courthouse was built around them. 
It is better to say built in spite of them. But for the south porch, the Maycomb County Courthouse was early Victorian, presenting an inoffensive vista when seen from the north. From the other side, however, Greek Revival columns clashed with a big 19th century clock tower housing a rusty, unreliable instrument, a view indicating a people determined to preserve every physical scrap of the past. To reach the courtroom on the second floor, one passed sundry, sunless county cubbyholes, the tax assessor, the tax collector, the county clerk, the county solicitor, the circuit clerk, the judge of probate, lived in cool, dim hutches that smelled of decaying record books, mingled with old, damp cement and stale urine. It was necessary to turn on the lights in the daytime. There was always a film of dust on the rough floorboards. The inhabitants of these offices were creatures of their environment. Little gray-faced men, they seemed, untouched by wind or sun. We knew there was a crowd, but we had not bargained for the multitudes in the first-floor hallway. I got separated from Jem and Dill, but made my way toward the wall by the stairwell, knowing Jem would come for me eventually. I found myself in the middle of the idlers' club, and made myself as unobtrusive as possible. This was a group of white-shirted, khaki-trousered, suspended old men who had spent their lives doing nothing and passed their twilight days doing same on pine benches under the live oaks on the square. Attentive critics of courthouse business, Atticus said they knew as much law as the Chief Justice from long years of observation. Normally they were the court's only spectators, and today they seemed resentful of the interruption of their comfortable routine. When they spoke, their voices sounded casually important. The conversation was about my father. Thinks he knows what he's doing, one said. Oh, now I wouldn't say that, said another. Atticus Finch is a deep reader, a mighty deep reader. He reads all right. That's all he does, the club snickered. Let me tell you something now, Billy, a third said. You know the court appointed him to defend this nigger. Yeah, but Atticus aims to defend him. That's what I don't like about it. This was news, news that put a different light on things. Atticus had to, whether he wanted to or not. I thought it odd that he hadn't said anything to us about it. We could have used it many times in defending him and ourselves. He had to. That's why he was doing it. Equaled fewer fights and less fussing. But did that explain the town's attitude? The court appointed Atticus to defend him. Atticus aimed to defend him. That's what they didn't like about it. It was confusing. The Negroes, having waited for the white people to go upstairs, began to come in. Whoa, now! Just a minute, said a club member, holding up his walking stick. Just don't start up them there stairs yet a while. The club began its stiff-jointed climb and ran into Dill and Jem on their way down looking for me. They squeezed past and Jem called, Scout, come on! There ain't a seat left. We'll have to stand up. Look a there now, he said irritably, as the black people surged upstairs. The old men ahead of them would take most of the standing room. We were out of luck, and it was my fault, Jem informed me. We stood miserably by the wall. Can't you all get in? Reverend Sykes was looking down at us, black hat in hand. Hey, Reverend, said Jem. No, nah, Scout here messed us up. Well, let's see what we can do. Reverend Sykes edged his way upstairs. In a few moments he was back. There's not a seat downstairs. Do you all reckon it'd be all right if you all came to the balcony with me? Gosh, yes, said Jem. Happily, we sped ahead of Reverend Sykes to the courtroom floor. 
There we went up a covered staircase and waited at the door. Reverend Sykes came puffing behind us and steered us gently through the black people in the balcony. Four Negroes rose and gave us their front row seats. The colored balcony ran along three walls of the courtroom like a second story veranda, and from it we could see everything. The jury sat to the left under long windows. Sunburned, lanky, they seemed to be all farmers, but this was natural. Town folk rarely sat on juries. They were either struck or excused. One or two of the jury looked vaguely like dressed up Cunninghams. At this stage, they sat straight and alert. The circuit solicitor and another man, Atticus and Tom Robinson, sat at tables with their backs to us. There was a brown book and some yellow tablets on the solicitor's table. Atticus's was bare. Just inside the railing that divided the spectators from the court, the witnesses sat on cowhide bottom chairs. Their backs were to us. Judge Taylor was on the bench, looking like a sleepy old shark, his pilot fish riding rapidly below in front of him. Judge Taylor looked like most judges I had ever seen amiable, white haired, slightly ruddy faced. He was a man who ran his court with an alarming informality. He sometimes propped his feet up. He often cleaned his fingernails with his pocket knife. In long equity hearings, especially after dinner, he gave the impression of dozing, an impression dispelled forever when a lawyer once deliberately pushed a pile of books to the floor in a desperate effort to wake him up. Without opening his eyes, Judge Taylor murmured, Mr. Whitley, do that again and it'll cost you $100. He was a man learned in the law, and although he seemed to take his job casually, in reality he kept a firm grip on any proceedings that came before him. Only once was Judge Taylor ever seen at a dead standstill in open court, and the Cunningham stopped him. Old Sarum, their stamping grounds, was populated by two families separate and apart in the beginning, but unfortunately bearing the same name. The Cunninghams married the Conninghams until the spelling of the names was academic. Academic until a Cunningham disputed a Conningham over land titles and took to the law. During a controversy of this character, Jeems Cunningham testified that his mother spelled it Cunningham on deeds and things, but she was really a Conningham. She was an uncertain speller, a seldom reader, and was given to looking far away sometimes when she sat on the front gallery in the evening. After nine hours of listening to the eccentricities of old Sarum's inhabitants, Judge Taylor threw the case out of court. When asked upon what grounds, Judge Taylor said, Champertus connivance, and declared he hoped to God the litigants were satisfied by each having had their public say. They were. That was all they had wanted in the first place. Judge Taylor had one interesting habit. He permitted smoking in his courtroom, but did not himself indulge. Sometimes, if one was lucky, one had the privilege of watching him put a long, dry cigar into his mouth and munch it slowly up. Bit by bit, the dead cigar would disappear to reappear some hours later as a flat, slick mess, its essence extracted and mingling with Judge Taylor's digestive juices. I once asked Atticus how Mrs. Taylor stood to kiss him, but Atticus said they didn't kiss much. The witness stand was to the right of Judge Taylor, and when we got to our seats, Mr. Heck Tate was already on it. Chapter 17 Jim, I said, are those the Yules sitting down yonder? Hush, said Jim. Mr. Heck Tate's testifying. Mr. Tate had dressed for the occasion. He wore an ordinary business suit, which made him look somehow like every other man. Gone were his high boots, lumber jacket, and bullet-studded belt. 
From that moment he ceased to terrify me. He was sitting forward in the witness chair, his hands clasped between his knees, listening attentively to the circuit solicitor. The solicitor, a Mr. Gilmer, was not well known to us. He was from Abbotsville. We saw him only when court convened, and that rarely, for court was of no special interest to Jem and me. A balding, smooth-faced man, he could have been anywhere between forty and sixty. Although his back was to us, we knew he had a slight cast in one of his eyes which he used to his advantage. He seemed to be looking at a person when he was actually doing nothing of the kind. Thus he was hell on juries and witnesses. The jury, thinking themselves under close scrutiny, paid attention. So did the witnesses, thinking likewise. In your own words, Mr. Tate, Mr. Gilmer was saying. Well, said Mr. Tate, touching his glasses and speaking to his knees, I was called... Could you say it to the jury, Mr. Tate? Thank you. Who called you? Mr. Tate said, I was fetched by Bob, by Mr. Bob Ewell yonder, one night. What night, sir? Mr. Tate said, It was the night of November 21st. I was just leaving my office to go home when B Mr. Ewell came in. Very excited he was, and said, Get out to his house quick. Some niggard raped his girl. Did you go? Certainly. Got in the car and went out as fast as I could. And what did you find? Found her lying on the floor in the middle of the front room, one on the right as you go in. She was pretty well beat up. But I heaved her to her feet, and she washed her face in a bucket in the corner, and said she was all right. I asked her who hurt her, and she said it was Tom Robinson. Judge Taylor, who had been concentrating on his fingernails, looked up as if he were expecting an objection, but Atticus was quiet. Asked her if he beat her like that, she said yes, he had. Asked her if he took advantage of her, and she said, yes, he did. So I went down to Robinson's house and brought him back. She identified him as the one, so I took him in. That's all there was to it. Thank you, said Mr. Gilmer. Judge Taylor said, any questions, Atticus? Yes, said my father. He was sitting behind his table. His chair was skewed to one side, his legs were crossed, and one arm was resting on the back of his chair. Did you call a doctor, Sheriff? Did anybody call a doctor? asked Atticus. No, sir, said Mr. Tate. Didn't call a doctor? No, sir, repeated Mr. Tate. Why not? There was an edge to Atticus's voice. Well, I can tell you why I didn't. It wasn't necessary, Mr. Finch. She was mighty banged up. Something show happened. It was obvious. But you didn't call a doctor? While you were there, did anyone send for one? Fetch one? Carry her to one? No, sir. Judge Taylor broke in. He's answered the question three times, Atticus. He didn't call a doctor. Atticus said, I just wanted to make sure, Judge. And the judge smiled. Jem's hand, which was resting on the balcony rail, tightened around it. He drew in his breath suddenly. Glancing below, I saw no corresponding reaction and wondered if Jem was trying to be dramatic. Dill was watching peacefully, and so was Reverend Sykes beside him. What is it? I whispered, and got a terse shh. Sheriff, Atticus was saying, you say she was mighty banged up. In what way? Well, just describe her injuries, heck. Well, she was beaten around the head, 
there was already bruises coming on her arms, and it happened about thirty minutes before. How do you know? Mr. Tate grinned. Sorry, that's what they said. Anyway, she was pretty bruised up when I got there, and she had a black eye coming. Which eye? Mr. Tate blinked and ran his hands through his hair. Let's see, he said softly. Then he looked at Atticus as if he considered the question childish. Can't you remember? Atticus asked. Mr. Tate pointed to an invisible person five inches in front of him and said, Her left. Wait a minute, Sheriff, said Atticus. Was it her left facing you, or her left looking the same way you were? Mr. Tate said, Oh, yes, that'd make it her right. It was her right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now. She was bunged up on that side of her face. Mr. Tate blinked again, as if something had suddenly been made plain to him. Then he turned his head and looked around at Tom Robinson. As if by instinct, Tom Robinson raised his head. Something had been made plain to Atticus also, and it brought him to his feet. Sheriff, please repeat what you said. It was her right eye, I said. No. Atticus walked to the court reporter's desk and bent down to the furiously scribbling hand. It stopped, flipped back the shorthand pad, and the court reporter said, Mr. Finch, I remember now she was bunged up on that side of the face. Atticus looked up at Mr. Tate. Which side again, heck? The right side, Mr. Finch. But she had more bruises. You want to hear about them? Atticus seemed to be bordering on another question, but he thought better of it and said, Yes, what were her other injuries? As Mr. Tate answered, Atticus turned and looked at Tom Robinson, as if to say this was something they hadn't bargained for. Her arms were bruised, and she showed me her neck. There were definite finger marks on her gullet. All around her throat? At the back of her neck? I'd say they were all around, Mr. Finch. You would? Yes, sir. She had a small throat. Anybody could have reached around it with just... Answer the question, yes or no, please, Sheriff, said Atticus dryly, and Mr. Tate fell silent. Atticus sat down and nodded to the circuit solicitor, who shook his head at the judge, who nodded to Mr. Tate who rose stiffly and stepped down from the witness stand. Below us, heads turned, feet scraped the floor, babies were shifted to shoulders, and a few children scampered out of the courtroom. The Negroes behind us whispered softly among themselves. Dill was asking Reverend Sykes what it was all about, but Reverend Sykes said he didn't know. So far, things were utterly dull, Nobody had thundered. There were no arguments between opposing counsel. There was no drama. A grave disappointment to all present, it seemed. Atticus was proceeding amiably, as if he were involved in a title dispute. With his infinite capacity for calming, turbulent seas, he could make a rape case as dry as a sermon. Gone was the terror in my mind of stale whiskey and barnyard smells, of sleepy-eyed, sullen men, of a husky voice calling in the night, Mr. Finch, they gone? Our nightmare had gone with daylight. Everything would come out all right. All the spectators were as relaxed as Judge Taylor, except Jem. His mouth was twisted into a purposeful half-grin, and his eyes happy about, and he said something about corroborating evidence, which made me sure he was showing off. Robert E. Lee Ewell! In answer to the clerk's booming voice, 
a little bantam cock of a man rose and strutted to the stand, the back of his neck reddening at the sound of his name. When he turned around to take the oath, we saw that his face was as red as his neck. We also saw no resemblance to his namesake. A shock of wispy, new-washed hair stood up from his forehead. His nose was thin, pointed, and shiny. He had no chin to speak of. It seemed to be part of his crepey neck. So help me God, he crowed. Every town the size of Maycomb had families like the Yules. No economic fluctuations changed their status. People like the Yules lived as guests of the county in prosperity as well as in the depths of a depression. No truant officers could keep their numerous offspring in school. No public health officer could free them from congenital defects, various worms, and the diseases indigenous to filthy surroundings. Maycomb's Yules lived behind the town garbage dump in what was once a Negro cabin. The cabin's plank walls were supplemented with sheets of corrugated iron, its roof shingled with tin cans hammered flat, so only its general shape suggested its original design. Square, with four tiny rooms opening onto a shotgun hall, the cabin rested uneasily upon four irregular lumps of limestone. Its windows were merely open spaces in the walls, which in the summertime were covered with greasy strips of cheesecloth to keep out the varmints that feasted on Maycomb's refuse. The varmints had a lean time of it, for the Yules gave the dump a thorough gleaning every day, and the fruits of their industry, those that were not eaten, made the plot of ground around the cabin look like the playhouse of an insane child. What passed for a fence was bits of tree limbs, broomsticks, and tool shafts, all tipped with rusty hammerheads, snaggle-toothed rakeheads, shovels, axes, and grubbing hoes, held on with pieces of bobbed wire. Enclosed by this barricade was a dirty yard containing the remains of a Model T Ford on blocks, a discarded dentist's chair, an ancient icebox, plus lesser items, old shoes, worn-out table radios, picture frames, and fruit jars, under which scrawny orange chickens pecked hopefully. One corner of the yard, though, bewildered Makem. Against the fence, in a line, were six chipped enamel slop jars holding brilliant red geraniums, cared for as tenderly as if they belonged to Miss Morty Atkinson, had Miss Morty deigned to permit a geranium on her premises. People said they were Mayella Yules. Nobody was quite sure how many children were on the place. Some people said six, others said nine. There were always several dirty-faced ones at the windows when anyone passed by. Nobody had occasion to pass by except at Christmas, when the churches delivered baskets, and when the mayor of Maycomb asked us to please help the garbage collector by dumping our own trees and trash. Atticus took us with him last Christmas, when he complied with the mayor's request. A dirt road ran from the highway past the dump, down to a small negro settlement some five hundred yards beyond the Yules. It was necessary either to back out to the highway or go the full length of the road and turn around. Most people turned around in the Negroes' front yards. In the frosty December dusk, their cabins looked neat and snug, with pale blue smoke rising from the chimneys and doorways glowing amber from the fires inside. There were delicious smells about chicken, bacon frying crisp as the twilight air. Jem and I detected squirrel cooking, but it took an old countryman like Atticus to identify possum and rabbit, aromas that vanished when we rode back past the Yule residence. 
all the little man on the witness stand had that made him any better than his nearest neighbors was that if scrubbed with lye soap in very hot water, his skin was white. Mr. Robert Ewell, asked Mr. Gilmer. That's my name, Captain, said the witness. Mr. Gilmer's back stiffened a little, and I felt sorry for him. Perhaps I'd better explain something now. I've heard that lawyers' children, on seeing their parents in court in the heat of argument, get the wrong idea. They think opposing counsel to be the personal enemies of their parents. They suffer agonies and are surprised to see them often go out arm in arm with their tormentors during the first recess. This was not true of Jem and me. We acquired no traumas from watching our father win or lose. I'm sorry that I can't provide any drama in this respect. If I did, it would not be true. We could tell, however, when debate became more acrimonious than professional. But this was from watching lawyers other than our father. I never heard Atticus raise his voice in my life except to a deaf witness. Mr. Gilmer was doing his job as Atticus was doing his. Besides, Mr. Ewell was Mr. Gilmer's witness, and he had no business being rude to him of all people. Are you the father of Mayella Ewell? was the next question. Well, if I ain't, I can't do nothing about it now. Her ma's dead, was the answer. Judge Taylor stirred. He turned slowly in his swivel chair and looked benignly at the witness. Are you the father of Mayella Ewell? he asked, in a way that made the laughter below us stop suddenly. Yes, sir, Mr. Ewell said meekly. Judge Taylor went on in tones of goodwill. This the first time you've ever been in court? I don't recall ever seeing you here. At the witness's affirmative nod, he continued, Well, let's get something straight. There will be no more audibly obscene speculations on any subject from anybody in this courtroom as long as I'm sitting here. Do you understand? Mr. Ewell nodded, but I don't think he did. Judge Taylor sighed and said, All right, Mr. Gilmer. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ewell, would you tell us in your own words what happened on the evening of November 21st, please? Jem grinned and pushed his hair back. Just in your own words was Mr. Gilmer's trademark. We often wondered who else's words Mr. Gilmer was afraid his witness might employ. Well, the night of November 21, I was coming in from the woods with a load of kindling, and just as I got to the fence, I heard Mayella screaming like a stuck hog inside the house. Here Judge Taylor glanced sharply at the witness and must have decided his speculations devoid of evil intent, for he subsided sleepily. What time was it, Mr. Ewell? Just for sundown. Well, I was saying, Mayella was screaming fit to beat Jesus. Another glance from the bench silenced Mr. Ewell. Yes, she was screaming said Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Ewell looked confusedly at the judge. Well, Mayella was raising this holy racket, so I dropped my load and run as fast as I could, but I run into the fence. But when I got disentangled, I run up to the window, and I seen... Mr. Ewell's face grew scarlet. He stood up and pointed his finger at Tom Robinson. I seen that black nigger yonder rotten on my Mayella. So serene was Judge Taylor's court that he had few occasions to use his gavel, but he hammered fully five minutes. Atticus was on his feet at the bench, saying something to him, 
Mr. Heck Tate, as first officer of the county, stood in the middle aisle, quelling the packed courtroom. Behind us, there was an angry, muffled groan from the colored people. Reverend Sykes leaned across Dill and me, pulling at Jem's elbow. Mr. Jem, he said, you better take Miss Jean Louise home. Mr. Jem, you hear me? Jem turned his head. Scout, go home. Dill, you and Scout, go home. You gotta make me first, I said, remembering Atticus's blessed dictum. Jem scowled furiously at me, then said to Reverend Sykes, I think it's okay, Reverend. She doesn't understand it. I was mortally offended. I most certainly do. I can understand anything you can. Aw, oh, hush. She doesn't understand it, Reverend. She ain't nine yet. Reverend Sykes's black eyes were anxious. Mr. Finch, know you all are here? This ain't fit for Miss Jean Louise, or you boys either. Jem shook his head. He can't see us this far away. It's all right, Reverend. I knew Jem would win, because I knew nothing could make him leave now. Dill and I were safe for a while. Atticus could see us from where he was, if he looked. As Judge Taylor banged his gavel, Mr. Yule was sitting smugly in the witness chair, surveying his handiwork. With one phrase, he had turned happy picnickers into a sulky, tense, murmuring crowd, being slowly hypnotized by gavel taps, lessening in intensity, until the only sound in the courtroom was a dim pink, pink, pink. The judge might have been wrapping the bench with a pencil. In possession of his court once more, Judge Taylor leaned back in his chair. He looked suddenly weary. His age was showing, and I thought about what Atticus had said. He and Mrs. Taylor didn't kiss much. He must have been nearly seventy. There has been a request, Judge Taylor said, that this courtroom be cleared of spectators, or at least of women and children, a request that will be denied for the time being. People generally see what they look for and hear what they listen for, and they have the right to subject their children to it. But I can assure you of one thing. You will receive what you see and hear in silence or you will leave this courtroom, but you won't leave it until the whole boiling lot of you come before me on contempt charges. Mr. Yule, you will keep your testimony within the confines of Christian English usage, if that is possible. Proceed, Mr. Gilmer. Mr. Yule reminded me of a deaf mute. I was sure he had never heard the words Judge Taylor directed at him. His mouth struggled silently with them, but their import registered on his face. Smugness faded from it, replaced by a dogged earnestness that fooled Judge Taylor not at all. As long as Mr. Yule was on the stand, the judge kept his eyes on him, as if daring him to make a false move. Mr. Gilmer and Atticus exchanged glances. Atticus was sitting down again, his fist rested on his cheek, and we could not see his face. Mr. Gilmer looked rather desperate. A question from Judge Taylor made him relax. Mr. Yule, did you see the defendant having sexual intercourse with your daughter? Yes, I did. The spectators were quiet, but the defendant said something. Atticus whispered to him, and Tom Robinson was silent. You say you are at the window? asked Mr. Gilmer. Yes, sir. How far is it from the ground? About three foot. Did you have a clear view of the room? Yes, sir. How did the room look? Well, it was all slung about like there was a fight. What did you do when you saw the defendant? 
Well, I run around the house to get in, but he run out the front door just ahead of me. I sawed who he was, all right. I was too distracted about Mayella to run after him. I run in the house, and she was lying on the floor, squalling. Then what did you do? Why, I run for Tate, quick as I could. I knowed who it was, all right. Lived down yonder in that nigger nest, past the house every day. Judge, I've asked this county for fifteen years to clean out that nest down yonder. They're dangerous to live around, besides devaluing my property. Thank you, Mr. Yule, said Mr. Gilmer hurriedly. The witness made a hasty descent from the stand and ran smack into Atticus, who had risen to question him. Judge Taylor permitted the court to laugh. Just a minute, sir, said Atticus genially. Could I ask you a question or two? Mr. Ewell backed up into the witness chair, settled himself, and regarded Atticus with haughty suspicion, an expression common to Macomb County witnesses when confronted by opposing counsel. Mr. Ewell, Atticus began, folks were doing a lot of running that night. Let's see. You say you ran to the house, you ran to the window, you ran inside, you ran to Mayella, you ran for Mr. Tate. Did you, during all this running, run for a doctor? Why, no need to. I seen what happened. But there's one thing I don't understand, said Atticus. Weren't you concerned with Mayella's condition? I most positively was, said Mr. Ewell. I seen who done it. No, I mean her physical condition. Did you not think the nature of her injuries warranted immediate medical attention? What? Didn't you think she should have had a doctor immediately? The witness said he never thought of it. He had never called a doctor to any of hisn in his life, and if he had, it would have cost him five dollars. That all? he asked. Not quite, said Atticus casually. Mr. Ewell, you heard the sheriff's testimony, didn't you? How's that? You were in the courtroom when Mr. Heck Tate was on the stand, weren't you? You heard everything he said, didn't you? Mr. Ewell considered the matter carefully and seemed to decide that the question was safe. Yes, he said. Do you agree with his description of Mayella's injuries? How's that? Atticus looked around at Mr. Gilmer and smiled. Mr. Ewell seemed determined not to give the defense the time of day. Mr. Tate testified that her right eye was blackened, that she was beaten around the... Oh, yeah, said the witness. I hold with everything Tate said. You do? asked Atticus mildly. I just want to make sure. He went to the court reporter, said something, and the reporter entertained us for some minutes by reading Mr. Tate's testimony as if it were stock market quotations. Which I her left, oh yes, that'd make it her right. It was her right eye, Mr. Finch. I remember now she was bunged. He flipped the page. Up on that side of the face, Sheriff, please repeat what you said. It was her right eye, I said. Thank you, Bert, said Atticus. You heard it again, Mr. Ewell. Do you have anything to add to it? Do you agree with the sheriff? I holds with Tate. Her eye was blacked, and she was mighty beat up. The little man seemed to have forgotten his previous humiliation from the bench. It was becoming evident that he thought Atticus an easy match. He seemed to grow ruddy again. His chest swelled, and once more he was a red little rooster. I thought he'd burst his shirt at Atticus's next question. Mr. Ewell, 
Can you read and write? Mr. Gilmer interrupted. Objection, he said. Can't see what witnesses' literacy has to do with the case. Irrelevant and immaterial. Judge Taylor was about to speak, but Atticus said, Judge, if you'll allow the question, plus another one, you'll soon see. All right, let's see, said Judge Taylor. But make sure we see, Atticus. Overruled. Mr. Gilmer seemed as curious as the rest of us as to what bearing the state of Mr. Ewell's education had on the case. I'll repeat the question, said Atticus. Can you read and write? I most positively can. Will you write your name and show us? I most positively will. How do you think I signed my relief checks? Mr. Ewell was endearing himself to his fellow citizens. The whispers and chuckles below us probably had to do with what a card he was. I was becoming nervous. Atticus seemed to know what he was doing, but it seemed to me that he had gone frog-sticking without a light. Never, 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 on cross-examination, ask a witness a question you don't already know the answer to, was a tenant I absorbed with my baby food. Do it, and you'll often get an answer you don't want, an answer that might wreck your case. Atticus was reaching into the inside pocket of his coat. He drew out an envelope, then reached into his vest pocket and unclipped his fountain pen. He moved leisurely and had turned so that he was in full view of the jury. He unscrewed the fountain pen cap and placed it gently on his table. He shook the pen a little, then handed it with the envelope to the witness. Would you write your name for us? he asked. Clearly now, so the jury can see you do it. Mr. Ewell wrote on the back of the envelope and looked up complacently to see Judge Taylor staring at him as if he were some fragrant gardenia in full bloom on the witness stand, to see Mr. Gilmer half sitting, half standing at his table. The jury was watching him. One man was leaning forward with his hands over the railing. What's so interesting? he asked. You're left-handed, Mr. Ewell, said Judge Taylor. Mr. Ewell turned angrily to the judge and said he didn't see what his being left-handed had to do with it, that he was a Christ-fearing man and Atticus Finch was taking advantage of him. Tricking lawyers like Atticus Finch took advantage of him all the time with their tricking ways. He had told them what happened. He'd say it again and again, which he did. Nothing Atticus asked him after that shook his story, that he'd looked through the window, then ran the nigger off then ran for the sheriff. Atticus finally dismissed him. Mr. Gilmer asked him one more question. About your writing with your left hand, are you ambidextrous, Mr. Ewell? I most positively am not. I can use one hand good as the other. One hand good as the other, he added, glaring at the defense table. Jem seemed to be having a quiet fit. He was pounding the balcony rail softly, and once he whispered, We've got him! I didn't think so. Atticus was trying to show, it seemed to me, that Mr. Ewell could have beaten up Mayella. That much I could follow. If her right eye was blacked, and she was beaten mostly on the right side of the face, it would tend to show that a left-handed person did it. Sherlock Holmes and Jem Finch would agree, but Tom Robinson could easily be left-handed, too. Like Mr. Heck Tate, I imagined a person facing me, went through a swift mental pantomime, and concluded that he might have held her with his right hand and pounded her with his left. I looked down at him. His back was to us, but I could see his broad shoulders and bull-thick neck, he could easily have done it. I thought Jem was counting his chickens. Chapter 18 
but someone was booming again. Mayella Violet Ewell! A young girl walked to the witness stand. As she raised her hand and swore that the evidence she gave would be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help her God, she seemed somehow fragile-looking. But when she sat facing us in the witness chair, she became what she was, a thick-bodied girl accustomed to strenuous labor. In Maycomb County, it was easy to tell when someone bathed regularly, as opposed to yearly lavations. Mr. Ewell had a scalded look, as if an overnight soaking had deprived him of protective layers of dirt, his skin appeared to be sensitive to the elements. Mayella looked as if she tried to keep clean, and I was reminded of the row of red geraniums in the Yule yard. Mr. Gilmer asked Mayella to tell the jury, in her own words, what happened on the evening of November 21st of last year. Just in her own words, please. Mayella sat silently. Where were you at dusk on that evening? began Mr. Gilmer patiently. On the porch. Which porch? Ain't but one. The front porch. What were you doing on the porch? Nothing. Judge Taylor said, Just tell us what happened. You can do that, can't you? Mayella stared at him and burst into tears. She covered her mouth with her hands and sobbed. Judge Taylor let her cry for a while. Then he said, That's enough now. Don't be afraid of anybody here, as long as you tell the truth. All this is strange to you, I know, but you've nothing to be ashamed of and nothing to fear. What are you scared of? Mayella said something behind her hands. What was that? asked the judge. Him, she sobbed, pointing at Atticus. Mr. Finch? She nodded vigorously, saying, Don't want him doing me like he done Papa, trying to make him out left-handed. Judge Taylor scratched his thick white hair. It was plain that he had never been confronted with a problem of this kind. How old are you? he asked. Nineteen and a half, Mayella said. Judge Taylor cleared his throat and tried unsuccessfully to speak in soothing tones. Mr. Finch has no idea of scaring you, he growled. And if he did, I'm here to stop him. That's one thing I'm sitting up here for. Now, you're a big girl, so you just sit up straight and tell the... Tell us what happened to you. You can do that, can't you? I whispered to Jem, Has she got good sense? Jem was squinting down at the witness stand. Can't tell yet, he said. She's got enough sense to get the judge sorry for her. But she might be just... Oh, I don't know. Mollified, Mayella gave Atticus a final, terrified glance and said to Mr. Gilmer, Well, sir, I was on the porch, and and he came along, and, you see, there was this old shiffer robe in the yard Papa brought in to chop up for kindling. Papa told me to do it while he was off in the woods, but I wasn't feeling strong enough then. So he came by. Who is he? Mayella pointed to Tom Robinson. I'll have to ask you to be more specific, please, said Mr. Gilmer. The reporter can't put down gestures very well. That and yonder, she said. Robinson. Then what happened? I said, come here, nigger, and bust up this shiffer robe for me. I got a nickel for you. He could have done it easy enough, he could. So he come in the yard, and I went in the house to get him the nickel, and I turned around, and before I knew it, he was on me, 
just run up behind me, he did. He got me round the neck, cussing me and saying dirt. I fought and hollered, but he had me round the neck. He hit me again and again. Mr. Gilmore waited for Mayella to collect herself. She had twisted her handkerchief into a sweaty rope. When she opened it to wipe her face, it was a mass of creases from her hot hands. She waited for Mr. Gilmer to ask another question, but when he didn't, she said, He chunked me on the floor and choked me and took advantage of me. Did you scream? asked Mr. Gilmer. Did you scream and fight back? Reckon I did. Hollered for all I was worth. Kicked and hollered loud as I could. Then what happened? I don't remember too good, but next thing I knew, Papa was in the room, a standing over me, hollering, Who done it? Who done it? Then I sort of fainted, and the next thing I knew, Mr. Tate was pulling me up off of the floor and leading me to the water bucket. Apparently, Mayella's recital had given her confidence, but it was not her father's brash kind. There was something stealthy about hers, like a steady-eyed cat with a twitchy tail. You say you fought him off as hard as you could? Fought him tooth and nail? asked Mr. Gilmer. I positively did, Mayella echoed her father. You are positive that he took full advantage of you? Mayella's face contorted, and I was afraid that she would cry again. Instead, she said, He'd done what he was after. Mr. Gilmer called attention to the hot day by wiping his head with his hand. That's all for the time being, he said pleasantly, but you stay there. I expect big bad Mr. Finch has some questions to ask you. State will not prejudice the witness against counsel for the defense, murmured Judge Taylor primly. At least not at this time. Atticus got up grinning, but instead of walking to the witness stand, he opened his coat and hooked his thumbs in his vest. Then he walked slowly across the room to the windows. He looked out, but didn't seem especially interested in what he saw. Then he turned and strolled back to the witness stand. From long years of experience, I could tell he was trying to come to a decision about something. Miss Mayella, he said, smiling, I won't try to scare you for a while, not yet. Let's just get acquainted. How old are you? Said I was nineteen. Said it to the judge yonder. Mayella jerked her head resentfully at the bench. So you did. So you did, ma'am. You will have to bear with me, Miss Mayella. I'm getting along and can't remember as well as I used to. I might ask you things you've already said before, but you'll give me an answer, won't you? Good. I could see nothing in Mayella's expression to justify Atticus's assumption that he had secured her wholehearted cooperation. She was looking at him furiously. Won't answer a word you say, long as you keep on mocking me, she said. Ma'am, said Atticus, startled, long as you keep on making fun of me. Judge Taylor said, Mr. Finch is not making fun of you. What's the matter with you? Mayella looked from under lowered eyelids at Atticus, but she said to the judge, Long as he keeps on calling me ma'am and saying Miss Mayella, I don't have to take his sass. I ain't called upon to take it. Atticus resumed his stroll to the windows and let Judge Taylor handle this one. Judge Taylor was not the kind of figure that ever evoked pity but I did feel a pang for him as he tried to explain. That's just Mr. Finch's way, he told Mayella. We've done business in this court for years and years, 
and Mr. Finch is always courteous to everybody. He's not trying to mock you. He's trying to be polite. That's just his way. The judge leaned back. Atticus, let's get on with these proceedings and let the record show that the witness has not been sassed. Her views to the contrary. I wondered if anybody had ever called her ma'am or Miss Mayella in her life. Probably not, as she took offense to routine courtesy. What on earth was her life like? I soon found out. You say you're nineteen, Atticus resumed. How many sisters and brothers have you? He walked from the windows back to the stand. Seven, she said, and I wondered if they were all like the specimen I had seen the first day I started to school. You the eldest? The oldest? Yes. How long has your mother been dead? Don't know. Long time. Did you ever go to school? Read and write good as Papa yonder. Mayella sounded like a Mr. Jingle in a book I had been reading. How long did you go to school? Two year? Three year? Dunno. Slowly but surely I began to see the pattern of Atticus's questions. From questions that Mr. Gilmer did not deem sufficiently irrelevant or immaterial to object to, Atticus was quietly building up before the jury a picture of the Ewell's home life. The jury learned the following things. Their relief check was far from enough to feed the family, and there was strong suspicion that Papa drank it up anyway. He sometimes went off in the swamp for days and came home sick. The weather was seldom cold enough to require shoes, but when it was, you could make dandy ones from strips of old tires. The family hauled its water in buckets from a spring that ran out at one end of the dump. They kept the surrounding area clear of trash, and it was everybody for himself as far as keeping clean went. If you wanted to wash, you hauled your own water. The younger children had perpetual colds and suffered from chronic ground itch. There was a lady who came around sometimes and asked Mayella why she didn't stay in school. She wrote down the answer. With two members of the family reading and writing, there was no need for the rest of them to learn. Papa needed them at home. Miss Mayella, said Atticus in spite of himself, a nineteen-year-old girl like you must have friends. Who are your friends? The witness frowned as if puzzled. Friends? Yes. Don't you know anyone near your age or older or younger? Boys and girls? Just ordinary friends? Mayella's hostility, which had subsided to grudging neutrality, flared again. You making fun of me again, Mr. Finch? Atticus let her question answer his. Do you love your father, Miss Mayella? Was his next. Love him? What you mean? I mean, is he good to you? Is he easy to get along with? He does tolerable, except when... Except when? Mayella looked at her father, who was sitting with his chair tipped against the railing. He sat up straight and waited for her to answer. Except when nothing, said Mayella. I said he does tolerable. Mr. Ewell leaned back again. Except when he's drinking, asked Atticus so gently that Mayella nodded. Does he ever go after you? How you mean, when he's riled, has he ever beaten you? Mayella looked around, down at the court reporter, up at the judge. Answer the question, Miss Mayella, said Judge Taylor. My paws never touched a hair on my head in my life, 
she declared firmly. He never touched me. Atticus's glasses had slipped a little, and he pushed them up on his nose. We've had a good visit, Miss Mayella. And now I guess we'd better get to the case. You say you asked Tom Robinson to come chop up a... What was it? A chiffre rope? A whole dresser full of drawers on one side? Was Tom Robinson well known to you? What do you mean? I mean, did you know who he was? Where he lived? Mayella nodded. I knowed who he was. He passed the house every day. Was this the first time you asked him to come inside the fence? Mayella jumped slightly at the question. Atticus was making his slow pilgrimage to the windows, as he had been doing. He would ask a question, then look out, waiting for an answer. He did not see her involuntary jump, but it seemed to me that he knew she had moved. He turned around and raised his eyebrows. Was, he began again. Yes, it was. Didn't you ever ask him to come inside the fence before? She was prepared now. I did not. I certainly did not. One did not's enough, said Atticus serenely. You never asked him to do odd jobs for you before? I might have conceded Mayella. There was several niggers around. Can you remember any other occasions? No. All right. Now to what happened. You said Tom Robinson was behind you in the room when you turned around. Is that right? Yes. You said he got you around the neck cussing and saying dirt. Is that right? It's right. Atticus's memory had suddenly become accurate. You say he caught me and choked me and took advantage of me. Is that right? That's what I said. Do you remember him beating you about the face? The witness hesitated. You seem sure enough that he choked you. All this time you were fighting back, remember? You kicked and hollered as loud as you could. Do you remember him beating you about the face? Mayella was silent. She seemed to be trying to get something clear to herself. I thought for a moment she was doing Mr. Hectate's and my trick of pretending there was a person in front of us. She glanced at Mr. Gilmer. It's an easy question, Miss Mayella, so I'll try again. Do you remember him beating you about the face? Atticus's voice had lost its comfortableness. He was speaking in his arid, detached, professional voice. Do you remember him beating you about the face? No, I don't recollect if he hit me. I mean, yes, I do. He hit me. Was your last sentence your answer? Huh? Yes, he hit... I just don't remember. I just don't remember. It all happened so quick. Judge Taylor looked sternly at Mayella. Don't you cry, young woman, he began. But Attica said, let her cry if she wants to, Judge. We've got all the time in the world. Mayella sniffed wrathfully and looked at Atticus. I'll answer any question you got. Get me up here and mock me, will you? I'll answer any question you got. That's fine, said Atticus. There are only a few more. Miss Mayella, not to be tedious, you've testified that the defendant hit you, grabbed you around the neck, choked you, and took advantage of you. I want you to be sure you have the right man. Will you identify the man who raped you? I will. That's him right yonder. Atticus turned to the defendant. Tom, stand up. Let Miss Mayella have a good long look at you. Is this the man, Miss Mayella?
Tom Robinson's powerful shoulders rippled under his thin shirt. He rose to his feet and stood with his right hand on the back of his chair. He looked oddly off balance, but it was not from the way he was standing. His left arm was fully twelve inches shorter than his right and hung dead at his side. It ended in a small, shriveled hand, and from as far away as the balcony, I could see that it was no use to him. Scout, breathed Jem. Scout, look. Reverend, he's crippled. Reverend Sykes leaned across me and whispered to Jem, He got it caught in a cotton gin. Caught it in Mr. Dolphus Raymond's cotton gin when he was a boy. Liked to bled to death. Tore all the muscles loose from his bones. Attica said, Is this the man who raped you? It most certainly is. Atticus's next question was one word long. How? Mayella was raging. I don't know how he'd done it, but he'd done it. I said it all happened so fast, I... Now, let's consider this calmly, began Atticus, but Mr. Gilmer interrupted with an objection. He was not irrelevant or immaterial, but Atticus was browbeating the witness. Judge Taylor laughed outright. Oh, sit down, Horace. He's doing nothing of the sort. If anything, the witness is browbeating Atticus. Judge Taylor was the only person in the courtroom who laughed. Even the babies were still, and I suddenly wondered if they had been smothered at their mother's breasts. This ends Disc 7. To Kill a Mockingbird, Disc 8. Now, said Atticus, Miss Mayella, you've testified that the defendant choked and beat you. You didn't say that he sneaked up behind you and knocked you cold, but you turned around, and there he was. Atticus was back behind his table, and he emphasized his words by rapping his knuckles on it. Do you wish to reconsider any of your testimony? You want me to say something that didn't happen? No, ma'am. I want you to say something that did happen. Tell us once more, please, what happened. I told you what happened. You testified that you turned around and there he was. He choked you then? Yes. Then he released your throat and hit you? I said he did. He blacked your right eye with his right fist? I ducked and it, it glanced. That's what it did. I ducked and it glanced off. Mayella had finally seen the light. You're becoming suddenly clear on this point. A while ago you couldn't remember too well, could you? I said he hit me. All right. He choked you. He hit you. Then he raped you. That right? It most certainly is. You're a strong girl. What were you doing all the time? Just standing there? I told you I hollered and kicked and fought. Atticus reached up and took off his glasses, turned his good right eye to the witness and rained questions on her. Judge Taylor said, One question at a time, Atticus. Give the witness a chance to answer. All right. Why didn't you run? I tried to. Tried to? What kept you from it? I... He slung me down. That's what he did. He slung me down and got on top of me. You were screaming all this time? I certainly was. Then why didn't the other children hear you? Where were they? At the dump? No answer. Where were they? Why didn't your screams make them come running? The dump's closer than the woods, isn't it? No answer. Or didn't you scream until you saw your father in the window? 
You didn't think to scream until then, did you? No answer. Did you scream first at your father instead of at Tom Robinson? Was that it? No answer. Who beat you up? Tom Robinson or your father? No answer. What did your father see in the window? The crime of rape or the best defense to it? Why don't you tell the truth, child? Didn't Bob Ewell beat you up? When Atticus turned away from Mayella, he looked like his stomach hurt. But Mayella's face was a mixture of terror and fury. Atticus sat down wearily and polished his glasses with his handkerchief. Suddenly, Mayella became articulate. I got something to say, she said. Atticus raised his head. Do you want to tell us what happened? But she did not hear the compassion in his invitation. I got something to say, and then I ain't going to say no more. That nigger yonder took advantage of me. And if you find fancy gentlemen don't want to do nothing about it, then you're all yellow stinking cowards. Stinking cowards, the lot of you. Your fancy airs don't come to nothing. Your mamming and Miss Mayellerin don't come to nothing, Mr. Finch. Then she burst into real tears. Her shoulders shook with angry sobs. She was as good as her word. She answered no more questions, even when Mr. Gilmer tried to get her back on the track. I guess if she hadn't been so poor and ignorant, Judge Taylor would have put her under the jail for the contempt she had shown everybody in the courtroom. Somehow Atticus had hit her hard in a way that was not clear to me, but it gave him no pleasure to do so. He sat with his head down, and I never saw anybody glare at anyone with the hatred Mayella showed when she left the stand and walked by Atticus's table. When Mr. Gilmer told Judge Taylor that the state rested, Judge Taylor said, It's time we all did. We'll take ten minutes. Atticus and Mr. Gilmer met in front of the bench and whispered. Then they left the courtroom by a door behind the witness stand which was a signal for us all to stretch. I discovered that I had been sitting on the edge of the long bench, and I was somewhat numb. Jem got up and yawned. Dill did likewise, and Reverend Sykes wiped his face on his hat. The temperature was an easy ninety, he said. Mr. Braxton Underwood, who had been sitting quietly in a chair reserved for the press, soaking up testimony with his sponge of a brain, allowed his bitter eyes to rove over the colored balcony, and they met mine. He gave a snort and looked away. Jim, I said, Mr. Underwood seen us. That's okay. He won't tell Atticus. He'll just put it on the social side of the tribune. Jem turned back to Dill, explaining, I suppose, the finer points of the trial to him, but I wondered what they were. There had been no lengthy debates between Atticus and Mr. Gilmer on any points. Mr. Gilmer seemed to be prosecuting almost reluctantly. Witnesses had been led by the nose as asses are, with few objections. But Atticus had once told us that in Judge Taylor's court, any lawyer who was a strict constructionist on evidence usually wound up receiving strict instructions from the bench. He distilled this for me to mean that Judge Taylor might look lazy and operate in his sleep, but he was seldom reversed, and that was the proof of the pudding. Atticus said he was a good judge. Presently Judge Taylor returned and climbed into his swivel chair. He took a cigar from his vest pocket and examined it thoughtfully. I punched Dill. Having passed the judge's inspection, the cigar suffered a vicious bite. We come down sometimes to watch him, I explained. 
It's going to take him the rest of the afternoon now. You watch. Unaware of public scrutiny from above, Judge Taylor disposed of the severed end by propelling it expertly to his lips and saying, Fluk! He hit a spittoon so squarely we could hear it slosh. Bet he was hell with a spitball, murmured Dill. As a rule, a recess meant a general exodus, but today people weren't moving. Even the idlers who had failed to shame younger men from their seats had remained standing along the walls. I guess Mr. Heck Tate had reserved the county toilet for court officials. Atticus and Mr. Gilmer returned, and Judge Taylor looked at his watch. It's getting on to four, he said, which was intriguing, as the courthouse clock must have struck the hour at least twice. I had not heard it or felt its vibrations. Shall we try to wind up this afternoon? asked Judge Taylor. How about it, Atticus? I think we can, said Atticus. How many witnesses you got? One. Well, call him. Chapter 19 Thomas Robinson reached around ran his fingers onto his left arm and lifted it. He guided his arm to the Bible, and his rubber-like left hand sought contact with the black binding. As he raised his right hand, the useless one slipped off the Bible and hit the clerk's table. He was trying again when Judge Taylor growled, That'll do, Tom. Tom took the oath and stepped into the witness chair. Atticus very quickly induced him to tell us Tom was 25 years of age. He was married with three children. He had been in trouble with the law before. He once received 30 days for disorderly conduct. It must have been disorderly, said Atticus. What did it consist of? Got in a fight with another man. He tried to cut me. Did he succeed? Yes, sir. A little. Not enough to hurt. You see, I... Tom moved his left shoulder. Yes, said Atticus. You were both convicted? Yes, sir. I had to serve because I couldn't pay the fine. Other fellow paid his own. Dill leaned across me and asked Jem what Atticus was doing. Jem said Atticus was showing the jury that Tom had nothing to hide. Were you acquainted with Mayella Violet Yule? asked Atticus. Yes, sir. I had to pass her place going to and from the field every day. Whose field? I picks for Mr. Link Dias. Were you picking cotton in November? No, sir. I works in his yard fall and winter time. I works pretty steady for him all year round. He's got a lot of pecan trees and things. You say you had to pass the Yule place to get to and from work. Is there any other way to go? No, sir. None's I know of. Tom, did she ever speak to you? Why, yes, sir. I'd tip my hat when I'd go by. And one day she asked me to come inside the fence and bust up a shifferobe for her. When did she ask you to chop up the, the shifferobe? Mr. Finch, it was way last spring. I remember it because it was chopping time and I had my hoe with me. I said I didn't have nothing but this hoe, but she said she had a hatchet. She give me the hatchet and I broke up the shiffer robe. She said, I reckon I'll have to give you a nickel, won't I? And I said, no ma'am, there ain't no charge. Then I went home. Mr. Finch, that was way last spring, way over a year ago. Did you ever go on the place again? Yes, sir. When? Well, I went lots of times. 
Judge Taylor instinctively reached for his gavel, but let his hand fall. The murmur below us died without his help. Under what circumstances? Please, sir? Why did you go inside the fence lots of times? Tom Robinson's forehead relaxed. She'd call me in, sir. Seemed like every time I passed by yonder, she'd have some little something for me to do. Chopping, kindling, toting water for her. She watered them red flowers every day. Were you paid for your services? No, sir. Not after she offered me a nickel the first time. I was glad to do it. Mr. Ewell didn't seem to help her none, and neither did the chillin, and I knowed she didn't have no nickels to spare. Where were the other children? They was always around, all over the place. They'd watch me work, some of them. Some of them had sat in the window. Would Miss Mayella talk to you? Yes, sir. She talked to me. As Tom Robinson gave his testimony, it came to me that Mayella Ewell must have been the loneliest person in the world. She was even lonelier than Boo Radley, who had not been out of the house in twenty-five years. When Atticus asked had she any friends, she seemed not to know what he meant. Then she thought he was making fun of her. She was as sad, I thought, as what Jem called a mixed child. White people wouldn't have anything to do with her because she lived among pigs. Negroes wouldn't have anything to do with her because she was white. She couldn't live like Mr. Dolphus Raymond, who preferred the company of Negroes, because she didn't own a river bank and she wasn't from a fine old family. Nobody said, that's just their way, about the Yules. Maycomb gave them Christmas baskets, welfare money, and the back of its hand. Tom Robinson was probably the only person who was ever decent to her. But she said he took advantage of her. And when she stood up, she looked at him as if he were dirt beneath her feet. Did you ever, Atticus interrupted my meditations, at any time go on the Ewell property? Did you ever set foot on the Ewell property without an express invitation from one of them? No, sir, Mr. Finch. I never did. I wouldn't do that, sir. Atticus sometimes said that one way to tell whether a witness was lying or telling the truth was to listen rather than watch. I applied his test. Tom denied it three times in one breath, but quietly, with no hint of whining in his voice, and I found myself believing him in spite of his protesting too much. He seemed to be a respectable Negro, and a respectable Negro would never go up into somebody's yard of his own volition. Tom, what happened to you on the evening of November 21st of last year? Below us, the spectators drew a collective breath and leaned forward. Behind us, the Negroes did the same. Tom was a black velvet Negro, not shiny, but soft black velvet. The whites of his eyes shone in his face, and when he spoke, we saw flashes of his teeth. If he had been whole, he would have been a fine specimen of a man. Mr. Finch, he said, I was going home as usual that evening, and when I passed the Ewell place, Miss Mayella were on the porch, like she said she were. It seemed real quiet-like, and I didn't quite know why. I was studying why, just passing by. When she says for me to come there and help her a minute. Well, I went inside the fence and looked around for some kindling to work on, but I didn't see none. And she says, No, nah, 
I got something for you to do in the house. The old door's off its hinges, and fall's coming on pretty fast. I said, you got a screwdriver, Miss Mayella? She said she sure had. Well, I went up the steps, and she motioned me to come inside, and I went in the front room and looked at the door. I said, Miss Mayella, this door look all right. I pulled it back and forth, and those hinges was all right. Then she shut the door in my face. Mr. Finch, I was wondering why it was so quiet like, and it come to me that there weren't a child on the place, not a one of them. And I said, Miss Mayella, where the children? Tom's black velvet skin had begun to shine, and he ran his hand over his face. I say, where the children, he continued, and she says, she was laughing, sort of. She says, they all gone to town to get ice creams. She says, took me a slap year to save seven nickels, but I done it. They all gone to town. Tom's discomfort was not from the humidity. What did you say then, Tom? asked Atticus. I said something like, Why, Miss Mayella, that's right smart of you to treat him. And she said, You think so? I don't think she understood what I was thinking. I meant it was smart of her to save like that and nice of her to treat him. I understand you, Tom. Go on, said Atticus. Well, I said, I best be going. I couldn't do nothing for her. And she says, oh yes, I could. And I ask her what? And she says to just step on that chair yonder and get that box down from on top of the chiffre robe. Not the same chiffre robe you busted up, asked Atticus. The witness smiled. No, sir, another one, most as tall as the room. So I done what she told me, and I was just reaching when the next thing I knows she... She'd grab me round the legs. Grab me round the legs, Mr. Finch. She scared me so bad, I hopped down and turned the chair over. That was the only thing, only furniture stirred in that room, Mr. Finch, when I left it. I swear for God. What happened after you turned the chair over? Tom Robinson had come to a dead stop. He glanced at Atticus, then at the jury, then at Mr. Underwood, sitting across the room. Tom, you're sworn to tell the whole truth. Will you tell it? Tom ran his hand nervously over his mouth. What happened after that? Answer the question, said Judge Taylor. One third of his cigar had vanished. Mr. Finch, I got down off of that chair and turned around and she sort of jumped on me. Jumped on you? Violently? No, sir. She... She hugged me. She hugged me round the waist. This time Judge Taylor's gavel came down with a bang, and as it did, the overhead lights went on in the courtroom. Darkness had not come, but the afternoon sun had left the windows. Judge Taylor quickly restored order. Then what did she do? The witness swallowed hard. She reached up and kissed me side of the face. She says she never kissed a grown man before, and she might as well kiss a nigger. She says what her papa do to her don't count. She says, kiss me back, nigger. I say, Miss Mayella, let me out of here and tried to run, but she got her back to the door 
and I'd have had to push her. I didn't want to harm her, Mr. Finch, and I say, let me pass. But just when I say it, Mr. Yule yonder hollered through the window. What did he say? Tom Robinson swallowed again, and his eyes widened. Something not fitting to say. Not fitting for these folks and chillin' to hear. What did he say, Tom? You must tell the jury what he said. Tom Robinson shut his eyes tight. He says, you goddamn whore, I'll kill you. Then what happened? Mr. Finch, I was running so fast, I didn't know what happened. Tom, did you rape Mayella Ewell? I did not, sir. Did you harm her in any way? I did not, sir. Did you resist her advances? Mr. Finch, I tried. I tried to without being ugly to her. I didn't want to be ugly. I didn't want to push her or nothing. It occurred to me that in their own way, Tom Robinson's manners were as good as Atticus's. Until my father explained it to me later, I did not understand the subtlety of Tom's predicament. He would not have dared strike a white woman under any circumstances and expect to live long. So he took the first opportunity to run, a sure sign of guilt. Tom, go back once more to Mr. Yule, said Atticus. Did he say anything to you? Not anything, sir. He might have said something, but I weren't there. That'll do. Atticus cut in sharply. What you did hear? Who was he talking to? Mr. Finch. He was talking and looking at Miss Mayella. Then you ran? I sure did, sir. Why did you run? I was scared, sir. Why were you scared? Mr. Finch, if you was a nigger like me, You'd be scared, too. Atticus sat down. Mr. Gilmer was making his way to the witness stand. But before he got there, Mr. Link Dias rose from the audience and announced, I just want the whole lot of you to know one thing right now. That boy's worked for me eight years, and I ain't had a speck of trouble out of him. Not a speck. Shut your mouth, sir! Judge Taylor was wide awake and roaring. He was also pink in the face. His speech was miraculously unimpaired by his cigar. Link Dias, he yelled, if you have anything you want to say, you can say it under oath and at the proper time. But until then, you get out of this room, you hear me? Get out of this room, sir, you hear me? I'll be damned if I listen to this case again. Judge Taylor looked daggers at Atticus as if daring him to speak, but Atticus had ducked his head and was laughing into his lap. I remembered something he had said about Judge Taylor's ex-cathedra remarks, sometimes exceeding his duty, but that few lawyers ever did anything about them. I looked at Jem, but Jem shook his head. It ain't like one of the jurymen got up and started talking, he said. I think it'd be different then. Mr. Link was just disturbing the peace or something. Judge Taylor told the reporter to expunge anything he happened to have written down after Mr. Finch, if you were a nigger like me, you'd be scared too, and told the jury to disregard the interruption. He looked suspiciously down the middle aisle and waited, I suppose, for Mr. Link Dias to effect total departure. Then he said, Go ahead, Mr. Gilmer. You were given thirty days once for disorderly conduct, Robinson? asked Mr. Gilmer. Yes, sir. What did the nigger look like when you got through with him? He beat me, Mr. Gilmer. Yes, but you were convicted, weren't you? Atticus raised his head. 
It was a misdemeanor, and it's in the record, Judge. I thought he sounded tired. Witness will answer, though, said Judge Taylor, just as wearily. Yes, sir. I got thirty days. I knew that Mr. Gilmer would sincerely tell the jury that anyone who was convicted of disorderly conduct could easily have had it in his heart to take advantage of Mayella Yule. That was the only reason he cared. Reasons like that helped. Robinson, you're pretty good at busting up shiffer robes and kindling with one hand, aren't you? Yes, sir. I reckon so. Strong enough to choke the breath out of a woman and sling her to the floor? I never done that, sir. But you are strong enough to? I reckon so, sir. Had your eye on her a long time, hadn't you, boy? No, sir. I never looked at her. Then you were mighty polite to do all that chopping and hauling for her, weren't you, boy? I was just trying to help her out, sir. That was mighty generous of you. You had chores at home after your regular work, didn't you? Yes, sir. Why didn't you do them instead of Miss Ewell's? I done them both, sir. You must have been pretty busy. Why? Why what, sir? Why were you so anxious to do that woman's chores? Tom Robinson hesitated, searching for an answer. Looked like she didn't have nobody to help her, like I says. With Mr. Ewell and seven children on the place, boy? Well, I says it looked like they never help her none. You did all this chopping and work from sheer goodness, boy. Tried to help her, I says. Mr. Gilmer smiled grimly at the jury. You're a mighty good fellow, it seems. Did all this for not one penny? Yes, sir. I felt right sorry for her. She seemed to try more than the rest of them. You felt sorry for her? You felt sorry for her? Mr. Gilmer seemed ready to rise to the ceiling. The witness realized his mistake and shifted uncomfortably in the chair. But the damage was done. Below us, nobody liked Tom Robinson's answer. Mr. Gilmer paused a long time to let it sink in. Now, you went by the house as usual last November 21st, he said, and she asked you to come in and bust up a chiffre robe? No, sir. Do you deny that you went by the house? No, sir. She said she had something for me to do inside the house. She says she asked you to bust up a chiffre robe. Is that right? No, sir, it ain't. Then you say she's lying, boy? Atticus was on his feet, but Tom Robinson didn't need him. I don't say she's lying, Mr. Gilmer. I say she's mistaken in her mind. To the next ten questions, as Mr. Gilmer reviewed Mayella's version of events, the witness's steady answer was that she was mistaken in her mind. Didn't Mr. Ewell run you off the place, boy? No, sir. I don't think he did. Don't think? What do you mean? I mean, I didn't stay long enough for him to run me off. You're very candid about this. Why did you run so fast? I says I was scared, sir. If you had a clear conscience, why were you scared? Like I says before, it weren't safe for any nigger to be in a fix like that. But you weren't in a fix. You testified that you were resisting, Miss Ewell. Were you so scared that she'd hurt you, you ran? 
A big buck like you? No, sir. I scared I'd be in court, just like I am now. Scared of arrest? Scared you'd have to face up to what you did? No, sir. Scared I'd have to face up to what I didn't do. Are you being impudent to me, boy? No, sir. I didn't go to be. This was as much as I heard of Mr. Gilmer's cross-examination, because Jem made me take Dill out. For some reason, Dill had started crying and couldn't stop. Quietly at first, then his sobs were heard by several people in the balcony. Jem said if I didn't go with him, he'd make me, and Reverend Sykes said I'd better go, so I went. Dill had seemed to be all right that day, nothing wrong with him, but I guessed he hadn't fully recovered from running away. Ain't you feeling good? I asked when we reached the bottom of the stairs. Dill tried to pull himself together as we ran down the south steps. Mr. Link Dias was a lonely figure on the top step. Anything happening, Scout? He asked as we went by. No, sir, I answered over my shoulder. Dill here, he's sick. Come on out under the trees, I said. Heat got you, I expect. We chose the fattest live oak, and we sat under it. It was just him I couldn't stand, Dill said. Who? Tom? That old Mr. Gilmer doing him that away, talking so hateful to him. Dill, that's his job. Why, if we didn't have prosecutors, well, we couldn't have defense attorneys, I reckon. Dill exhaled patiently. I know all that, Scout. It was the way he said it. It made me sick, plain sick. He's supposed to act that way, Dill. He was cross. He didn't act that way when... Dill, those were his own witnesses. Well, Mr. Finch didn't act that way to Mayella and old man Yule when he cross-examined them. The way that man called him boy all the time and sneered at him and looked around at the jury every time he answered. Well, Dill, after all, he's just a Negro. I don't care one speck. It ain't right. Somehow it ain't right to do them that way. Hasn't anybody got any business talking like that? It just makes me sick. That's just Mr. Gilmer's way, Dill. He does them all that way. You've never seen him get good and down on one yet. Why, when... Well, today Mr. Gilmer seemed to me like he wasn't half trying. They do them all that way. Most lawyers, I mean. Mr. Finch doesn't. He's not an example, Dill. He's... I was trying to grope in my memory for a sharp phrase of Miss Morty Atkinson's. I had it. He's the same in the courtroom as he is on the public streets. That's not what I mean, said Dill. I know what you mean, boy said a voice behind us. We thought it came from the tree trunk, but it belonged to Mr. Dolphus Raymond. He peered around the trunk at us. You aren't thin-hided. It just makes you sick, doesn't it? Chapter 20 Come on round here, son. I got something that'll settle your stomach. As Mr. Dolphus Raymond was an evil man, I accepted his invitation reluctantly, but I followed Dill. Somehow I didn't think Atticus would like it if we became friendly with Mr. Raymond, and I knew Aunt Alexandra wouldn't. Here, he said, offering Dill his paper sack with straws in it. Take a good sip. It'll quieten you. Dill sucked on the straws, smiled, and pulled at length. He <laughs> said Mr. Raymond, evidently taking delight in corrupting a child. Dill, you watch out now, I warned. Dill released the straws and grinned. Scout, it's nothing but Coca-Cola. 
Mr. Raymond sat up against the tree trunk. He had been lying on the grass. You little folks won't tell on me now, will you? You'd ruin my reputation if you did. You mean all you drink in that sack's Coca-Cola? Just plain Coca-Cola? Yes, ma'am, Mr. Raymond nodded. I liked his smell. It was of leather, horses, cottonseed. He wore the only English riding boots I had ever seen. That's all I drink most of the time. Then you just pretend you're half... I beg your pardon, sir. I caught myself. I didn't mean to be... Mr. Raymond chuckled, not at all offended, and I tried to frame a discreet question. Why do you do like you do? What? Oh, yes. You mean, why do I pretend? Well, it's very simple, he said. Some folks don't like the way I live. Now, I could say the hell with them. I don't care if they don't like it. I do say I don't care if they don't like it, right enough. But I don't say the hell with them, see? Dill and I said, no, sir. I try to give them a reason, you see. It helps folks if they can latch on to a reason. When I come to town, which is seldom, if I weave a little and drink out of this sack, folks can say Dolphus Raymond's in the clutches of whiskey. That's why he won't change his ways. He can't help himself. That's why he lives the way he does. That ain't honest, Mr. Raymond. Making yourself out badder than you are already? It ain't honest, but it's mighty helpful to folks. Secretly, Miss Finch, I'm not much of a drinker. But you see, they could never, never understand that I live like I do, because that's the way I want to live. I had a feeling that I shouldn't be here listening to this sinful man who had mixed children and didn't care who knew it, but he was fascinating. I had never encountered a being who deliberately perpetrated fraud against himself. But why had he entrusted us with his deepest secret? I asked him why. Because you are children, and you can understand it, he said, and because I heard that one. He jerked his head at Dill. Things haven't caught up with that one's instinct yet. Let him get a little older, and he won't get sick and cry. Maybe things will strike him as being not quite right, say. But he won't cry. Not when he gets a few years on him. Cry about what, Mr. Raymond? Dill's maleness was beginning to assert itself. Cry about the simple hell people give other people without even thinking. Cry about the hell white people give colored folks without even stopping to think that they're people too. Atticus says cheating a colored man is ten times worse than cheating a white man, I muttered. Says it's the worst thing you can do. Mr. Raymond said, I don't reckon it's... Miss Jean Louise, you don't know your pa is not a run-of-the-mill man. It'll take a few years for that to sink in. You haven't seen enough of the world yet. You haven't even seen this town. But all you gotta do is step back inside the courthouse. Which reminded me that we were missing nearly all of Mr. Gilmer's cross-examination. I looked at the sun, and it was dropping fast behind the store tops on the west side of the square. Between two fires, I could not decide which I wanted to jump into, Mr. Raymond or the Fifth Judicial Circuit Court. Come on, Dill, I said. You all right now? Yeah. Glad to have met you, Mr. Raymond. And thanks for the drink. It was mighty settling. We raced back to the courthouse, up the steps, up two flights of stairs, and edged our way along the balcony rail. 
Reverend Sykes had saved our seats. The courtroom was still, and again I wondered where the babies were. Judge Taylor's cigar was a brown speck in the center of his mouth. Mr. Gilmer was writing on one of the yellow pads on his table, trying to outdo the court reporter, whose hand was jerking rapidly. Shoot, I muttered. We missed it. Atticus was halfway through his speech to the jury. He had evidently pulled some papers from his briefcase that rested beside his chair, because they were on the table. Tom Robinson was toying with them. Absence of any corroborative evidence, this man was indicted on a capital charge and is now on trial for his life. I punched Jim. How long's he been at it? He's just gone over the evidence, Jim whispered. And we're gonna win, Scout. I don't see how we can't. He's been at it about five minutes. He made it as plain and easy as, well, as I'd have explained it to you. You could have understood it even. Did Mr. Gilmer? Shh, nothing new, just the usual. Hush now. We looked down again. Atticus was speaking easily, with the kind of detachment he used when he dictated a letter. He walked slowly up and down in front of the jury, and the jury seemed to be attentive. Their heads were up, and they followed Atticus's route with what seemed to be appreciation. I guess it was because Atticus wasn't a thunderer. Atticus paused. Then he did something he didn't ordinarily do. He unhitched his watch and chain and placed them on the table, saying, with the court's permission. Judge Taylor nodded. And then Atticus did something I never saw him do before or since, in public or in private. He unbuttoned his vest, unbuttoned his collar, loosened his tie, and took off his coat. He never loosened a scrap of his clothing until he undressed at bedtime, and to Jam and me, this was the equivalent of him standing before us stark naked. We exchanged horrified glances. Atticus put his hands in his pockets, and as he returned to the jury, I saw his gold collar button and the tips of his pen and pencil winking in the light. Gentlemen, he said. Jem and I again looked at each other. Atticus might have said, Scout. His voice had lost its aridity, its detachment, and he was talking to the jury as if they were folks on the post office corner. Gentlemen, he was saying, I shall be brief, but I would like to use my remaining time with you to remind you that this case is not a difficult one. It requires no minute sifting of complicated facts. But it does require you to be sure, beyond all reasonable doubt, as to the guilt of the defendant. To begin with, this case should never have come to trial. This case is as simple as black and white. The state has not produced one iota of medical evidence to the effect that the crime Tom Robinson is charged with ever took place. It has relied instead upon the testimony of two witnesses whose evidence has not only been called into serious question on cross-examination, but has been flatly contradicted by the defendant. The defendant is not guilty. But somebody in this courtroom is. I have nothing but pity in my heart for the chief witness for the state. But my pity does not extend so far as to her putting a man's life at stake, which she has done in an effort to get rid of her own guilt. I say guilt, gentlemen, because it was guilt that motivated her. She has committed no crime. She has merely broken a rigid and time-honored code of our society, a code so severe that whoever breaks it 
is hounded from our midst as unfit to live with. She is the victim of cruel poverty and ignorance, but I cannot pity her. She is white. She knew full well the enormity of her offense, but because her desires were stronger than the code she was breaking, she persisted in breaking it. She persisted, and her subsequent reaction is something that all of us have known at one time or another. She did something every child has done. She tried to put the evidence of her offense away from her. But in this case, she was no child hiding stolen contraband. She struck out at her victim. Of necessity, she must put him away from her. He must be removed from her presence, from this world. She must destroy the evidence of her offense. What was the evidence of her offense? Tom Robinson, a human being. She must put Tom Robinson away from her. Tom Robinson was her daily reminder of what she did. What did she do? She tempted a Negro. She was white, and she tempted a Negro. She did something that in our society is unspeakable. She kissed a black man, not an old uncle, but a strong, young Negro man. No code mattered to her before she broke it, but it came crashing down on her afterwards. Her father saw it, and the defendant has testified as to his remarks. What did her father do? We don't know, but there is circumstantial evidence to indicate that Mayella Ewell was beaten savagely by someone who led almost exclusively with his left. We do know in part what Mr. Ewell did. He did what any God-fearing, persevering, respectable white man would do under the circumstances. He swore out a warrant, no doubt signing it with his left hand. And Tom Robinson now sits before you, having taken the oath with the only good hand he possesses, his right hand. And so, a quiet, respectable, humble Negro, who had the unmitigated temerity to feel sorry for a white woman, has had to put his word against two white peoples. I need not remind you of their appearance and conduct on the stand. You saw them for yourselves. The witnesses for the state, with the exception of the sheriff of Macomb County, have presented themselves to you, gentlemen, to this court, in the cynical confidence that their testimony would not be doubted, confident that you gentlemen would go along with them on the assumption, the evil assumption, that all Negroes lie, that all Negroes are basically immoral beings, that all Negro men are not to be trusted around our women, an assumption one associates with minds of their caliber. Which, gentlemen, we know is in itself a lie as black as Tom Robinson's skin, a lie I do not have to point out to you. You know the truth, and the truth is this. Some Negroes lie. Some Negroes are immoral. Some Negro men are not to be trusted around women, black or white. But this is a truth that applies to the human race and to no particular race of men. There is not a person in this courtroom who has never told a lie, who has never done an immoral thing. And there is no man living who has never looked upon a woman without desire. Atticus paused and took out his handkerchief. 
Then he took off his glasses and wiped them, and we saw another first. We had never seen him sweat. He was one of those men whose faces never perspired, but now it was shining tan. One more thing, gentlemen, before I quit. Thomas Jefferson once said that all men are created equal, a phrase that the Yankees and the distaff side of the executive branch in Washington are fond of hurling at us. There is a tendency in this year of grace, 1935, for certain people to use this phrase out of context to satisfy all conditions. The most ridiculous example I can think of is that the people who run public education promote the stupid and idle along with the industrious. Because all men are created equal, Educators will gravely tell you the children left behind suffer terrible feelings of inferiority. We know all men are not created equal in the sense some people would have us believe. Some people are smarter than others. Some people have more opportunity because they're born with it. Some men make more money than others. Some ladies make better cakes than others. Some people are born gifted beyond the normal scope of most men. But there is one way in this country in which all men are created equal. There is one human institution that makes a pauper the equal of a Rockefeller, the stupid man the equal of an Einstein, and the ignorant man the equal of any college president. That institution, gentlemen, is a court. It can be the Supreme Court of the United States, or the humblest J.P. Court in the land, or this honorable court which you serve. Our courts have their faults, as does any human institution. But in this country, our courts are the great levelers, and in our courts, all men are created equal. I'm no idealist to believe firmly in the integrity of our courts and in the jury system. That is no ideal to me. It is a living, working reality. Gentlemen, a court is no better than each man of you sitting before me on this jury. A court is only as sound as its jury, and a jury is only as sound as the men who make it up. I am confident that you gentlemen will review without passion the evidence you have heard, come to a decision, and restore this defendant to his family. In the name of God, do your duty. Atticus's voice had dropped, and as he turned away from the jury, he said something I did not catch. He said it more to himself than to the court. I punched Jem. What'd he say? In the name of God, believe him. I think that's what he said. Dill suddenly reached over to me and tugged at Jem. Look yonder. We followed his finger with sinking hearts. Calpurnia was making her way up the middle aisle, walking straight toward Atticus. Chapter 21 She stopped shyly at the railing and waited to get Judge Taylor's attention. She was in a fresh apron, and she carried an envelope in her hand. Judge Taylor saw her and said, It's Calpurnia, isn't it? Yes, sir, she said. Could I just pass this note to Mr. Finch, please, sir? It hasn't got anything to do with, with the trial. Judge Taylor nodded, and Atticus took the envelope from Calpurnia. He opened it, read its contents, and said, Judge, I... This note is from my sister. She says my children are missing, haven't turned up since noon. I... Could you... I know where they are, Atticus, 
Mr. Underwood spoke up. They're right up yonder in the colored balcony. Been there since precisely 1.18 p.m. Our father turned around and looked up. Jim, come down from there, he called. Then he said something to the judge we didn't hear. We climbed across Reverend Sykes and made our way to the staircase. Atticus and Calpurnia met us downstairs. Calpurnia looked peeved, but Atticus looked exhausted. Jim was jumping in excitement. We've won, haven't we? I've no idea, said Atticus shortly. You've been here all afternoon? Go home with Calpurnia and get your supper. And stay home. Oh, Atticus, let us come back, pleaded Jim. Please let us hear the verdict. Please, sir. The jury might be out and back in a minute. We don't know. But we could tell Atticus was relenting. Well, you've heard it all, so you might as well hear the rest. Tell you what, you all can come back when you've eaten your supper. Eat slowly now. You won't miss anything important. And if the jury's still out, you can wait with us. But I expect it'll be over before you get back. You think they'll acquit him that fast? asked Jem. Atticus opened his mouth to answer, but shut it and left us. I prayed that Reverend Sykes would save our seats for us, but stopped praying when I remembered that people got up and left in droves when the jury was out. Tonight they'd overrun the drug store, the OK Cafe, and the hotel. That is, unless they had brought their suppers, too. Calpurnia marched us home. Skin every one of you alive, the very idea. You children listening to all that. Mr. Jem, don't you know better than to take your little sister to that trial? Miss Alexandra will absolutely have a stroke of paralysis when she finds out. Ain't fitting for children to hear. The street lights were on, and we glimpsed Calpurnia's indignant profile as we passed beneath them. Mr. Jim, I thought you was getting some kind of head on your shoulders. The very idea. She's your little sister. The very idea, sir. You ought to be perfectly ashamed of yourself. Ain't you got any sense at all? I was exhilarated. So many things had happened so fast, I felt it would take years to sort them out. And now here was Calpurnia giving her precious gem down the country. What new marvels would the evening bring? Jem was chuckling. Don't you want to hear about it, Cal? Hush your mouth, sir. When you ought to be hanging your head in shame, you go along laughing. Calpurnia revived a series of rusty threats that moved Jem to little remorse, and she sailed up the front steps with her classic, If Mr. Finch don't wear you out, I will. Get in that house, sir. Jem went in, grinning, and Calpurnia nodded tacit consent to having Dill in to supper. You all call Miss Rachel right now and tell him where you are, she told him. She's run distracted looking for you. You watch out, she don't ship you back to Meridian first thing in the morning. Aunt Alexandra met us and nearly fainted when Calpurnia told her where we were. I guess it hurt her when we told her Attica said we could go back because she didn't say a word during supper. She just rearranged food on her plate, looking at it sadly while Calpurnia served Jem, Dill, and me with a vengeance. Calpurnia poured milk, dished out potato salad and ham, muttering, Shamed of yourselves, in varying degrees of intensity. Now you all eat slow, was her final command. Reverend Sykes had saved our places. We were surprised to find that we had been gone nearly an hour, and were equally surprised to find the courtroom exactly as we had left it, with minor changes. The jury box was empty. The defendant was gone. Judge Taylor had been gone, but he reappeared as we were seating ourselves. Nobody's moved hardly, said Jem. They moved around some when the jury went out, said Reverend Sykes. The men folk down there got the women folk their suppers, and they fed their babies. How long have they been out? asked Jem. About thirty minutes. 
Mr. Finch and Mr. Gilmer did some more talking, and Judge Taylor charged the jury. How was he? asked Jem. What say? Oh, he did right well. I ain't complaining one bit. He was mighty fair-minded. He sort of said, if you believe this, then you'll have to return one verdict. But if you believe this, you'll have to return another one. I thought he was leaning a little to our side. Reverend Sykes scratched his head. Jem smiled. He's not supposed to lean, Reverend, but don't fret. We've won it, he said wisely. Don't see how any jury could convict on what we heard. Now don't you be so confident, Mr. Jem. I ain't ever seen any jury decide in favor of a colored man over a white man. But Jem took exception to Reverend Sykes, and we were subjected to a lengthy review of the evidence with Jem's ideas on the law regarding rape. It wasn't rape if she let you, but she had to be 18, in Alabama, that is, and Mayella was 19. Apparently, you had to kick and holler, you had to be overpowered and stomped on, preferably knocked stone cold. If you were under 18, you didn't have to go through all this. Mr. Jem, this ain't a polite thing for little ladies to hear. Oh, she doesn't know what we're talking about, said Jem. Scout, this is too old for you, ain't it? It most certainly is not. I know every word you're saying. Perhaps I was too convincing, because Jem hushed and never discussed the subject again. What time is it, Reverend? he asked. Getting on toward eight. I looked down and saw Atticus strolling around with his hands in his pockets. He made a tour of the windows, then walked by the railing over to the jury box. He looked in it, inspected Judge Taylor on his throne, then went back to where he started. I caught his eye and waved to him. He acknowledged my salute with a nod and resumed his tour. Mr. Gilmer was standing at the windows talking to Mr. Underwood. Bert, the court reporter, was chain-smoking. He sat back with his feet on the table. But the officers of the court, the ones present, Atticus, Mr. Gilmer, Judge Taylor, sound asleep, and Bert, were the only ones whose behavior seemed normal. I had never seen a packed courtroom so still. Sometimes a baby would cry out fretfully, and a child would scurry out. But the grown people sat as if they were in church. In the balcony, the Negroes sat and stood around us with biblical patience. The old courthouse clock suffered its preliminary strain and struck the hour. Eight deafening bongs that shook our bones. When it bonged eleven times, I was past feeling. Tired from fighting sleep, I allowed myself a short nap against Reverend Sykes's comfortable arm and shoulder. I jerked awake and made an honest effort to remain so by looking down and concentrating on the heads below. There were sixteen bald ones, fourteen men that could pass for redheads, forty heads varying between brown and black, and I remembered something Jem had once explained to me when he went through a brief period of psychical research. He said if enough people, a stadium full maybe, were to concentrate on one thing, such as setting a tree afire in the woods, that the tree would ignite of its own accord. I toyed with the idea of asking everyone below to concentrate on setting Tom Robinson free, but thought, if they were as tired as I, it wouldn't work. Dill was sound asleep, his head on Jem's shoulder, and Jem was quiet. Ain't it a long time? I asked him. Sure is, Scout, he said happily. Well, from the way you put it, it'd just take five minutes. Jem raised his eyebrows. There are things you don't understand, he said and I was too weary to argue.
But I must have been reasonably awake, or I would not have received the impression that was creeping into me. It was not unlike one I had last winter, and I shivered, though the night was hot. The feeling grew until the atmosphere in the courtroom was exactly the same as a cold February morning when the mockingbirds were still and the carpenters had stopped hammering on Miss Morty's new house and every wood door in the neighborhood was shut as tight as the doors of the Radley place. A deserted, waiting, empty street and the courtroom was packed with people. A steaming summer night was no different from a winter morning. Mr. Heck Tate, who had entered the courtroom and was talking to Atticus, might have been wearing his high boots and lumber jacket. Atticus had stopped his tranquil journey and had put his foot onto the bottom rung of a chair. As he listened to what Mr. Tate was saying, he ran his hand slowly up and down his thigh. I expected Mr. Tate to say any minute, Take him, Mr. Finch. But Mr. Tate said, This court will come to order, in a voice that rang with authority, and the heads below us jerked up. Mr. Tate left the room and returned with Tom Robinson. He steered Tom to his place beside Atticus and stood there. Judge Taylor had roused himself to sudden alertness and was sitting up straight, looking at the empty jury box. What happened after that had a dream-like quality. In a dream I saw the jury return, moving like underwater swimmers, and Judge Taylor's voice came from far away and was tiny. I saw something only a lawyer's child could be expected to see could be expected to watch for, and it was like watching Atticus walk into the street, raise a rifle to his shoulder, and pull the trigger, but watching all the time knowing that the gun was empty. A jury never looks at a defendant it has convicted, and when this jury came in, not one of them looked at Tom Robinson. The foreman handed a piece of paper to Mr. Tate, who handed it to the clerk, who handed it to the judge. I shut my eyes. Judge Taylor was polling the jury. Guilty, 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 guilty. I peeked at Jem. His hands were white from gripping the balcony rail, and his shoulders jerked as if each guilty was a separate stab between them. Judge Taylor was saying something. His gavel was in his fist, but he wasn't using it. Dimly I saw Atticus pushing papers from the table into his briefcase. He snapped it shut, went to the court reporter and said something, nodded to Mr. Gilmer, and then went to Tom Robinson and whispered something to him. Atticus put his hand on Tom's shoulder as he whispered. Atticus took his coat off the back of his chair and pulled it over his shoulder. Then he left the courtroom, but not by his usual exit. He must have wanted to go home the short way, because he walked quickly down the middle aisle toward the south exit. I followed the top of his head as he made his way to the door. He did not look up. Someone was punching me, but I was reluctant to take my eyes from the people below us and from the image of Atticus's lonely walk down the aisle. Miss Jean Louise? I looked around. They were standing. All around us and in the balcony on the opposite wall, the Negroes were getting to their feet. Reverend Sykes' voice was as distant as Judge Taylor's. Miss Jean Louise, stand up. Your father's passing. This ends Disc 8, To Kill a Mockingbird, Disc 9. Chapter 22 It was Jem's turn to cry. 
His face was streaked with angry tears as we made our way through the cheerful crowd. It ain't right, he muttered, all the way to the corner of the square where we found Atticus waiting. Atticus was standing under the street light, looking as though nothing had happened. His vest was buttoned, his collar and tie were neatly in place, his watch chain glistened. He was his impassive self again. It ain't right, Atticus, said Jem. No, son, it's not right. We walked home. Aunt Alexandra was waiting up. She was in her dressing gown, and I could have sworn she had on her corset underneath it. I'm sorry, brother, she murmured. Having never heard her call Atticus brother before, I stole a glance at Jem, but he was not listening. He would look up at Atticus, then down at the floor, and I wondered if he thought Atticus somehow responsible for Tom Robinson's conviction. Is he all right? Auntie asked, indicating Jem. He'll be so presently, said Atticus. It was a little too strong for him. Our father sighed. I'm going to bed, he said. If I don't wake up in the morning, don't call me. I didn't think it wise in the first place to let them... This is their home, sister, said Atticus. We've made it this way for them. They might as well learn to cope with it. But they don't have to go to the courthouse and wallow in it. It's just as much Maycomb County as missionary teas. Atticus, Aunt Alexandra's eyes were anxious. You are the last person I thought would turn bitter over this. I'm not bitter, just tired. I'm going to bed. Atticus, said Jem bleakly. He turned in the doorway. What, son? How could they do it? How could they? I don't know, but they did it. They've done it before, and they did it tonight, and they'll do it again. And when they do it, seems that only children weep. Good night. But things are always better in the morning. Atticus rose at his usual ungodly hour and was in the living room behind the mobile register when we stumbled in. Jem's morning face posed the question his sleepy lips struggled to ask. It's not time to worry yet, Atticus reassured him as we went to the dining room. We're not through yet. There'll be an appeal. You can count on that. Gracious alive, Cal, what's all this? He was staring at his breakfast plate. Calpurnia said, Tom Robinson's daddy sent you along this chicken this morning. I fixed it. You tell him I'm proud to get it. Bet they don't have chicken for breakfast at the White House. What are these? Rolls, said Calpurnia. Estelle down at the hotel sent them. Atticus looked up at her, puzzled, and she said, You better step out here and see what's in the kitchen, Mr. Finch. We followed him. The kitchen table was loaded with enough food to bury the family. Hunks of salt pork, tomatoes, beans, even scuppernongs. Atticus grinned when he found a jar of pickled pig's knuckles. Reckon auntie'll let me eat these in the dining room? Calpurnia said, this was all round the back steps when I got here this morning. They... They appreciate what you did, Mr. Finch. They... They aren't overstepping themselves, are they? Atticus's eyes filled with tears. He did not speak for a moment. Tell them I'm very grateful, he said. Tell them... Tell them they must never do this again. Times are too hard. He left the kitchen, went in the dining room, and excused himself to Aunt Alexandra, put on his hat, and went to town. 
We heard Dill's step in the hall, so Calpurnia left Atticus's uneaten breakfast on the table. Between rabbit bites, Dill told us of Miss Rachel's reaction to last night, which was, if a man like Atticus Finch wants to butt his head against a stone wall, it's his head. I'd got her told, growled Dill, gnawing a chicken leg, but she didn't look much like telling this morning. Said she was up half the night wondering where I was. Said she'd have had the sheriff after me, but he was at the hearing. Dill, you've got to stop going off without telling her, said Jem. It just aggravates her. Dill sighed patiently. I told her till I was blue in the face where I was going. She's just seeing too many snakes in the closet. Bet that woman drinks a pint for breakfast every morning. No, she drinks two glasses full. Seen her. Don't talk like that, Dill, said Aunt Alexandra. It's not becoming to a child. It's cynical. I ain't cynical, Miss Alexandra. Telling the truth's not cynical, is it? The way you tell it, it is. Jem's eyes flashed at her, but he said to Dill, Let's go. You can take that runner with you. When we went to the front porch, Miss Stephanie Crawford was busy telling it to Miss Marty Atkinson and Mr. Avery. They looked around at us and went on talking. Jem made a feral noise in his throat. I wished for a weapon. I hate grown folks looking at you, said Dill. Makes you feel like you've done something. Miss Marty yelled for Jem Finch to come there. Jem groaned and heaved himself up from the swing. We'll go with you, Dill said. Miss Stephanie's nose quivered with curiosity. She wanted to know who all gave us permission to go to court. She didn't see us, but it was all over town this morning that we were in the colored balcony. Did Atticus put us up there as a sort of... Wasn't it right close up there with all those... Did Scout understand all the... Didn't it make us mad to see our daddy beat? Hush, Stephanie. Miss Morty's diction was deadly. I've not got all the morning to pass on the porch. Jim Finch, I called to find out if you and your colleagues can eat some cake. Got up at five to make it, so you better say yes. Excuse us, Stephanie. Good morning, Mr. Avery. There was a big cake and two little ones on Miss Morty's kitchen table. There should have been three little ones. It was not like Miss Morty to forget Dill, and we must have shown it. But we understood when she cut from the big cake and gave the slice to Jem. As we ate, we sensed that this was Miss Morty's way of saying that as far as she was concerned, nothing had changed. She sat quietly in a kitchen chair watching us. Suddenly she spoke. Don't fret, Jem. Things are never as bad as they seem. Indoors, when Miss Morty wanted to say something lengthy, she spread her fingers on her knees and settled her bridge work. This she did, and we waited. I simply want to tell you that there are some men in this world who were born to do our unpleasant jobs for us. Your father's one of them. Oh, said Jem. Well... Don't you owe well me, sir, Miss Morty replied, recognizing Jem's fatalistic noises. You are not old enough to appreciate what I said. Jem was staring at his half-eaten cake. It's like being a caterpillar in a cocoon. That's what it is, he said. Like something asleep, wrapped up in a warm place. I always thought Maycomb folks were the best folks in the world. At least that's what they seemed like. We're the safest folks in the world, said Miss Morty. We're so rarely called on to be Christians. But when we are, we've got men like Atticus to go for us. Jem grinned ruefully. I wish the rest of the county thought that. You'd be surprised how many of us do. Who? 
Jem's voice rose. Who in this town did one thing to help Tom Robinson? Just who? His colored friends, for one thing, and people like us. People like Judge Taylor. People like Mr. Heck Tate. Stop eating and start thinking, Jem. Did it ever strike you that Judge Taylor naming Atticus to defend that boy was no accident? That Judge Taylor might have had his reasons for naming him? This was a thought. Court-appointed defenses were usually given to Maxwell Green, Maycomb's latest addition to the bar, who needed the experience. Maxwell Green should have had Tom Robinson's case. You think about that. Miss Morty was saying, it was no accident. I was sitting there on the porch last night waiting. I waited and waited to see you all come down the sidewalk. And as I waited, I thought, Atticus Finch won't win. He can't win. But he's the only man in these parts who can keep a jury out so long in a case like that. And I thought to myself, well, we are making a step. It's just a baby step, but it's a step. It's all right to talk like that. Can't any Christian judges and lawyers make up for heathen juries? Jem muttered. Soon as I get grown, that's something you'll have to take up with your father, Miss Morty said. We went down Miss Morty's cool new steps into the sunshine. And found Mr. Avery and Miss Stephanie Crawford still at it. They had moved down the sidewalk and were standing in front of Miss Stephanie's house. Miss Rachel was walking toward them. I think I'll be a clown when I get grown," said Dill. Jem and I stopped in our tracks. "Yes, sir, a clown," he said. "There ain't one thing in this world I can do about folks except laugh." So I'm going to join the circus and laugh my head off. You got it backwards, Dill," said Jem. "Clowns are sad. It's folks that laugh at them. Well, I'm going to be a new kind of clown. I'm going to stand in the middle of the ring and laugh at the folks. Just look a yonder," he pointed. "Every one of 'em ought to be riding broomsticks. Aunt Rachel already does." Miss Stephanie and Miss Rachel were waving wildly at us, in a way that did not give the lie to Dill's observation. Oh gosh," breathed Jem. "I reckon it'd be ugly not to see 'em." Something was wrong. Mister Avery was red in the face from a sneezing spell, and nearly blew us off the sidewalk when we came up. Miss Stephanie was trembling with excitement. And Miss Rachel caught Dill's shoulder. "You get on in the backyard and stay there," she said. "There's danger a coming." "Smatter," I asked. "Ain't you heard yet? It's all over town." At that moment, Aunt Alexandra came to the door and called us, but she was too late. It was Miss Stephanie's pleasure to tell us. This morning, Mister Bob Ewell stopped Atticus on the post office corner. Spat in his face, and told him he'd get him if it took him the rest of his life. Chapter Twenty Three. I wish Bob Ewell wouldn't chew tobacco. Was all Atticus said about it. According to Miss Stephanie Crawford, however, Atticus was leaving the post office when Mister Ewell approached him, cursed him, spat on him. And threatened to kill him, Miss Stephanie, who by the time she had told it twice was there and had seen it all, passing by from the Jitney Jungle, she was. Miss Stephanie said Atticus didn't bat an eye, just took out his handkerchief and wiped his face and stood there and let Mister Ewell call him names wild horses could not bring her to repeat. Mister Ewell was a veteran of an obscure war. That plus Atticus's peaceful reaction probably prompted him to inquire, "Too proud to fight, you nigger-loving bastard." Miss Stephanie said Atticus said, "No, too old." 
put his hands in his pockets, and strolled on. Miss Stephanie said you had to hand it to Atticus Finch. He could be right dry sometimes. Jem and I didn't think it entertaining. After all, though, I said, he was the deadest shot in the county one time. He could, you know he wouldn't carry a gun scout. He ain't even got one, said Jem. You know he didn't even have one down at the jail that night. He told me having a gun around's an invitation to somebody to shoot you. This is different, I said. We can ask him to borrow one. We did, and he said, nonsense. Dill was of the opinion that an appeal to Atticus's better nature might work. After all, we would starve if Mr. Ewell killed him. Besides, be raised exclusively by Aunt Alexandra, and we all knew the first thing she'd do before Atticus was under the ground good would be to fire Calpurnia. Jem said it might work if I cried and flung a fit, being young and a girl. That didn't work either. But when he noticed us dragging around the neighborhood, not eating, taking little interest in our normal pursuits, Atticus discovered how deeply frightened we were. He tempted Jem with a new football magazine one night. When he saw Jem flip the pages and toss it aside, he said, What's bothering you, son? Jem came to the point. Mr. Ewell, what has happened? Nothing's happened. We're scared for you, and we think you ought to do something about him. Atticus smiled wryly. Do what? Put him under a peace bond? When a man says he's going to get you, looks like he means it. He meant it when he said it, said Atticus. Jem, see if you can stand in Bob Ewell's shoes a minute. I destroyed his last shred of credibility at that trial, if he had any to begin with. The man had to have some kind of comeback. His kind always does. So if spitting in my face and threatening me saved Mayella Ewell one extra beating, that's something I'll gladly take. He had to take it out on somebody, and I'd rather it be me than that house full of children out there. You understand? Jem nodded. Aunt Alexandra entered the room as Atticus was saying, We don't have anything to fear from Bob Ewell. He got it all out of his system that morning. I wouldn't be so sure of that, Atticus, she said. His kind would do anything to pay off a grudge. You know how those people are. What on earth could Ewell do to me, sister? Something furtive, Aunt Alexandra said. You may count on that. Nobody has much chance to be furtive in Makeham, Atticus answered. After that, we were not afraid. Summer was melting away, and we made the most of it. Atticus assured us that nothing would happen to Tom Robinson until the higher court reviewed his case, and that Tom had a good chance of going free, or at least of having a new trial. He was at Enfield Prison Farm, seventy miles away in Chester County. I asked Atticus if Tom's wife and children were allowed to visit him, but Atticus said no. If he loses his appeal, I asked one evening, what'll happen to him? He'll go to the chair, said Atticus, unless the governor commutes his sentence. Not time to worry yet, Scout. We've got a good chance. Jem was sprawled on the sofa reading Popular Mechanics. He looked up. It ain't right. He didn't kill anybody, even if he was guilty. He didn't take anybody's life. You know rape's a capital offense in Alabama, said Atticus. Yes, sir, but the jury didn't have to give him death. If they wanted to, they could have gave him twenty years. Given, said Atticus. Tom Robinson's a colored man, Jem. No jury in this part of the world's going to say, we think you're guilty, but not very, on a charge like that. 
It was either a straight acquittal or nothing. Jem was shaking his head. I know it's not right, but I can't figure out what's wrong. Maybe rape shouldn't be a capital offense. Atticus dropped his newspaper beside his chair. He said he didn't have any quarrel with the rape statute, none whatever. But he did have deep misgivings when the state asked for and the jury gave a death penalty on purely circumstantial evidence. He glanced at me, saw I was listening, and made it easier. I mean, before a man is sentenced to death for murder, say, there should be one or two eyewitnesses. Someone should be able to say, yes, I was there, and saw him pull the trigger. But lots of folks have been hung, hanged, on circumstantial evidence, said Jem. I know. And lots of them probably deserved it, too. But in the absence of eyewitnesses, there's always a doubt. Sometimes only the shadow of a doubt. The law says reasonable doubt. But I think a defendant's entitled to the shadow of a doubt. There's always the possibility, no matter how improbable, that he's innocent. Then it all goes back to the jury, then. We ought to do away with juries. Jem was adamant. Atticus tried hard not to smile, but couldn't help it. You're rather hard on us, son. I think maybe there might be a better way. Change the law. Change it so that only judges have the power of fixing the penalty in capital cases. Then go up to Montgomery and change the law. You'd be surprised how hard that'd be. I won't live to see the law changed, and if you live to see it, you'll be an old man. This was not good enough for Jem. No, sir, they ought to do away with juries. He wasn't guilty in the first place, and they said he was. If you had been on that jury, son, and eleven other boys like you, Tom would be a free man, said Atticus. So far, nothing in your life has interfered with your reasoning process. Those are twelve reasonable men in everyday life, Tom's jury. But you saw something come between them and reason. You saw the same thing that night in front of the jail. When that crew went away, they didn't go as reasonable men. They went because we were there. There's something in our world that makes men lose their heads. They couldn't be fair if they tried. In our courts, when it's a white man's word against a black man's, the white man always wins. They're ugly, but those are the facts of life. Doesn't make it right, said Jem stolidly. He beat his fist softly on his knee. You just can't convict a man on evidence like that. You can't. You couldn't, but they could, and did. The older you grow, the more that you'll see. The one place where a man ought to get a square deal is in a courtroom, be he any color of the rainbow. But people have a way of carrying their resentments right into a jury box. As you grow older, you'll see white men cheat black men every day of your life. But let me tell you something, and don't you forget it. Whenever a white man does that to a black man, no matter who he is, how rich he is, or how fine a family he comes from, that white man is trash. Atticus was speaking so quietly, his last word crashed on our ears. I looked up, and his face was vehement. There's nothing more sickening to me than a low-grade white man who'll take advantage of a Negro's ignorance. Don't fool yourselves. It's all adding up, and one of these days we're going to pay the bill for it. I hope it's not in you children's time. Jem was scratching his head. 
Suddenly his eyes widened. Atticus, he said, why don't people like us and Miss Morty ever sit on juries? You never see anybody from Maycomb on a jury. They all come from out in the woods. Atticus leaned back in his rocking chair. For some reason, he looked pleased with Jem. I was wondering when that had occurred to you, he said. There are lots of reasons. For one thing, Miss Morty can't serve on a jury because she's a woman. You mean women in Alabama can't? I was indignant. I do. I guess it's to protect our frail ladies from sordid cases like Tom's. Besides, Atticus grinned, I doubt if we'd ever get a complete case tried. The ladies would be interrupting to ask questions. Jem and I laughed. Miss Morty on a jury would be impressive. I thought of old Mrs. DuBose in her wheelchair. Stop that rapping, John Taylor! I want to ask this man something. Perhaps our forefathers were wise. Atticus was saying, with people like us, that's our share of the bill. We generally get the juries we deserve. Our stout Maycomb citizens aren't interested in the first place. In the second place, they're afraid. Then they're afraid? Why? asked Jem. Well, what if, say, Mr. Link Dias had to decide the amount of damages to award, say, Miss Morty, when Miss Rachel ran over her with a car? Link wouldn't like the thought of losing either lady's business at his store, would he? So he tells Judge Taylor that he can't serve on the jury because he doesn't have anybody to keep store for him while he's gone. So Judge Taylor excuses him. Sometimes he excuses him wrathfully. What did make him think either one of them would stop trading with him? I asked. Jem said, Miss Rachel would, Miss Morty wouldn't. But a jury's vote's secret, Atticus. Our father chuckled. You've many more miles to go, son. A jury's vote's supposed to be secret. Serving on a jury forces a man to make up his mind and declare himself about something. Men don't like to do that. Sometimes it's unpleasant. Tom's jury sure made up its mind in a hurry, Jem muttered. Atticus's fingers went to his watch pocket. No, it didn't he said, more to himself than to us. That was the one thing that made me think, well, this may be the shadow of a beginning. That jury took a few hours. An inevitable verdict, maybe, but usually it takes them just a few minutes. This time. He broke off and looked at us. You might like to know that there was one fellow who took considerable wearing down. In the beginning, he was raring for an outright acquittal. Who? Jem was astonished. Atticus's eyes twinkled. It's not for me to say, but I'll tell you this much. He was one of your old Sarum friends. One of the Cunninghams? Jem yelped. One of... I didn't recognize any of them. You're joking. He looked at Atticus from the corners of his eyes. One of their connections. On a hunch, I didn't strike him. Just on a hunch. Could have, but I didn't. Golly, Moses, Jem said reverently. One minute they're trying to kill him, and the next they're trying to turn him loose. I'll never understand those folks as long as I live. Atticus said you just had to know them. He said the Cunninghams hadn't taken anything from or off of anybody since they migrated to the New World. He said the other thing about them was, once you earned their respect, they were for you tooth and nail. Atticus said he had a feeling 
nothing more than a suspicion, that they left the jail that night with considerable respect for the Finches. Then, too, he said, it took a thunderbolt plus another Cunningham to make one of them change his mind. If we'd had two of that crowd, we'd have had a hung jury. Jim said slowly, You mean you actually put on the jury a man who wanted to kill you the night before? How could you take such a risk, Atticus? How could you? When you analyze it, there was little risk. There's no difference between one man who's going to convict and another man who's going to convict, is there? There's a faint difference between a man who's going to convict and a man who's a little disturbed in his mind, isn't there? He was the only uncertainty on the whole list. What kin was that man to Mr. Walter Cunningham? I asked. Atticus rose, stretched, and yawned. It was not even our bedtime, but we knew he wanted a chance to read his newspaper. He picked it up, folded it, and tapped his head. Let's see now, he droned to himself. I've got it. Double first cousin. How can that be? Two sisters married two brothers. That's all I'll tell you. You figure it out. I tortured myself and decided that if I married Jem and Dill had a sister whom he married, our children would be double first cousins. Gee, Manetti, Jem, I said when Atticus had gone. They're funny folks. Did you hear that, Auntie? Aunt Alexandra was hooking a rug and not watching us, but she was listening. She sat in her chair with her work basket beside it, her rugs spread across her lap. Why ladies hooked woolen rugs on boiling nights never became clear to me. I heard it, she said. I remembered the distant, disastrous occasion when I rushed to young Walter Cunningham's defense. Now I was glad I'd done it. Soon school starts. I'm going to ask Walter home to dinner, I planned, having forgotten my private resolve to beat him up the next time I saw him. He can stay over sometimes after school, too. Atticus could drive him back to Old Sarum. Maybe he could spend the night with us sometime, okay, Jim? We'll see about that, Aunt Alexandra said, a declaration that with her was always a threat, never a promise. Surprised, I turned to her. Why not, Auntie? They're good folks. She looked at me over her sewing glasses. Jean Louise, there is no doubt in my mind that they're good folks, but they're not our kind of folks. Jem says, she means they're yappy, Scout. What's a yap? Aw, oh, tacky. They like fiddling and things like that. Well, I do, too. Don't be silly, Jean Louise, said Aunt Alexandra. The thing is, you can scrub Walter Cunningham till he shines. You can put him in shoes and a new suit, but he'll never be like Jem. Besides, there's a drinking streak in that family a mile wide. Finch women aren't interested in that sort of people. Auntie, said Jem, she ain't nine yet. She may as well learn it now. Aunt Alexandra had spoken. I was reminded vividly of the last time she had put her foot down. I never knew why. It was when I was absorbed with plans to visit Calpurnia's house. I was curious, interested. I wanted to be her company, to see how she lived who her friends were. I might as well have wanted to see the other side of the moon. This time the tactics were different, but Aunt Alexandra's aim was the same. Perhaps this was why she had come to live with us, to help us choose our friends. I would hold her off as long as I could. 
If they're good folks, then why can't I be nice to Walter? I didn't say not to be nice to him. You should be friendly and polite to him. You should be gracious to everybody, dear. But you don't have to invite him home. What if he was kin to us, Auntie? The fact is that he is not kin to us. But if he were, my answer would be the same. Auntie, Jem spoke up. Atticus says you can choose your friends, but you sure can't choose your family. And they're still kin to you, no matter whether you acknowledge them or not. And it makes you look right silly when you don't. That's your father all over again, said Aunt Alexandra. And I still say that Jean Louise will not invite Walter Cunningham to this house. If he were her double first cousin once removed, he would still not be received in this house unless he comes to see Atticus on business. Now that is that. She had said, indeed not, but this time she would give her reasons. But I want to play with Walter, Auntie. Why can't I? She took off her glasses and stared at me. I'll tell you why, she said. Because he is trash. That's why you can't play with him. I'll not have you around him, picking up his habits and learning Lord knows what. You're enough of a problem to your father as it is. I don't know what I would have done, but Jem stopped me. He caught me by the shoulders, put his arm around me, and led me sobbing in fury to his bedroom. Atticus heard us and poked his head around the door. It's all right, sir, Jem said gruffly. It's not anything. Atticus went away. Have a chew, Scout. Jem dug into his pocket and extracted a Tootsie Roll. It took a few minutes to work the candy into a comfortable wad inside my jaw. Jem was rearranging the objects on his dresser. His hair stuck up behind and down in front, and I wondered if it would ever look like a man's. Maybe if he shaved it off and started over, his hair would grow back neatly in place. His eyebrows were becoming heavier, and I noticed a new slimness about his body. He was growing taller. When he looked around, he must have thought I would start crying again, for he said, Show you something, if you won't tell anybody. I said, What? He unbuttoned his shirt, grinning shyly. Well, what? Well, can't you see it? Well, no. Well, it's hair. Where? There. Right there. He had been a comfort to me, so I said it looked lovely, but I didn't see anything. It's real nice, Jem. Under my arms, too, he said. Going out for football next year. Scout, don't let Auntie aggravate you. It seemed only yesterday that he was telling me not to aggravate Auntie. You know she's not used to girls, said Jem. Leastways, not girls like you. She's trying to make you a lady. Can't you take up sewing or something? Hell no. She doesn't like me. That's all there is to it. And I don't care. It was her calling Walter Cunningham trash that got me going, Jim. Not what she said about being a problem to Atticus. We got that all straight one time. I asked him if I was a problem, and he said not much of one. At most, one that he could always figure out, and not to worry my head a second about bothering him. No, it was Walter. That boy's not trash, Jem. He ain't like the Yules. Jem kicked off his shoes and swung his feet to the bed. He propped himself against a pillow and switched on the reading light. You know something, Scout? I've got it all figured out now. I've thought about it a lot lately, and I've got it figured out. There's four kinds of folks in the world. 
There's the ordinary kind, like us and the neighbors. There's the kind like the Cunninghams out in the woods, the kind like the Ewells down at the dump, and the Negroes. What about the Chinese and the Cajuns down yonder in Baldwin County? I mean in Maycomb County. The thing about it is, our kind of folks don't like the Cunninghams, the Cunninghams don't like the Ewells, and the Ewells hate and despise the colored folks. I told Jem if that was so, then why didn't Tom's jury, made up of folks like the Cunninghams, acquit Tom to spite the Ewells? Jem waved my question away as being infantile. You know, he said, I've seen Atticus pat his foot when there's fiddling on the radio, and he loves pot liquor better than any man I ever saw. Then that makes us like the Cunninghams, I said. I can't see why, Artie. No, let me finish. It does, but we're still different somehow. Atticus said one time the reason Artie's so hipped on the family is because all we've got's background and not a dime to our names. Well, Jim, I don't know. Atticus told me one time that most of this old family stuff's foolishness because everybody's family is just as old as everybody else's. I said, did that include the colored folks and Englishmen? And he said, yes. Background doesn't mean old family, said Jim. I think it's how long your family's been reading and writing. Scout, I've studied this real hard, and that's the only reason I can think of. Somewhere along when the Finches were in Egypt, one of them must have learned a hieroglyphic or two, and he taught his boy. Jem laughed. Imagine Auntie being proud her great-granddaddy could read and write. Ladies pick funny things to be proud of. Well, I'm glad he could, or who'd have taught Atticus and them. And if Atticus couldn't read, you and me would be in a fix. I don't think that's what background is, Jim. Well, then, how do you explain why the Cunninghams are different? Mr. Walter can hardly sign his name. I've seen him. We've just been reading and writing longer than they have. No, everybody's got to learn. Nobody's born knowing. That Walter's as smart as he can be. He just gets held back sometimes because he has to stay out and help his daddy. Nothing's wrong with him. No, Jim, I think there's just one kind of folks. Folks. Jim turned around and punched his pillow. When he settled back, his face was cloudy. He was going into one of his declines, and I grew wary. His brows came together. His mouth became a thin line. He was silent for a while. That's what I thought, too, he said at last, when I was your age. If there's just one kind of folks, why can't they get along with each other? If they're all alike, why do they go out of their way to despise each other? Scout, I think I'm beginning to understand something. I think I'm beginning to understand why Boo Radley stayed shut up in the house all this time. It's because he wants to stay inside. Chapter 24 Calpurnia wore her stiffest starched apron. She carried a tray of Charlotte. She backed up to the swinging door and pressed gently. I admired the ease and grace with which she handled heavy loads of dainty things. So did Aunt Alexandra, I guess, because she had let Calpurnia serve today. August was on the brink of September. Dill would be leaving for Meridian tomorrow. Today he was off with Jem at Barker's Eddy. Jem had discovered with angry amazement that nobody had ever bothered to teach Dill how to swim, a skill Jem considered necessary as walking. They had spent two afternoons at the creek, 
They said they were going in naked and I couldn't come. So I divided the lonely hours between Calpurnia and Miss Morty. Today Aunt Alexandra and her missionary circle were fighting the good fight all over the house. From the kitchen I heard Mrs. Grace Merriweather giving a report in the living room on the squalid lives of the marooners, it sounded like to me. They put the women out in huts when their time came, whatever that was. They had no sense of family. I knew that would distress Auntie. They subjected children to terrible ordeals when they were thirteen. They were crawling with yaws and earworms. They chewed up and spat out the bark of a tree into a communal pot and then got drunk on it. Immediately thereafter the ladies adjourned for refreshments. I didn't know whether to go into the dining room or stay out. Aunt Alexandra told me to join them for refreshments. It was not necessary that I attend the business part of the meeting. She said it'd bore me. I was wearing my pink Sunday dress, shoes, and a petticoat, and reflected that if I spilled anything, Calpurnia would have to wash my dress again for tomorrow. This had been a busy day for her. I decided to stay out. Can I help you, Cal? I asked, wishing to be of some service. Calpurnia paused in the doorway. You be still as a mouse in that corner, she said, and you can help me load up the trays when I come back. The gentle hum of ladies' voices grew louder as she opened the door. Why, Alexandra, I never saw such Charlotte. Just lovely. I never can get my crust like this. Never can. Who'd have thought of little dewberry tarts? Calpurnia? Who'd have thought it? Anybody tell you that the preacher's wife's? No. Well, she is. And that other one not walking yet. They became quiet, and I knew they had all been served. Calpurnia returned and put my mother's heavy silver pitcher on a tray. This coffee pitcher's a curiosity, she murmured. They don't make them these days. Can I carry it in? If you be careful and don't drop it, set it down at the end of the table by Miss Alexandra. Down there by the cups and things. She's gonna pour. I tried pressing my behind against the door as Calpurnia had done, but the door didn't budge. Grinning, she held it open for me. Careful now. It's heavy. Don't look at it and you won't spill it. My journey was successful. Aunt Alexandra smiled brilliantly. Stay with us, Jean Louise, she said. This was a part of her campaign to teach me to be a lady. It was customary for every circle hostess to invite her neighbors in for refreshments, be they Baptists or Presbyterians, which accounted for the presence of Miss Rachel sober as a judge, Miss Morty, and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Rather nervous, I took a seat beside Miss Morty and wondered why ladies put on their hats to go across the street. Ladies in bunches always filled me with vague apprehension and a firm desire to be elsewhere. But this feeling was what Aunt Alexandra called being spoiled. The ladies were cool in fragile pastel prints. Most of them were heavily powdered but unrouged. The only lipstick in the room was Tangy Natural. Cutex Natural sparkled on their fingernails, but some of the younger ladies wore rose. They smelled heavenly. I sat quietly, having conquered my hands by tightly gripping the arms of the chair, and waited for someone to speak to me. Miss Morty's gold bridge work twinkled. You're mighty dressed up, Miss Jean Louise, she said. Where are your breeches today? Under my dress. I hadn't meant to be funny, but the ladies laughed. My cheeks grew hot as I realized my mistake, but Miss Morty looked gravely down at me. She never laughed at me unless I meant to be funny. In the sudden silence that followed, Miss Stephanie Crawford called from across the room, 
What you going to be when you grow up, Jean Louise? A lawyer? No, I hadn't thought about it, I answered, grateful that Miss Stephanie was kind enough to change the subject. Hurriedly, I began choosing my vocation. Nurse? Aviator? Well, why, shoot! I thought you wanted to be a lawyer. You've already commenced going to court. The ladies laughed again. That Stephanie's a card, somebody said. Miss Stephanie was encouraged to pursue the subject. Don't you want to grow up to be a lawyer? Miss Morty's hand touched mine, and I answered mildly enough, No, just a lady. Miss Stephanie eyed me suspiciously, decided that I meant no impertinence, and contented herself with, Well, you won't get very far until you start wearing dresses more often. Miss Morty's hand closed tightly on mine, and I said nothing. Its warmth was enough. Mrs. Grace Merriweather sat on my left, and I felt it would be polite to talk to her. Mr. Merriweather, a faithful Methodist under duress, apparently saw nothing personal in singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It was the general opinion of Maycomb, however, that Mrs. Merriweather had sobered him up and made a reasonably useful citizen of him. For certainly Mrs. Merriweather was the most devout lady in Maycomb. I searched for a topic of interest to her. What did you all study this afternoon? I asked. Oh, child, those poor marooners, she said, and was off. Few other questions would be necessary. Mrs. Merriweather's large brown eyes always filled with tears when she considered the oppressed. Living in that jungle with nobody but J. Grimes Everett, she said. Not a white person will go near em but that saintly J. Grimes Everett. Mrs. Merriweather played her voice like an organ. Every word she said received its full measure. The poverty, the darkness, the immorality. Nobody but J. Grimes Everett knows. You know, when the church gave me that trip to the campgrounds, J. Grimes Everett said to me, Was he there, ma'am? I thought home on leave. J. Grimes Everett said to me, he said, Mrs. Merriweather, you have no conception, no conception of what we are fighting over there. That's what he said to me. Yes, ma'am. I said to him, Mr. Everett, I said, the ladies of the Macomb, Alabama, Methodist Episcopal Church South are behind you 100%. That's what I said to him. And you know, right then and there, I made a pledge in my heart. I said to myself, when I go home, I'm going to give a course on the Marooners and bring J. Grimes Everett's message to make them. And that's just what I'm doing. Yes, ma'am. When Mrs. Merriweather shook her head, her black curls jiggled. Jean Louise, she said, you are a fortunate girl. You live in a Christian home with Christian folks in a Christian town. Out there in J. Grimes Everett's land, there's nothing but sin and squalor. Yes, ma'am. Sin and squalor. What was that, Gertrude? Mrs. Merriweather turned on her chimes for the lady sitting beside her. Oh, that. Well, I always say forgive and forget. Forgive and forget thing that church ought to do is help her lead a Christian life for those children from here on out. Some of the men ought to go out there and tell that preacher to encourage her. Excuse me, Mrs. Merriweather, I interrupted. Are you all talking about Mayella Ewell? May... No, child. That darkie's wife. Tom's wife. Tom... Robinson, ma'am. Mrs. Merriweather turned back to her neighbor. 
There's one thing I truly believe, Gertrude, she continued, but some people just don't see it my way. If we just let them know we forgive them, that we've forgotten it, then this whole thing will blow over. Uh, Mrs. Merriweather, I interrupted once more, what'll blow over? Again she turned to me. Mrs. Merriweather was one of those childless adults who find it necessary to assume a different tone of voice when speaking to children. Nothing, Jean Louise, she said in stately largo. The cooks and field hands are just dissatisfied, but they're settling down now. They grumbled all next day after that trial. Mrs. Merriweather faced Mrs. Farrell. Gertrude, I tell you there's nothing more distracting than a sulky darky. Their mouths go down to here. Just ruins your day to have one of them in the kitchen. You know what I said to my Sophie, Gertrude? I said, Sophie, I said, you simply are not being a Christian today. Jesus Christ never went around grumbling and complaining. And you know, it did her good. She took her eyes off that floor and said, No, Miss Merriweather, Jesus never went around grumbling. I tell you, Gertrude, you never ought to let an opportunity go by to witness for the Lord. I was reminded of the ancient little organ in the chapel at Finch's Landing. When I was very small, and if I had been very good during the day, Atticus would let me pump its bellows while he picked out a tune with one finger. The last note would linger as long as there was air to sustain it. Mrs. Merriweather had run out of air, I judged, and was replenishing her supply while Mrs. Farrow composed herself to speak. Mrs. Farrow was a splendidly built woman with pale eyes and narrow feet. She had a fresh permanent wave and her hair was a mass of tight gray ringlets. She was the second most devout lady in Maycomb. She had a curious habit of prefacing everything she said with a soft, sibilant sound. Grace, she said, it's just like I was telling Brother Hudson the other day. Brother Hudson, I said, looks like we are fighting a losing battle, a losing battle. I said, it doesn't matter to them one bit. We can educate them till we're blue in the face. We can try till we drop to make Christians out of them. But there's no lady safe in her bed these nights. He said to me, Mrs. Farrow, I don't know what we're coming to down here. I told him that was certainly a fact. Mrs. Merriweather nodded wisely. Her voice soared over the clink of coffee cups and the soft bovine sounds of the ladies munching their dainties. Gertrude, she said, I tell you there are some good but misguided people in this town. Good but misguided. Folks in this town who think they're doing right, I mean. Now far be it from me to say who. But some of them in this town thought they were doing the right thing a while back. But all they did was stir them up. That's all they did. Might have looked like the right thing to do at the time. I'm sure I don't know. I'm not red in that field. But sulky? Dissatisfied? I tell you, if my Sophie'd kept it up another day, I'd have let her go. It's never entered that wool of hers that the only reason I keep her is because this depression's on, and she needs her dollar and a quarter every week she can get it. His food doesn't stick going down, does it? Miss Morty said it. Two tight lines had appeared at the corners of her mouth. She had been sitting silently beside me, her coffee cup balanced on one knee. I had lost the thread of conversation long ago when they quit talking about Tom Robinson's wife and had contented myself with thinking of Finch's Landing and the river. Aunt Alexandra had got it backwards. The business part of the meeting was blood-curdling. 
The social hour was dreary. Morty, I'm sure I don't know what you mean, said Mrs. Merriweather. I'm sure you do, Miss Morty said shortly. She said no more. When Miss Morty was angry, her brevity was icy. Something had made her deeply angry, and her gray eyes were as cold as her voice. Mrs. Merriweather reddened, glanced at me, and looked away. I could not see Mrs. Farrell. Aunt Alexandra got up from the table and swiftly passed more refreshments, neatly engaging Mrs. Merriweather and Mrs. Gates in brisk conversation. When she had them well on the road with Mrs. Perkins, Aunt Alexandra stepped back. She gave Miss Mordy a look of pure gratitude, and I wondered at the world of women. Miss Mordy and Aunt Alexandra had never been especially close, and here was Auntie silently thanking her for something. For what? I knew not. I was content to learn that Aunt Alexandra could be pierced sufficiently to feel gratitude for help given. There was no doubt about it. I must soon enter this world, where on its surface fragrant ladies rocked slowly, fanned gently, and drank cool water. But I was more at home in my father's world. People like Mr. Heck Tate did not trap you with innocent questions to make fun of you. Even Jem was not highly critical, unless you said something stupid. Ladies seemed to live in faint horror of men, seemed unwilling to approve wholeheartedly of them. But I liked them. There was something about them. No matter how much they cussed and drank and gambled and chewed, no matter how undelectable they were, there was something about them that I instinctively liked. They weren't hypocrites, Mrs. Perkins, born hypocrites, Mrs. Merriweather was saying. At least we don't have that sin on our shoulders down here. People up there set them free, but you don't see them setting at the table with them. At least we don't have the deceit to say to them, yes, you're as good as we are, but stay away from us. Down here, we just say, you live your way, and we'll live ours. I think that woman, that Mrs. Roosevelt, lost her mind. Just plain lost her mind, coming down to Birmingham and trying to sit with them. If I was the mayor of Birmingham, I'd... Well, neither of us was the mayor of Birmingham. But I wished I was the governor of Alabama for one day. I'd let Tom Robinson go so quick the missionary society wouldn't have time to catch its breath. Calpurnia was telling Miss Rachel's cook the other day how bad Tom was taking things, and she didn't stop talking when I came into the kitchen. She said there wasn't a thing Atticus could do to make being shut up easier for him, that the last thing he said to Atticus before they took him down to the prison camp was, Goodbye, Mr. Finch. There ain't nothing you can do now, so there ain't no use trying. Calpurnia said Atticus told her that the day they took Tom to prison, he just gave up hope. She said Atticus tried to explain things to him, and that he must do his best not to lose hope, because Atticus was doing his best to get him free. Miss Rachel's cook asked Calpurnia, why didn't Atticus just say, yes, you'll go free, and leave it at that? Seemed like that'd be a big comfort to Tom. Calpurnia said, because you ain't familiar with the law. First thing you learn when you're in a lawing family is that there ain't any definite answers to anything. Mr. Finch couldn't say something so when he doesn't know for sure it's so. The front door slammed and I heard Atticus's footsteps in the hall. Automatically I wondered what time it was. Not nearly time for him to be home, and on missionary society days he usually stayed downtown until black dark. He stopped in the doorway. His hat was in his hand, and his face was white. Excuse me, ladies, he said. Go right ahead with your meeting. 
Don't let me disturb you. Alexandra, could you come to the kitchen a minute? I want to borrow Calpurnia for a while. He didn't go through the dining room, but went down the back hallway and entered the kitchen from the rear door. Aunt Alexandra and I met him. The dining room door opened again, and Miss Morty joined us. Calpurnia had half risen from her chair. Cal, Atticus said, I want you to go with me out to Helen Robinson's house. What's the matter? Aunt Alexandra asked, alarmed by the look on my father's face. Tom's dead. Aunt Alexandra put her hands to her mouth. They shot him, said Atticus. He was running. It was during their exercise period. They said he just broke into a blind, raving charge at the fence and started climbing over, right in front of them. Didn't they try to stop him? Didn't they give him any warning? Aunt Alexandra's voice shook. Oh, yes, the guards called to him to stop. They fired a few shots in the air, then to kill. They got him just as he went over the fence. They said if he'd had two good arms, he'd have made it. He was moving that fast. Seventeen bullet holes in him. They didn't have to shoot him that much. Cal, I want you to come out with me and help me tell Helen. Yes, sir, she murmured, fumbling at her apron. Miss Morty went to Calpurnia and untied it. This is the last straw, Atticus, Aunt Alexandra said. Depends on how you look at it, he said. What was one Negro, more or less, among two hundred of them? He wasn't Tom to them. He was an escaping prisoner. Atticus leaned against the refrigerator, pushed up his glasses, and rubbed his eyes. We had such a good chance, he said. I told him what I thought, but I couldn't in truth say that we had more than a good chance. I guess Tom was tired of white men's chances and preferred to take his own. Ready, Cal? Yes, sir, Mr. Finch. Then let's go. Aunt Alexandra sat down in Calpurnia's chair and put her hands to her face. She sat quite still. She was so quiet, I wondered if she would faint. I heard Miss Morty breathing as if she had just climbed the steps, and in the dining room the ladies chattered happily. I thought Aunt Alexandra was crying, but when she took her hands away from her face, she was not. She looked weary. She spoke, and her voice was flat. I can't say I approve of everything he does, Morty, but he's my brother and I just want to know when this will ever end. Her voice rose. It tears him to pieces. He doesn't show it much, but it tears him to pieces. I've seen him when... What else do they want from him, Morty? What else? What does who want, Alexandra? Miss Morty asked. I mean this town. They're perfectly willing to let him do what they are too afraid to do themselves. It might lose them a nickel. They're perfectly willing to let him wreck his health doing what they're afraid to do. They're... Be quiet. They'll hear you, said Miss Morty. Have you ever thought of it this way, Alexandra? Whether Makem knows it or not, we're paying the highest tribute we can pay a man. We trust him to do right. It's that simple. Who? Aunt Alexandra never knew she was echoing her twelve-year-old nephew. The handful of people in this town who say that fair play is not marked white only. The handful of people who say a fair trial is for everybody, not just us. 
the handful of people with enough humility to think when they look at a Negro, there but for the Lord's kindness am I. Miss Morty's old crispness was returning. The handful of people in this town with background, that's who they are. Had I been attentive, I would have had another scrap to add to Jem's definition of background, but I found myself shaking and couldn't stop. I had seen Enfield Prison Farm, and Atticus had pointed out the exercise yard to me. It was the size of a football field. Stop that shaking, commanded Miss Morty, and I stopped. Get up, Alexandra. We've left them long enough. Aunt Alexandra rose and smoothed the various whalebone ridges along her hips. She took her handkerchief from her belt and wiped her nose. She patted her hair and said, Do I show it? Not a sign, said Miss Morty. Are you together again, Jean Louise? Yes, ma'am. Then let's join the ladies, she said grimly. Their voices swelled when Miss Morty opened the door to the dining room. Aunt Alexandra was ahead of me, and I saw her head go up as she went through the door. Oh, Mrs. Perkins, she said, you need some more coffee. Let me get it. Calpurnia's on an errand for a few minutes, Grace, said Miss Morty. Let me pass you some more of those dewberry tarts. You hear what that cousin of mine did the other day? The one who likes to go fishing? And so they went, down the row of laughing women, around the dining room, refilling coffee cups, dishing out goodies, as though their only regret was the temporary domestic disaster of losing Calpurnia. The gentle hum began again. Yes, sir, Mrs. Perkins, that J. Grimes Everett is a martyred saint. He needed to get married, so they ran to the beauty parlor every Saturday afternoon. Soon as the sun goes down, he goes to bed with the chickens, a crate full of sick chickens. Fred says that's what started it all. Fred says... Aunt Alexandra looked across the room at me and smiled. She looked at a tray of cookies on the table and nodded at them. I carefully picked up the tray and watched myself walk to Mrs. Merriweather. With my best company manners, I asked her if she would have some. After all, if Auntie could be a lady at a time like this, so could I. This ends Disc 9, To Kill a Mockingbird. Disc 10 Chapter 25 Don't do that, Scout. Set him out on the back steps. Jam, are you crazy? I said set him out on the back steps. Sighing, I scooped up the small creature, placed him on the bottom step, and went back to my cot. September had come, but not a trace of cool weather with it and we were still sleeping on the back screen porch. Lightning bugs were still about, the night crawlers and flying insects that beat against the screen the summer long had not gone wherever they go when autumn comes. A roly-poly had found his way inside the house. I reasoned that the tiny varmint had crawled up the steps and under the door. I was putting my book on the floor beside my cot when I saw him. The creatures are no more than an inch long, and when you touch them, they roll themselves into a tight gray ball. I lay on my stomach, reached down, and poked him. He rolled up. Then, feeling safe, I suppose, he slowly unrolled. He traveled a few inches on his hundred legs, and I touched him again. He rolled up. Feeling sleepy, I decided to end things. My hand was going down on him when Jem spoke. Jem was scowling. It was probably a part of the stage he was going through, and I wished he would hurry up and get through it. He was certainly never cruel to animals, but I had never known his charity to embrace the insect world. Why couldn't I mash him? I asked. Because they don't bother you, Jem answered in the darkness. 
He had turned out his reading light. Reckon you're at the stage now where you don't kill flies and mosquitoes now, I reckon, I said. Let me know when you change your mind. Tell you one thing, though. I ain't going to sit around and not scratch a red bug. Oh, dry up, he answered drowsily. Jem was the one who was getting more like a girl every day, not I. Comfortable, I lay on my back and waited for sleep. And while waiting, I thought of Dill. He had left us the first of the month with firm assurances that he would return the minute school was out. He guessed his folks had got the general idea that he liked to spend his summers in Maycomb. Miss Rachel took us with them in the taxi to Maycomb Junction, and Dill waved to us from the train window until he was out of sight. He was not out of mind. I missed him. The last two days of his time with us, Jan had taught him to swim. Taught him to swim. I was wide awake, remembering what Dill had told me. Barker's Eddy is at the end of a dirt road off the Meridian Highway about a mile from town. It is easy to catch a ride down the highway on a cotton wagon or from a passing motorist, and the short walk to the creek is easy. But the prospect of walking all the way back home at dusk, when the traffic is light, is tiresome, and swimmers are careful not to stay too late. According to Dill, he and Jem had just come to the highway when they saw Atticus driving toward them. He looked like he had not seen them, so they both waved. Atticus finally slowed down. When they caught up with him, he said, You'd better catch a ride back. I won't be going home for a while. Calpurnia was in the back seat. Jem protested, then pleaded, and Atticus said, All right, you can come with us if you stay in the car. On the way to Tom Robinson's, Atticus told them what had happened. They turned off the highway, rode slowly by the dump and past the Ewell residence, down the narrow lane to the Negro cabins. Dill said a crowd of black children were playing marbles in Tom's front yard. Atticus parked the car and got out. Calpurnia followed him through the front gate. Dill heard him ask one of the children, Where's your mother, Sam? And heard Sam say, She down at Sis Stevens's, Mr. Finch? Want me run fetch her? Dill said Atticus looked uncertain. Then he said, Yes and Sam scampered off. Go on with your game, boys, Atticus said to the children. A little girl came to the cabin door and stood looking at Atticus. Dill said her hair was a wad of tiny, stiff pigtails, each ending in a bright bow. She grinned from ear to ear and walked toward our father, but she was too small to navigate the steps. Dill said Atticus went to her, took off his hat, and offered her his finger. She grabbed it, and he eased her down the steps. Then he gave her to Calpurnia. Sam was trotting behind his mother when they came up. Dill said, Helen said, Evening, Mr. Finch. Won't you have a seat? But she didn't say any more. Neither did Atticus. Scout, said Dill, she just fell down in the dirt, just fell down in the dirt, like a giant with a big foot just came along and stepped on her, just ump. Dill's fat foot hit the ground, like you'd step on an ant. Dill said Calpurnia and Atticus lifted Helen to her feet and half carried, half walked her to the cabin. They stayed inside a long time and Atticus came out alone. When they drove back by the dump, some of the Ewells hollered at them, but Dill didn't catch what they said. Maycomb was interested by the news of Tom's death for perhaps two days. Two days was enough for the information to be spread through the county. Did you hear about... No? Well, they say he was running fit to beat lightning. To make him, Tom's death was typical.
Typical of a nigger to cut and run. Typical of a nigger's mentality to have no plan, no thought for the future. Just run blind, first chance he saw. Funny thing, Atticus Finch might have got him off scot-free. But wait, hell no, you know how they are. Easy come, easy go. Just shows you, that Robinson boy was legally married. They say he kept himself clean, went to church and all that. But when it comes down to the line, the veneer's mighty thin. Nigger always comes out in em. A few more details, enabling the listener to repeat his version in turn. Then nothing to talk about until the Maycomb Tribune appeared the following Thursday. There was a brief obituary in the colored news, but there was also an editorial. Mr. B.B. Underwood was at his most bitter, and he couldn't have cared less who canceled advertising and subscriptions. But Maycomb didn't play that way. Mr. Underwood could holler till he sweated and write whatever he wanted to. He'd still get his advertising and subscriptions. If he wanted to make a fool of himself in his paper, that was his business. Mr. Underwood didn't talk about miscarriages of justice. He was writing so children could understand. Mr. Underwood simply figured it was a sin to kill cripples, be they standing, sitting, or escaping. He likened Tom's death to the senseless slaughter of songbirds by hunters and children, and Maycomb thought he was trying to write an editorial poetical enough to be reprinted in the Montgomery Advertiser. How could this be so, I wondered? as I read Mr. Underwood's editorial. Senseless killing. Tom had been given due process of law to the day of his death. He had been tried openly and convicted by twelve good men and true. My father had fought for him all the way. Then Mr. Underwood's meaning became clear. Atticus had used every tool available to free men to save Tom Robinson. But in the secret courts of men's hearts, Atticus had no case. Tom was a dead man the minute Mayella Ewell opened her mouth and screamed. The name Ewell gave me a queasy feeling. Maycomb had lost no time in getting Mr. Ewell's views on Tom's demise and passing them along through that English channel of gossip, Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Stephanie told Aunt Alexandra in Jem's presence, Oh, foot, he's old enough to listen, that Mr. Ewell said it made one down and about two more to go. Jem told me not to be afraid. Mr. Ewell was more hot gas than anything. Jem also told me that if I breathed a word to Atticus, if in any way I let Atticus know I knew, Jem would personally never speak to me again. Chapter 26 School started, and so did our daily trips past the Radley place. Jem was in the seventh grade and went to high school, beyond the grammar school building. I was now in the third grade, and our routines were so different, I only walked to school with Jem in the mornings and saw him at meal times. He went out for football, but was too slender and too young yet to do anything but carry the team water buckets. This he did with enthusiasm. Most afternoons he was seldom home before dark. The Radley place had ceased to terrify me, but it was no less gloomy, no less chilly under its great oaks, and no less uninviting. Mr. Nathan Radley could still be seen on a clear day, walking to and from town. We knew Boo was there, for the same old reason. Nobody'd seen him carried out yet. I sometimes felt a twinge of remorse when passing by the old place, at ever having taken part in what must have been sheer torment to Arthur Radley. What reasonable recluse wants children peeping through his shutters, delivering greetings on the end of a fishing pole? wandering in his collards at night. 
And yet, I remembered. Two Indian head pennies, chewing gum, soap dolls, a rusty metal, a broken watch and chain. Jem must have put them away somewhere. I stopped and looked at the tree one afternoon. The trunk was swelling around its cement patch. The patch itself was turning yellow. We had almost seen him a couple of times, a good enough score for anybody. But I still looked for him each time I went by. Maybe someday we would see him. I imagined how it would be. When it happened, he'd just be sitting in the swing when I came along. I do do, Mr. Arthur, I would say, as if I had said it every afternoon of my life. Evening, Jean Louise, he would say, as if he had said it every afternoon of my life. Right pretty spell we're having, isn't it? Yes, sir, right pretty, I would say, and go on. It was only a fantasy. We would never see him. He probably did go out when the moon was down and gaze upon Miss Stephanie Crawford. I'd have picked somebody else to look at, but that was his business. He would never gaze at us. You aren't starting that again, are you? said Atticus one night, when I expressed a stray desire just to have one good look at Boo Radley before I died. If you are, I'll tell you right now. Stop it. I'm too old to go chasing you off the Radley property. Besides, it's dangerous. You might get shot. You know Mr. Nathan shoots at every shadow he sees, even shadows that leave size four bare footprints. You were lucky not to be killed. I hushed then and there. At the same time, I marveled at Atticus. This was the first he had let us know he knew a lot more about something than we thought he knew. And it had happened years ago. No, only last summer. No, summer before last, when time was playing tricks on me. I must remember to ask Jem. So many things had happened to us. Boo Radley was the least of our fears. Atticus said he didn't see how anything else could happen. The things had a way of settling down, and after enough time passed, people would forget that Tom Robinson's existence was ever brought to their attention. Perhaps Atticus was right, but the events of the summer hung over us like smoke in a closed room. The adults in Maycomb never discussed the case with Jem and me. It seemed that they discussed it with their children, and their attitude must have been that neither of us could help having Atticus for a parent, so their children must be nice to us in spite of him. The children would never have thought that up for themselves. Had our classmates been left to their own devices, Jem and I would have had several swift, satisfying fist fights apiece and ended the matter for good. As it was, we were compelled to hold our heads high and be, respectively, a gentleman and a lady. In a way, it was like the era of Mrs. Henry Lafayette DuBose, without all her yelling. There was one odd thing, though, that I never understood. In spite of Atticus's shortcomings as a parent, People were content to re-elect him to the state legislature that year, as usual, without opposition. I came to the conclusion that people were just peculiar. I withdrew from them, and never thought about them until I was forced to. I was forced to one day in school. Once a week we had a current events period. Each child was supposed to clip an item from a newspaper absorb its contents, and reveal them to the class. This practice allegedly overcame a variety of evils. Standing in front of his fellows encouraged good posture, and gave a child poise. Delivering a short talk made him word-conscious. Learning his current event strengthened his memory. Being singled out made him more than ever anxious to return to the group. 
The idea was profound, but as usual, in Maycomb, it didn't work very well. In the first place, few rural children had access to newspapers, so the burden of current events was borne by the town children, convincing the bus children more deeply that the town children got all the attention anyway. The rural children who could usually brought clippings from what they called the grit paper, a publication spurious in the eyes of Miss Gates, our teacher. Why she frowned when a child recited from the grit paper, I never knew. But in some way it was associated with liking fiddling, eating syrupy biscuits for lunch, being a holy roller, singing sweetly sings the donkey and pronouncing it donkey all of which the state paid teachers to discourage. Even so, not many of the children knew what a current event was. Little Chuck Little, a hundred years old in his knowledge of cows and their habits, was halfway through an Uncle Natural story when Miss Gates stopped him. Charles, that is not a current event. That is an advertisement. Cecil Jacobs knew what one was, though. When his turn came, he went to the front of the room and began, Old Hitler, Adolf Hitler, Cecil, said Miss Gates. One never begins with old anybody. Yes, ma'am, he said. Old Adolf Hitler has been prosecuting the persecuting Cecil. No, Miss Gates, it says here. Well, anyway, old Adolf Hitler has been after the Jews and he's putting them in prisons, and he's taking away all their property, and he won't let any of them out of the country, and he's washing all the feeble-minded, and washing the feeble-minded? Yes, ma'am, Miss Gates. I reckon they don't have sense enough to wash themselves. I don't reckon an idiot could keep himself clean. Well, anyway, Hitler started a program to round up all the half-Jews, too, and he wants to register them in case they might want to cause him any trouble. And I think this is a bad thing, and that's my current event. Very good, Cecil, said Miss Gates. Puffing, Cecil returned to his seat. A hand went up in the back of the room. How can he do that? Who do what? asked Miss Gates patiently. I mean, how can Hitler just put a lot of folks in a pen like that. Looks like the government would stop him, said the owner of the hand. Hitler is the government, said Miss Gates, and seizing an opportunity to make education dynamic, she went to the blackboard. She printed democracy in large letters. Democracy, she said. Does anybody have a definition? Us, somebody said. I raised my hand, remembering an old campaign slogan Atticus had once told me about. What do you think it means, Jean Louise? Equal rights for all, special privileges for none, I quoted. Very good, Jean Louise. Very good, Miss Gates smiled. In front of democracy, she printed, We are a... Now, class... Say it all together. We are a democracy. We said it. Then Miss Gates said, That's the difference between America and Germany. We are a democracy, and Germany is a dictatorship. Dictatorship, she said. Over here, we don't believe in persecuting anybody. Persecution comes from people who are prejudiced. Prejudice, she enunciated carefully. There are no better people in the world than the Jews, and why Hitler doesn't think so is a mystery to me. An inquiring soul in the middle of the room said, Why don't they like the Jews, you reckon, Miss Gates? I don't know, Henry. They contribute to every society they live in. And most of all, they are a deeply religious people. Hitler's trying to do away with religion. 
so maybe he doesn't like them for that reason. Cecil spoke up. Well, I don't know for certain, he said. They're supposed to change money or something, but that ain't no cause to persecute them. They're white, ain't they? Miss Gates said, When you get to high school, Cecil, you'll learn that the Jews have been persecuted since the beginning of history, even driven out of their own country. It's one of the most terrible stories in history. Time for arithmetic, children. As I had never liked arithmetic, I spent the period looking out the window. The only time I ever saw Atticus scowl was when Elmer Davis would give us the latest on Hitler. Atticus would snap off the radio and say, Humph! I asked him once why he was impatient with Hitler, and Atticus said, Because he's a maniac. This would not do, I mused, as the class proceeded with its sums. One maniac and millions of German folks looked to me like they'd shut Hitler in a pen instead of letting him shut them up. There was something else wrong. I would ask my father about it. I did, and he said he could not possibly answer my question because he didn't know the answer. But it's okay to hate Hitler? It is not, he said. It's not okay to hate anybody. Atticus, I said, there's something I don't understand. Miss Gates said it was awful, Hitler doing like he does. She got real red in the face about it. I should think she would. But, yes. Nothing, sir. I went away, not sure that I could explain to Atticus what was on my mind, not sure that I could clarify what was only a feeling. Perhaps Jem could provide the answer. Jem understood school things better than Atticus. Jem was worn out from a day's water carrying. There were at least twelve banana peels on the floor by his bed, surrounding an empty milk bottle. What you stuffing for? I asked. Coach says if I can gain twenty-five pounds by year after next, I can play, he said. This is the quickest way. If you don't throw it all up. Jim, I said, I want to ask you something. Shoot. He put down his book and stretched his legs. Miss Gates is a nice lady, ain't she? Why, sure, said Jim. I liked her when I was in her room. She hates Hitler a lot. What's wrong with that? Well... She went on today about how bad it was him treating the Jews like that. Jem, it's not right to persecute anybody, is it? I mean, have mean thoughts about anybody even, is it? Gracious no, Scout. What's eating you? Well, coming out of the courthouse that night, Miss Gates was... She was going down the steps in front of us. You must have not seen her. She was talking with Miss Stephanie Crawford. I heard her say it's time somebody taught them a lesson. They were getting way above themselves. And the next thing they think they can do is marry us. Jam, how can you hate Hitler so bad and then turn around and be ugly about folks right at home? Jem was suddenly furious. He leaped off the bed, grabbed me by the collar, and shook me. I never want to hear about that courthouse again, ever, ever. You hear me? You hear me? Don't you ever say one word to me about it again, you hear? Now go on. I was too surprised to cry. I crept from Jem's room and shut the door softly, lest undue noise set him off again. Suddenly tired, I wanted Atticus. He was in the living room, and I went to him and tried to get in his lap. Atticus smiled. You're getting so big now, I'll just have to hold a part of you. He held me close. Scout, he said softly, 
Don't let Jem get you down. He's having a rough time these days. I heard you back there. Attica said that Jem was trying hard to forget something, but what he was really doing was storing it away for a while, until enough time passed. Then he would be able to think about it and sort things out. When he was able to think about it, Jem would be himself again. Chapter 27 Things did settle down, after a fashion, as Atticus said they would. By the middle of October, only two small things out of the ordinary happened to two Maycomb citizens. No, there were three things, and they did not directly concern us, the Finches, but in a way they did. The first thing was that Mr. Bob Ewell acquired and lost a job in a matter of days, and probably made himself unique in the annals of the 1930s. He was the only man I ever heard of who was fired from the WPA for laziness. I suppose his brief burst of fame brought on a briefer burst of industry, but his job lasted only as long as his notoriety. Mr. Ewell found himself as forgotten as Tom Robinson. Thereafter, he resumed his regular weekly appearances at the welfare office for his check, and received it with no grace, amid obscure mutterings that the bastards who thought they ran this town wouldn't permit an honest man to make a living. Ruth Jones, the welfare lady, said Mr. Ewell openly accused Atticus of getting his job. She was upset enough to walk down to Atticus's office and tell him about it. Atticus told Miss Ruth not to fret, that if Bob Ewell wanted to discuss Atticus's getting his job, he knew the way to the office. The second thing happened to Judge Taylor. Judge Taylor was not a Sunday night churchgoer. Mrs. Taylor was. Judge Taylor savored his Sunday night hour alone in his big house and church time found him holed up in his study, reading the writings of Bob Taylor, no kin, but the judge would have been proud to claim it. One Sunday night, lost in fruity metaphors and florid diction, Judge Taylor's attention was wrenched from the page by an irritating scratching noise. Hush, he said to Ann Taylor, his fat, nondescript dog. Then he realized he was speaking to an empty room, the scratching noise was coming from the rear of the house. Judge Taylor clumped to the back porch to let Anne out and found the screen door swinging open. A shadow on the corner of the house caught his eye, and that was all he saw of his visitor. Mrs. Taylor came home from church to find her husband in his chair, lost in the writings of Bob Taylor, with a shotgun across his lap. The third thing happened to Helen Robinson, Tom's widow. If Mr. Ewell was as forgotten as Tom Robinson, Tom Robinson was as forgotten as Boo Radley. But Tom was not forgotten by his employer, Mr. Link Dias. Mr. Link Dias made a job for Helen. He didn't really need her, but he said he felt right bad about the way things turned out. I never knew who took care of her children while Helen was away. Calpurnia said it was hard on Helen, because she had to walk nearly a mile out of her way to avoid the Yules, who, according to Helen, chunked at her the first time she tried to use the public road. Mr. Link Dias eventually received the impression that Helen was coming to work each morning from the wrong direction and dragged the reason out of her. Just let it be, Mr. Link, please, sir, Helen begged. The hell I will, said Mr. Link. He told her to come by his store that afternoon before she left. She did, and Mr. Link closed his store, put his hat firmly on his head, and walked Helen home. He walked her the short way, by the Yules. On his way back, Mr. Link stopped at the crazy gate. Ewell, he called. 
I say Yule! The windows, normally packed with children, were empty. I know every last one of you's in there or laying on the floor. Now hear me, Bob Yule. If I hear one more peep out of my girl Helen about not being able to walk this road, I'll have you in jail before sundown. Mr. Link spat in the dust and walked home. Helen went to work next morning and used the public road. Nobody chunked at her, but when she was a few yards beyond the Ewell house, she turned around and saw Mr. Ewell walking behind her. She turned and walked on, and Mr. Ewell kept the same distance behind her until she reached Mr. Link Dias's house. All the way to the house, Helen said, she heard a soft voice behind her crooning foul words. Thoroughly frightened, she telephoned Mr. Link at his store, which was not too far from his house. As Mr. Link came out of his store, he saw Bob Ewell leaning on the fence. Mr. Ewell said, Don't you look at me, Link Dias, like I was dirt. I ain't jumped your first thing you can do, Ewell is get your stinking carcass off my property. You're leaning on it, and I can't afford fresh paint for it. Second thing you can do is stay away from my cook, or I'll have you up for assault. I ain't touched her, Link Dias, and ain't about to go with no nigger. You don't have to touch her. All you have to do is make her afraid. And if assault ain't enough to keep you locked up a while... I'll get you in on the ladies' law, so get out of my sight. If you don't think I mean it, just bother that girl again. Mr. Ewell evidently thought he meant it, for Helen reported no further trouble. I don't like it, Atticus. I don't like it at all, was Aunt Alexandra's assessment of these events. That man seems to have a permanent running grudge against everybody connected with that case. I know how that kind are about paying off grudges, but I don't understand why he should harbor one. He had his way in court, didn't he? I think I understand, said Atticus. It might be because he knows in his heart that very few people in Maycomb really believed his and Mayella's yarns. He thought he'd be a hero, but all he got for his pains was, was, okay, we'll convict this Negro, but get back to your dump. He's had his fling with about everybody now, so he ought to be satisfied. He'll settle down when the weather changes. But why should he try to burgle John Taylor's house? He obviously didn't know John was home or he wouldn't have tried. Only lights John shows on Sunday nights are on the front porch and back in his den. You don't know if Bob Ewell cut that screen. You don't know who did it, said Atticus. But I can guess. I proved him a liar, but John made him look like a fool. All the time Yule was on the stand, I couldn't dare look at John and keep a straight face. John looked at him as if he were a three-legged chicken or a square egg. Don't tell me judges don't try to prejudice juries, Atticus chuckled. By the end of October, our lives had become the familiar routine of school, play, study. Jem seemed to have put out of his mind whatever it was he wanted to forget, and our classmates mercifully let us forget our father's eccentricities. Cecil Jacobs asked me one time if Atticus was a radical. When I asked Atticus, Atticus was so amused I was rather annoyed, but he said he wasn't laughing at me. He said, You tell Cecil, I'm about as radical as Cotton Tom Heflin. Aunt Alexandra was thriving. Miss Morty must have silenced the whole missionary society at one blow, for Auntie again ruled that roost. Her refreshments grew even more delicious. 
I learned more about the poor marooners' social life from listening to Mrs. Merriweather. They had so little sense of family that the whole tribe was one big family. A child had as many fathers as there were men in the community, as many mothers as there were women. J. Grimes Everett was doing his utmost to change this state of affairs and desperately needed our prayers. Maycomb was itself again, precisely the same as last year and the year before that with only two minor changes. Firstly, people had removed from their store windows and automobiles the stickers that said NRA, we do our part. I asked Atticus why, and he said it was because the National Recovery Act was dead. I asked who killed it. He said, nine old men. The second change in Maycomb since last year was not one of national significance. Until then, Halloween in Maycomb was a completely unorganized affair. Each child did what he wanted to do, with assistance from other children if there was anything to be moved, such as placing a light buggy on top of the livery stable. But parents thought things went too far last year, when the peace of Miss Tootie and Miss Fruity was shattered. Mrs. Tooty and Fruity Barber were maiden ladies, sisters, who lived together in the only Maycomb residence, boasting a cellar. The Barber ladies were rumored to be Republicans, having migrated from Clanton, Alabama in 1911. Their ways were strange to us, and why they wanted a cellar, nobody knew, but they wanted one, and they dug one and they spent the rest of their lives chasing generations of children out of it. Mrs. Tootie and Fruity, their names were Sarah and Francis, aside from their Yankee ways, were both deaf. Miss Tootie denied it and lived in a world of silence. But Miss Fruity, not about to miss anything, employed an ear trumpet so enormous that Jem declared it was a loud speaker from one of those dog Victrolas. With these facts in mind, and Halloween at hand, some wicked children had waited until the Mrs. Barber were thoroughly asleep, slipped into their living room, nobody but the Radleys locked up at night, stealthily made away with every stick of furniture therein, and hid it in the cellar. I deny having taken part in such a thing. I heard em! was the cry that awoke the Mrs. Barber's neighbors at dawn next morning. Heard em driving our truck up to the door, stomped around like horses. They're in New Orleans by now. Miss Tootie was sure those traveling fur sellers, who came through town two days ago, had purloined their furniture. Dark they were, she said. Syrians. Mr. Heck Tate was summoned. He surveyed the area and said he thought it was a local job. Miss Fruity said she'd know a make em voice anywhere, and there were no make em voices in that parlor last night. Rolling their R's all over her premises, they were. Nothing less than the bloodhounds must be used to locate their furniture, Miss Tootie insisted. So Mr. Tate was obliged to go ten miles out the road, round up the county hounds, and put them on the trail. Mr. Tate started them off at the Mrs. Barber's front steps, but all they did was run around to the back of the house and howl at the cellar door. When Mr. Tate set them in motion three times, he finally guessed the truth. By noontime that day, there was not a barefooted child to be seen in Maycomb, and nobody took off his shoes until the hounds were returned. So the Maycomb ladies said things would be different this year. The high school auditorium would be open. There would be a pageant for the grown-ups. Apple bobbing, taffy pulling, pinning the tail on the donkey for the children. There would also be a prize of 25 cents for the best Halloween costume created by the wearer. Jem and I both groaned. Not that we'd ever done anything. It was the principle of the thing. 
Jem considered himself too old for Halloween anyway. He said he wouldn't be caught anywhere near the high school at something like that. Oh well, I thought, Atticus would take me. I soon learned, however, that my services would be required on stage that evening. Mrs. Grace Merriweather had composed an original pageant entitled Maycomb County, Ad Astra Per Aspera, and I was to be a ham. She thought it would be adorable if some of the children were costumed to represent the county's agricultural products. Cecil Jacobs would be dressed up to look like a cow. Agnes Boone would make a lovely butter bean. Another child would be a peanut, and on down the line, until Mrs. Merriweather's imagination and the supply of children were exhausted. Our only duties, as far as I could gather from our two rehearsals, were to enter from stage left as Mrs. Merriweather, not only the author but the narrator, identified us. When she called out "pork," that was my cue. Then the assembled company would sing "Maycom County, Maycom County, We will I be true to thee," as the grand finale, and Mrs. Merriweather would mount the stage with the state flag. My costume was not much of a problem. Mrs. Crenshaw, the local seamstress, had as much imagination as Mrs. Merriweather. Mrs. Crenshaw took some chicken wire and bent it into the shape of a cured ham. This she covered with brown cloth and painted it to resemble the original. I could duck under, and someone would pull the contraption down over my head. It came almost to my knees. Mrs. Crenshaw thoughtfully left two peepholes for me. She did a fine job. Jem said I looked exactly like a ham with legs. There were several discomforts, though. It was hot. It was a close fit. If my nose itched, I couldn't scratch, and once inside, I could not get out of it alone. When Halloween came, I assumed that the whole family would be present to watch me perform, but I was disappointed. Atticus said as tactfully as he could that he just didn't think he could stand a pageant tonight. He was all in. He had been in Montgomery for a week and had come home late that afternoon. He thought Jem might escort me if I asked him. Aunt Alexandra said she just had to get to bed early. She had been decorating the stage all afternoon and was worn out. She stopped short in the middle of her sentence. She closed her mouth, then opened it to say something, but no words came. "Smat, Aunty?" I asked. "Oh, nothing, nothing," she said. "Somebody just walked over my grave." She put away from her whatever it was that gave her a pinprick of apprehension, and suggested that I give the family a preview in the living room. So Jem squeezed me into my costume, stood at the living room door, called, "Pork," exactly as Mrs. Merriweather would have done, and I marched in. Atticus and Aunt Alexandra were delighted. I repeated my part for Calpurnia in the kitchen, and she said I was wonderful. I wanted to go across the street to show Miss Morty, but Jem said she'd probably be at the pageant anyway. After that, it didn't matter whether they went or not. Jem said he would take me. Thus began our longest journey together. Chapter Twenty-Eight. The weather was unusually warm for the last day of October. We didn't even need jackets. The wind was growing stronger, and Jem said it might be raining before we got home. There was no moon. The street light on the corner cast sharp shadows on the Radley house. I heard Jem laugh softly. Bet nobody bothers them tonight, he said. Jem was carrying my ham costume rather awkwardly, as it was hard to hold. I thought it gallant of him to do so. It is a scary place, though, ain't it? I said. 
Boo doesn't mean anybody any harm, but I'm right glad you're along. You know Atticus wouldn't let you go to the schoolhouse by yourself, Jem said. Don't see why. It's just around the corner and across the yard. That yard's a mighty long place for little girls to cross at night, Jem teased. Ain't you scared of haints? We laughed. Haints, hot steams, incantations, secret signs had vanished with our years as mist with sunrise. What was that old thing? Jem said. Angel bright, life in death, get off the road, don't suck my breath. Cut it out now, I said. We were in front of the Radley place. Jem said, Boo must not be at home. Listen. High above us in the darkness, a solitary mocker poured out his repertoire in blissful unawareness of whose tree he sat in, plunging from the shrill ki-ki of the sunflower bird to the irascible quack of a blue jay to the sad lament of poor will, poor will, poor will. We turned the corner, and I tripped on a root growing in the road. Jem tried to help me, but all he did was drop my costume in the dust. I didn't fall, though, and soon we were on our way again. We turned off the road and entered the schoolyard. It was pitch black. How do you know where we're at, Jem? I asked when we had gone a few steps. I can tell we're under the big oak because we're passing through a cool spot. Careful now, and don't fall again. We had slowed to a cautious gait, and were feeling our way forward so as not to bump into the tree. The tree was a single and ancient oak. Two children could not reach around its trunk and touch hands. It was far away from teachers, their spies, and curious neighbors. It was near the Radley lot, but the Radleys were not curious. A small patch of earth beneath its branches was packed hard from many fights and furtive crap games. The lights in the high school auditorium were blazing in the distance, but they blinded us, if anything. Don't look ahead, Scout, Jem said. Look at the ground and you won't fall. You should have brought the flashlight, Jem. Didn't know it was this dark. Didn't look like it'd be this dark earlier in the evening. So cloudy, that's why. It'll hold off a while, though. Someone leaped at us. God Almighty! Jem yelled. A circle of light burst in our faces, and Cecil Jacobs jumped in glee behind it. Ha! Ah, gotcha! He shrieked. Don't you be coming along this way? What are you doing way out here by yourself, boy? Ain't you scared of Boo Radley? Cecil had ridden safely to the auditorium with his parents, hadn't seen us, then had ventured down this far because he knew good and well we'd be coming along. He thought Mr. Finch would be with us, though. Shucks, ain't much but around the corner, said Jem. Who's scared to go around the corner? We had to admit that Cecil was pretty good, though. He had given us a fright, and he could tell it all over the schoolhouse. That was his privilege. Say, I said, ain't you a cow tonight? Where's your costume? It's up behind the stage, he said. Mrs. Merriweather says the pageant ain't coming on for a while. You can put yours back of the stage by mine, Scout, and we can go with the rest of them. This was an excellent idea, Jem thought. He also thought it a good thing that Cecil and I would be together. This way, Jem would be left to go with people his own age. When we reached the auditorium, the whole town was there except Atticus and the ladies worn out from decorating, and the usual outcasts and shut-ins. Most of the county, it seemed, was there. The hall was teeming with slicked-up country people. The high school building had a wide downstairs hallway. People milled around booths that had been installed along each side. Oh, Jem, I forgot my money, I sighed when I saw them. Atticus didn't, 
Jem said. Here's thirty cents. You can do six things. See you later on. Okay, I said, quite content with thirty cents and Cecil. I went with Cecil down to the front of the auditorium, through a door on one side, and backstage. I got rid of my ham costume and departed in a hurry, for Mrs. Merriweather was standing at a lectern in front of the first row of seats, making last-minute, frenzied changes in the script. How much money you got? I asked Cecil. Cecil had thirty cents too, which made us even. We squandered our first nickels on the House of Horrors, which scared us not at all. We entered the black seventh grade room and were led around by the temporary ghoul in residence, and were made to touch several objects alleged to be component parts of a human being. Here's his eyes. We were told when we touched two peeled grapes on a saucer, "Here's his heart," which felt like raw liver. These are his innards, and our hands were thrust into a plate of cold spaghetti. Cecil and I visited several booths. We each bought a sack of Mrs. Judge Taylor's homemade divinity. I wanted to bob for apples, but Cecil said it wasn't sanitary. His mother said he might catch something from everybody's heads having been in the same tub. Ain't anything around town now to catch? I protested. But Cecil said his mother said it was unsanitary to eat after folks. I later asked Aunt Alexandra about this, and she said people who held such views were usually climbers. We were about to purchase a blob of taffy when Mrs. Merriweather's runners appeared and told us to go backstage. It was time to get ready. The auditorium was filling with people. The Maycomb County High School band had assembled in front below the stage. The stage footlights were on, and the red velvet curtain rippled and billowed from the scurrying going on behind it. Backstage, Cecil and I found the narrow hallway teeming with people. Adults in homemade three-corner hats, Confederate caps, Spanish-American war hats, and World War helmets. Children dressed as various agricultural enterprises crowded around the one small window. Somebody's mashed my costume! I wailed in dismay. Mrs. Merriweather galloped to me, reshaped the chicken wire, and thrust me inside. You all right in there, Scout? Asked Cecil, "You sound so far off, like you was on the other side of a hill. You don't sound any nearer." I said. The band played the national anthem, and we heard the audience rise. Then the bass drum sounded. Mrs. Merriweather, stationed behind her lectern beside the band, said, "Maycomb County, ad astra per aspera." The bass drum boomed again. That means," said Mrs. Merriweather, translating for the rustic elements, "from the mud to the stars." She added unnecessarily, it seemed to me, "a pageant." Reckon they wouldn't know what it was if she didn't tell 'em," whispered Cecil, who was immediately shushed. "The whole town knows it," I breathed, "but the country folks have come in." Cecil said, "Be quiet back there." A man's voice ordered, and we were silent. The bass drum went boom with every sentence Mrs. Merriweather uttered. She chanted mournfully about Maycomb County being older than the state, that it was a part of the Mississippi and Alabama territories, that the first white man to set foot in the virgin forests. Was the probate judge's great grandfather five times removed, who was never heard of again? Then came the fearless Colonel Maycomb, for whom the county was named. Andrew Jackson appointed him to a position of authority, and Colonel Maycomb's misplaced self-confidence and slender sense of direction brought disaster to all who rode with him in the Creek Indian Wars. Colonel Maycomb persevered in his efforts to make the region safe for democracy, but his first campaign was his last. His orders, relayed to him by a friendly Indian runner, were to move south, 
after consulting a tree to ascertain from its lichen which way was south, and taking no lip from the subordinates who ventured to correct him, Colonel Maycomb set out on a purposeful journey to rout the enemy, and entangled his troops so far northwest in the forest primeval that they were eventually rescued by settlers moving inland. Mrs. Merriweather gave a thirty-minute description of Colonel Maycomb's exploits. I discovered that if I bent my knees, I could tuck them under my costume and more or less sit. I sat down, listened to Mrs. Merriweather's drone and the bass drum's boom, and was soon fast asleep. They said later that Mrs. Merriweather was putting her all into the grand finale, that she had crooned pork with a confidence born of pine trees and butter beans entering on cue. She waited a few seconds, then called pork. When nothing materialized, she yelled pork. I must have heard her in my sleep, or the band playing Dixie woke me. But it was when Mrs. Merriweather triumphantly mounted the stage with the state flag that I chose to make my entrance. Chose is incorrect. I thought I'd better catch up with the rest of them. They told me later that Judge Taylor went out behind the auditorium and stood there slapping his knees so hard Mrs. Taylor brought him a glass of water and one of his pills. Mrs. Merriweather seemed to have a hit. Everybody was cheering so. But she caught me backstage and told me I had ruined her pageant. She made me feel awful. But when Jem came to fetch me, he was sympathetic. He said he couldn't see my costume much from where he was sitting. How he could tell I was feeling bad under my costume, I don't know. But he said I did all right. I just came in a little late. That was all. Jem was becoming almost as good as Atticus at making you feel right when things went wrong. Almost. Not even Jem could make me go through that crowd, and he consented to wait backstage with me until the audience left. You want to take it off, Scout? He asked. No, I'll just keep it on. I said. I could hide my mortification under it. You all want to ride home? Someone asked. No, sir. Thank you. I heard Jem say. It's just a little walk. Be careful of haints, the voice said. Better still, tell the haints to be careful of Scout. There aren't many folks left now, Jem told me. Let's go. This ends disc ten. To kill a mockingbird, disc eleven. We went through the auditorium to the hallway, then down the steps. It was still black dark. The remaining cars were parked on the other side of the building, and their headlights were little help. If some of them were going in our direction, we could see better," said Jem. "Here, Scout, let me hold on to your hock. You might lose your balance. I can see all right." Yeah, but you might lose your balance. I felt a slight pressure on my head and assumed that Jem had grabbed that end of the ham. You got me. Uh huh. We began crossing the black schoolyard, straining to see our feet. Jem, I said, I forgot my shoes. They're back behind the stage. Well, let's go get 'em. But as we turned around, the auditorium lights went off. You can get 'em tomorrow," he said. "But tomorrow's Sunday," I protested, as Jem turned me homeward. "You can get the janitor to let you in." Scout? Hmm. Nothing. Jem hadn't started that in a long time. I wondered what he was thinking. He'd tell me when he wanted to, probably when we got home. I felt his fingers press the top of my costume too hard. It seemed. I shook my head. Jim, you don't have to hush a minute, Scout," he said, pinching me. 
We walked along silently. Minutes up, I said. What you thinking about? I turned to look at him, but his outline was barely visible. Thought I heard something, he said. Stop a minute. We stopped. Hear anything? he asked. No. We had not gone five paces before he made me stop again. Jam, are you trying to scare me? You know I'm too old. Be quiet, he said, and I knew he was not joking. The night was still. I could hear his breath coming easily beside me. Occasionally there was a sudden breeze that hit my bare legs, but it was all that remained of a promised windy night. This was the stillness before a thunderstorm. We listened. Heard an old dog just then, I said. It's not that, Jem answered. I hear it when we're walking along, but when we stop, I don't hear it. You hear my costume rustling? Oh, it's just Halloween got you. I said it more to convince myself than Jem, for sure enough. As we began walking, I heard what he was talking about. It was not my costume. It's just old Cecil," said Jem presently. "He won't get us again. Let's don't let him think we're hurrying." We slowed to a crawl. I asked Jem how Cecil could follow us in this dark. Looked to me like he'd bump into us from behind. I can see you, Scout. Jem said, "How? I can't see you. Your fat streaks are showing." Mrs. Crenshaw painted 'em with some of that shiny stuff so they'd show up under the footlights. I can see you pretty well, and I expect Cecil can see you well enough to keep his distance. I would show Cecil that we knew he was behind us and we were ready for him. Cecil Jacobs is a big wet hen! I yelled suddenly, turning around. We stopped. There was no acknowledgment save hen bouncing off the distant schoolhouse wall. I'll get him," said Jem. Hey! 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 Answered the schoolhouse wall. It was unlike Cecil to hold out for so long. Once he pulled a joke, he'd repeat it time and again. We should have been leapt at already. Jem signaled for me to stop again. He said softly, "Scout, can you take that thing off?" "I think so, but I ain't got anything on under it much. I've got your dress here. I can't get it on in the dark." Okay," he said. "Never mind." Jim, are you afraid? No. Think we're almost to the tree now. A few yards from that, and we'll be to the road. We can see the street light then. Jim was talking in an unhurried, flat, toneless voice. I wondered how long he would try to keep the Cecil myth going. You reckon we ought to sing, Jem? No. Be real quiet again, Scout. We had not increased our pace. Jem knew as well as I that it was difficult to walk fast without stumping a toe, tripping on stones, and other inconveniences, and I was barefooted. Maybe it was the wind rustling the trees, but there wasn't any wind. And there weren't any trees except the big oak. Our company shuffled and dragged his feet, as if wearing heavy shoes. Whoever it was wore thick cotton pants. What I thought were trees rustling, was the soft swish of cotton on cotton, weak, weak, with every step. I felt the sand go cold under my feet, and I knew we were near the big oak. Jem pressed my head. We stopped and listened. Shufflefoot had not stopped with us this time. His trousers swished softly and steadily. Then they stopped. He was running.
running toward us with no child's steps. Run, Scout! Run! Run! Jem screamed. I took one giant step and found myself reeling. My arms useless, in the dark. I could not keep my balance. Jem! Jem, help me, Jem! Something crushed the chicken wire around me. Metal ripped on metal, and I fell to the ground and rolled as far as I could, floundering to escape my wire prison. From somewhere nearby came scuffling, kicking sounds, sounds of shoes and flesh scraping dirt and roots. Someone rolled against me, and I felt Jem. He was up like lightning, and pulling me with him. But though my head and shoulders were free, I was so entangled we didn't get very far. We were nearly to the road when I felt Jem's hand leave me, felt him jerk backwards to the ground. More scuffling, and there came a dull crunching sound, and Jem screamed. I ran in the direction of Jem's scream and sank into a flabby male stomach. Its owner said, Oof, and tried to catch my arms, but they were tightly pinioned. His stomach was soft, but his arms were like steel. He slowly squeezed the breath out of me. I could not move. Suddenly, he was jerked backwards and flung on the ground, almost carrying me with him. I thought, Jem's up. One's mind works very slowly at times. Stunned, I stood there dumbly. The scuffling noises were dying. Someone wheezed, and the night was still again. Still, but for a man breathing heavily, breathing heavily and staggering. I thought he went to the tree and leaned against it. He coughed violently, a sobbing, bone-shaking cough. Jam? There was no answer but the man's heavy breathing. Jam? Jem didn't answer. The man began moving around as if searching for something. I heard him groan and pull something heavy along the ground. It was slowly coming to me that there were now four people under the tree. Atticus? The man was walking heavily and unsteadily toward the road. I went to where I thought he had been and felt frantically along the ground, reaching out with my toes. Presently I touched someone. Jam? My toes touched trousers, a belt buckle, buttons, something I could not identify, a collar, and a face. A prickly stubble on the face told me it was not Jam's. I smelled stale whiskey. I made my way along in what I thought was the direction of the road. I was not sure, because I had been turned around so many times, but I found it and looked down to the street light. A man was passing under it. The man was walking with the staccato steps of someone carrying a load too heavy for him. He was going around the corner. He was carrying Jem. Jem's arm was dangling crazily in front of him. By the time I reached the corner, the man was crossing our front yard. Light from our front door framed Atticus for an instant. He ran down the steps, and together he and the man took Jem inside. I was at the front door when they were going down the hall. Aunt Alexandra was running to meet me. Call Dr. Reynolds! Atticus' voice came sharply from Jem's room. Where's Scout? Here she is, Aunt Alexandra called, pulling me along with her to the telephone. She tugged at me anxiously. I'm all right, Auntie, I said. You better call. She pulled the receiver from the hook and said, You LeMay, get Dr. Reynolds, quick. Agnes, is your father home? Oh, God, where is he? Please, tell him to come over here as soon as he comes in. Please, it's urgent. There was no need for Aunt Alexandra to identify herself. 
People in Makem knew each other's voices. Atticus came out of Jem's room. The moment Aunt Alexandra broke the connection, Atticus took the receiver from her. He rattled the hook, then said, Eula May, get me the sheriff, please. Heck, Atticus Finch, someone's been after my children. Jem's hurt. Between here and the schoolhouse. I can't leave my boy. Run out there for me, please, and see if he's still around. Doubt if you'll find him now, but I'd like to see him if you do. Got to go now. Thanks, Heck. Atticus? Is Jam dead? No, Scout. Look after her, sister, he called as he went down the hall. Aunt Alexandra's fingers trembled as she unwound the crushed fabric and wire from around me. Are you all right, darling? she asked over and over as she worked me free. It was a relief to be out. My arms were beginning to tingle, and they were red with small hexagonal marks. I rubbed them, and they felt better. Auntie, is Jem dead? No, no, darling, he's unconscious. We won't know how badly he's hurt until Dr. Reynolds gets here. Jean Louise, what happened? I don't know. She left it at that. She brought me something to put on, and had I thought about it then, I would have never let her forget it. In her distraction, Auntie brought me my overalls. Put these on, darling, she said, handing me the garment she most despised. She rushed back to Jem's room, then came to me in the hall. She patted me vaguely and went back to Jem's room. A car stopped in front of the house. I knew Dr. Reynolds' step almost as well as my father's. He had brought Jem and me into the world, had led us through every childhood disease known to man, including the time Jem fell out of the treehouse, and he had never lost our friendship. Dr. Reynolds said if we had been boil-prone, things would have been different but we doubted it. He came in the door and said, Good Lord! He walked toward me, said, You're still standing, and changed his course. He knew every room in the house. He also knew that if I was in bad shape, so was Jem. After ten forevers, Dr. Reynolds returned. Is Jem dead? I asked. Far from it, he said, squatting down to me. He's got a bump on the head just like yours, and a broken arm. Scout, look that way. No, don't turn your head, roll your eyes. Now look over yonder. He's got a bad break. So far as I can tell now, it's in the elbow. Like somebody tried to wring his arm off. Now look at me. Then he's not dead? No. Dr. Reynolds got to his feet. We can't do much tonight, he said, except try to make him as comfortable as we can. We'll have to x-ray his arm. Looks like he'll be wearing his arm way out by his side for a while. Don't worry, though. He'll be as good as new. Boys his age bounce. While he was talking, Dr. Reynolds had been looking keenly at me lightly fingering the bump that was coming on my forehead. You don't feel broke anywhere, do you? Dr. Reynolds's small joke made me smile. Then you don't think he's dead, then? He put on his hat. Now, I may be wrong, of course, but I think he's very alive. Shows all the symptoms of it. Go have a look at him. And when I come back, we'll get together and decide. Dr. Reynolds's step was young and brisk. Mr. Heck Tate's was not. His heavy boots punished the porch, and he opened the door awkwardly. But he said the same thing Dr. Reynolds said when he came in. You all right, Scout? he added. Yes, sir. I'm going in to see Jam. 
Atticus and them's in there. I'll go with you, said Mr. Tate. Aunt Alexandra had shaded Jem's reading light with a towel, and his room was dim. Jem was lying on his back. There was an ugly mark along one side of his face. His left arm lay out from his body. His elbow was bent slightly, but in the wrong direction. Jem was frowning. Jem? Atticus spoke. He can't hear you, Scout. He's out like a light. He was coming around, but Dr. Reynolds put him out again. Yes, sir. I retreated. Jem's room was large and square. Aunt Alexandra was sitting in a rocking chair by the fireplace. The man who brought Jem in was standing in a corner, leaning against the wall. He was some countryman I did not know. He had probably been at the pageant and was in the vicinity when it happened. He must have heard our screams and come running. Atticus was standing by Jem's bed. Mr. Heck Tate stood in the doorway. His hat was in his hand, and a flashlight bulged from his pants pocket. He was in his working clothes. Come in, Heck, said Atticus. Did you find anything? I can't conceive of anyone low down enough to do a thing like this, but I hope you found him. Mr. Tate sniffed. He glanced sharply at the man in the corner, nodded to him, then looked around the room, at Jem, at Aunt Alexandra, then at Atticus. Sit down, Mr. Finch, he said pleasantly. Atticus said, let's all sit down. Have that chair, heck. I'll get another one from the living room. Mr. Tate sat in Jem's desk chair. He waited until Atticus returned and settled himself. I wondered why Atticus had not brought a chair for the man in the corner, but Atticus knew the ways of country people far better than I. Some of his rural clients would park their long-eared steeds under the chinaberry trees in the backyard, and Atticus would often keep appointments on the back steps. This one was probably more comfortable where he was. Mr. Finch, said Mr. Tate, tell you what I found. I found a little girl's dress. It's out there in my car. That your dress, Scout? Yes, sir, if it's a pink one with smocking, I said. Mr. Tate was behaving as if he were on the witness stand. He liked to tell things his own way, untrammeled by state or defense, and sometimes it took him a while. I found some funny-looking pieces of muddy-colored cloth. That's my costume, Mr. Tate. Mr. Tate ran his hands down his thighs. He rubbed his left arm and investigated Jem's mantelpiece. Then he seemed to be interested in the fireplace. His fingers sought his long nose. What is it, Heck? said Atticus. Mr. Tate found his neck and rubbed it. Bob Ewell's lying on the ground under that tree down yonder with a kitchen knife stuck up under his ribs. He's dead, Mr. Finch. Chapter 29 Aunt Alexandra got up and reached for the mantelpiece. Mr. Tate rose, but she declined assistance. For once in his life, Atticus's instinctive courtesy failed him. He sat where he was. Somehow, I could think of nothing but Mr. Bob Ewell saying he'd get Atticus if it took him the rest of his life. Mr. Ewell almost got him, and it was the last thing he did. Are you sure? Atticus said bleakly. He's dead, all right, said Mr. Tate. He's good and dead. He won't hurt these children again. I didn't mean that. Atticus seemed to be talking in his sleep. His age was beginning to show. 
his one sign of inner turmoil. The strong line of his jaw melted a little. One became aware of telltale creases forming under his ears. One noticed not his jet black hair, but the gray patches growing at his temples. Hadn't we better go to the living room? Aunt Alexandra said at last. If you don't mind, said Mr. Tate, I'd rather us stay in here, if it won't hurt Jam any. I want to have a look at his injuries while Scout tells us about it. Is it all right if I leave? she asked. I'm just one person too many in here. I'll be in my room if you want me, Atticus. Aunt Alexandra went to the door, but she stopped and turned. Atticus, I had a feeling about this tonight. I... This is my fault, she began. I should have... Mr. Tate held up his hand. You go ahead, Miss Alexandra. I know it's been a shock to you. And don't you fret yourself about anything. Why, if we followed our feelings all the time, we'd be like cats chasing their tails. Miss Scout, see if you can tell us what happened while it's still fresh in your mind. You think you can? Did you see him following you? I went to Atticus and felt his arms go around me. I buried my head in his lap. We started home. I said, Jim, I forgot my shoes. Soon as we started back for him, the lights went out. Jim said I could get them tomorrow. Scout, raise up so Mr. Tate can hear you, Atticus said. I crawled into his lap. Then Jem said, hush a minute. I thought he was thinking. He always wants you to hush so he can think. Then he said he heard something. We thought it was Cecil. Cecil? Cecil Jacobs. He scared us once tonight, and we thought it was him again. He had on a sheet. They gave a quarter for the best costume, I don't know who won it. Where were you when you thought it was Cecil? Just a little piece from the schoolhouse. I yelled something at him. You yelled what? Cecil Jacobs is a big fat hen, I think. We didn't hear nothing. Then Jem yelled hello or something loud enough to wake the dead. Just a minute, Scout, said Mr. Tate. Mr. Finch? Did you hear them? Atticus said he didn't. He had the radio on. Aunt Alexandra had hers going in her bedroom. He remembered because she told him to turn his down a bit so she could hear hers. Atticus smiled. I always play a radio too loud. I wonder if the neighbors heard anything, said Mr. Tate. I doubt it, heck. Most of them listen to their radios or go to bed with the chickens. Morty Atkinson may have been up, but I doubt it. Go ahead, Scout, Mr. Tate said. Well, after Jem yelled, we walked on. Mr. Tate, I was shut up in my costume, but I could hear it myself then. Footsteps, I mean. They walked when we walked and stopped when we stopped. Jim said he could see me because Mrs. Crenshaw put some kind of shiny paint on my costume. I was a ham. How's that? asked Mr. Tate, startled. Atticus described my role to Mr. Tate, plus the construction of my garment. You should have seen her when she came in, he said. It was crushed to a pulp. Mr. Tate rubbed his chin. I wondered why he had those marks on him. His sleeves were perforated with little holes. There were one or two little puncture marks on his arms to match the holes. Let me see that thing, if you will, sir. Atticus fetched the remains of my costume. Mr. Tate turned it over and bent it around to get an idea of its former shape. 
This thing probably saved her life, he said. Look. He pointed with a long forefinger. A shiny, clean line stood out on the dull wire. Bob Ewell meant business, Mr. Tate muttered. He was out of his mind, said Atticus. Don't like to contradict you, Mr. Finch. Wasn't crazy. Mean as hell. Low-down skunk with enough liquor in him to make him brave enough to kill children. He'd never have met you face to face. Atticus shook his head. I can't conceive of a man who'd... Mr. Finch, there's just some kind of man you have to shoot before you can say hi to him. Even then, they ain't worth the bullet it takes to shoot them. Yule is one of them. Atticus said, I thought he got it all out of him the day he threatened me. Even if he hadn't, I thought he'd come after me. He had guts enough to pester a poor colored woman. He had guts enough to pester Judge Taylor when he thought the house was empty. So do you think he'd have met you to your face in daylight? Mr. Tate sighed. We'd better get on. Scout, you heard him behind you. Yes, sir. When we got under the tree, how'd you know you were under the tree? You couldn't see thunder out there. I was barefooted, and Jem says the ground's always cooler under a tree. We'll have to make him a deputy. Go ahead. Then all of a sudden, something grabbed me and mashed my costume. Think I ducked on the ground. Heard a tussling under the tree, sort of. They were bamming against the trunk, sounded like. Jem found me and started pulling me toward the road. Some Mr. Yule yanked him down, I reckon. They tussled some more, and then there was this funny noise. Jem hollered. I stopped. That was Jem's arm. Anyway, Jem hollered, and I didn't hear him any more. and the next thing, Mr. Yule was trying to squeeze me to death, I reckon. Then somebody yanked Mr. Yule down. Jem must have got up, I guess. That's all I know. And then, Mr. Tate was looking at me sharply. Somebody was staggering around and panting and coughing fit to die. I thought it was Jem at first, but it didn't sound like him, so I went looking for Jem on the ground. I thought Atticus had come to help us and had got wore out. Who was it? Why, there he is, Mr. Tate. He can tell you his name. As I said it, I half pointed to the man in the corner, but brought my arm down quickly, lest Atticus reprimand me for pointing. It was impolite to point. He was still leaning against the wall. He had been leaning against the wall when I came into the room, his arms folded across his chest. As I pointed, he brought his arms down and pressed the palms of his hands against the wall. They were white hands, sickly white hands that had never seen the sun. So white, they stood out garishly against the dull cream wall in the dim light of Jem's room. I looked from his hands to his sand-stained khaki pants. My eyes traveled up his thin frame to his torn denim shirt. His face was as white as his hands but for a shadow on his jutting chin. His cheeks were thin to hollowness. His mouth was wide. There were shallow, almost delicate indentations at his temples. And his gray eyes were so colorless, I thought he was blind. His hair was dead and thin, almost feathery on top of his head. When I pointed to him, 
His palms slipped slightly, leaving greasy sweat streaks on the wall, and he hooked his thumbs in his belt. A strange small spasm shook him, as if he heard fingernails scrape slate. But as I gazed at him in wonder, the tension slowly drained from his face. His lips parted into a timid smile, and our neighbor's image blurred with my sudden tears. Hey, boo, I said. Chapter 30 Mr. Arthur, honey, said Atticus, gently correcting me. Jean Louise, this is Mr. Arthur Radley. I believe he already knows you. If Atticus could blandly introduce me to Boo Radley at a time like this, well, that was Atticus. Boo saw me run instinctively to the bed where Jem was sleeping, for the same shy smile crept across his face. Hot with embarrassment, I tried to cover up by covering Jem up. Ah, uh -uh, don't touch him, Atticus said. Mr. Heck Tate sat looking intently at Boo through his horn-rimmed glasses. He was about to speak when Dr. Reynolds came down the hall. Everybody out, he said as he came in the door. Evening, Arthur. Didn't notice you the first time I was here. Dr. Reynolds's voice was as breezy as his step, as though he had said it every evening of his life an announcement that astounded me even more than being in the same room with Boo Radley. Of course, even Boo Radley got sick sometimes, I thought. But on the other hand, I wasn't sure. Dr. Reynolds was carrying a big package wrapped in newspaper. He put it down on Jem's desk and took off his coat. You're quite satisfied he's alive now? Tell you how I knew. When I tried to examine him, he kicked me. Had to put him out good and proper to touch him. So scat, he said to me. Er, said Atticus, glancing at Boo. Heck, let's go out on the front porch. There are plenty of chairs out there, and it's still warm enough. I wondered why Atticus was inviting us to the front porch instead of the living room. Then I understood. The living room lights were awfully strong. We filed out. First, Mr. Tate. Atticus was waiting at the door for him to go ahead of him. Then he changed his mind and followed Mr. Tate. People have a habit of doing everyday things, even under the oddest conditions. I was no exception. Come along, Mr. Arthur, I heard myself saying. You don't know the house real well. I'll just take you to the porch, sir. He looked down at me and nodded. I led him through the hall and past the living room. Won't you have a seat, Mr. Arthur? This rocking chair's nice and comfortable. My small fantasy about him was alive again. He would be sitting on the porch. Right pretty spell we're having, isn't it, Mr. Arthur? Yes, a right pretty spell. Feeling slightly unreal, I led him to the chair farthest from Atticus and Mr. Tate. It was in deep shadow. Boo would feel more comfortable in the dark. Atticus was sitting in the swing, and Mr. Tate was in a chair next to him. The light from the living room windows was strong on them. I sat beside Boo. Well, heck, Atticus was saying, I guess the thing to do... Good Lord, I'm losing my memory. Atticus pushed up his glasses and pressed his fingers to his eyes. Jem's not quite thirteen. No, he's already thirteen. I can't remember. Anyway, it'll come before county court. What will, Mr. Finch? Mr. Tate uncrossed his legs and leaned forward. Of course it was clear-cut self-defense. 
but I'll have to go to the office and hunt up Mr. Finch. Do you think Jem killed Bob Ewell? Do you think that? You heard what Scout said. There's no doubt about it. She said Jem got up and yanked him off her. He probably got hold of Ewell's knife somehow in the dark. We'll find out tomorrow. Mr. Finch, hold on, said Mr. Tate. Jem never stabbed Bob Ewell. Atticus was silent for a moment. He looked at Mr. Tate as if he appreciated what he said, but Atticus shook his head. Heck, it's mighty kind of you, and I know you're doing it from that good heart of yours, but don't start anything like that. Mr. Tate got up and went to the edge of the porch. He spat into the shrubbery, then thrust his hands into his hip pockets and faced Atticus. Like what? he said. I'm sorry if I spoke sharply, Heck, Atticus said simply, but nobody's hushing this up. I don't live that way. Nobody's gonna hush anything up, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate's voice was quiet, but his boots were planted so solidly on the porch floorboards it seemed that they grew there. A curious contest, the nature of which eluded me, was developing between my father and the sheriff. It was Atticus's turn to get up and go to the edge of the porch. He said, Hmm, and spat dryly into the yard. He put his hands in his pockets and faced Mr. Tate. Heck, you haven't said it, but I know what you're thinking. Thank you for it. Jean Louise, he turned to me. You said Jem yanked Mr. Ewell off you? Yes, sir. That's what I thought. I... See there, Heck? Thank you from the bottom of my heart. But I don't want my boy starting out with something like this over his head. Best way to clear the air is to have it all out in the open. Let the county come and bring sandwiches. I don't want him growing up with a whisper about him. I don't want anybody saying, Jim Finch. His daddy paid a mint to get him out of that. Sooner we get this over with, the better. Mr. Finch, Mr. Tate said stolidly, Bob Ewell fell on his knife. He killed himself. Atticus walked to the corner of the porch. He looked at the wisteria vine. In his own way, I thought each was as stubborn as the other. I wondered who would give in first. Atticus's stubbornness was quiet and rarely evident, but in some ways he was as set as the Cunninghams. Mr. Tate's was unschooled and blunt, but it was equal to my father's. Heck, Atticus's back was turned. If this thing's hushed up, it'll be a simple denial to Jem of the way I've tried to raise him. Sometimes I think I'm a total failure as a parent, but I'm all they've got. Before Jem looks at anyone else, he looks at me, and I've tried to live so I can look squarely back at him. If I connived at something like this, frankly, I couldn't meet his eye, and the day I can't do that, I'll know I've lost him. I don't want to lose him and Scout, because they're all I've got. Mr. Finch, Mr. Tate was still planted to the floorboards. Bob Ewell fell on his knife. I can prove it. Atticus wheeled around. His hands dug into his pockets. Heck, can't you even try to see it my way? You've got children of your own, but I'm older than you. When mine are grown, 
I'll be an old man if I'm still around. But right now, I'm... If they don't trust me, they won't trust anybody. Jim and Scout know what happened. If they hear of me saying downtown something different happened, heck, I won't have them anymore. I can't live one way in town and another way in my home. Mr. Tate rocked on his heels and said patiently, he had flung Jem down. He stumbled over a root under that tree, and look, I can show you. Mr. Tate reached in his side pocket and withdrew a long switchblade knife. As he did so, Dr. Reynolds came to the door. The sun deceased's under that tree, doctor, just inside the schoolyard. Got a flashlight? Better have this one. I can ease around and turn my car lights on, said Dr. Reynolds, but he took Mr. Tate's flashlight. Jem's all right. He won't wake up tonight, I hope, so don't worry. That the knife that killed him, heck? No, sir. Still in him. Looked like a kitchen knife from the handle. Ken ought to be there with the hearse by now, doctor. Night. Mr. Tate flicked open the knife. It was like this, he said. He held the knife and pretended to stumble. As he leaned forward, his left arm went down in front of him. See there? Stabbed himself through that soft stuff between his ribs. His whole weight drove it in. Mr. Tate closed the knife and jammed it back in his pocket. Scout is eight years old, he said. She was too scared to know exactly what went on. You would be surprised, Atticus said grimly. I'm not saying she made it up. I'm saying she was too scared to know exactly what happened. It was mighty dark out there, black as ink. It'd take somebody mighty used to the dark to make a competent witness. I won't have it, Atticus said softly. God damn it, I'm not thinking of Jem. Mr. Tate's boot hit the floorboard so hard the lights in Miss Morty's bedroom went on. Miss Stephanie Crawford's lights went on. Atticus and Mr. Tate looked across the street, then at each other. They waited. When Mr. Tate spoke again, his voice was barely audible. Mr. Finch, I hate to fight you when you're like this. You've been under a strain tonight no man should ever have to go through. Why you ain't in the bed from it, I don't know. But I do know that for once you haven't been able to put two and two together. And we've got to settle this tonight because tomorrow will be too late. Bob Ewell's got a kitchen knife in his craw. Mr. Tate added that Atticus wasn't going to stand there and maintain that any boy Jem's size with a busted arm had fight enough left in him to tackle and kill a grown man in the pitch dark. Heck, said Atticus abruptly, that was a switchblade you were waving. Where'd you get it? Took it off a drunk man, Mr. Tate answered coolly. I was trying to remember. Mr. Ewell was on me, then he went down. Jem must have gotten up, at least I thought. Heck, I said I took it off a drunk man downtown tonight. You will probably found that kitchen knife in the dump somewhere. Honed it down and bided his time. Just bided his time. Atticus made his way to the swing and sat down. His hands dangled limply between his knees. He was looking at the floor. He had moved with the same slowness that night in front of the jail, 
when I thought it took him forever to fold his newspaper and toss it in his chair. Mr. Tate clumped softly around the porch. It ain't your decision, Mr. Finch. It's all mine. It's my decision and my responsibility. For once, if you don't see it my way, there's not much you can do about it. If you want to try, I'll call you a liar to your face. Your boy never stabbed Bob Ewell, he said slowly. Didn't come near a mile of it, and now you know it. All he wanted to do was get him and his sister safely home. Mr. Tate stopped pacing. He stopped in front of Atticus, and his back was to us. I'm not a very good man, sir, but I am sheriff of Macomb County. Lived in this town all my life, and I'm going on 43 years old. Know everything that's happened here since before I was born. There's a black boy dead for no reason, and the man responsible for it's dead. Let the dead bury the dead this time, Mr. Finch. Let the dead bury the dead. Mr. Tate went to the swing and picked up his hat. It was lying beside Atticus. Mr. Tate pushed back his hair and put his hat on. I never heard tell that it's against the law for a citizen to do his utmost to prevent a crime from being committed, which is exactly what he did. But maybe you'll say it's my duty to tell the town all about it and not hush it up. Know what had happened then? All the ladies in Maycomb, including my wife, would be knocking on his door bringing angel food cakes. To my way of thinking, Mr. Finch, taking the one man who's done you and this town a great service and dragging him with his shy ways into the limelight, to me, that's a sin. It's a sin, and I'm not about to have it on my head. If it was any other man, it'd be different. But not this man, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate was trying to dig a hole in the floor with the toe of his boot. He pulled his nose, then he massaged his left arm. I may not be much, Mr. Finch, but I'm still sheriff of Macomb County, and Bob Ewell fell on his knife. Good night, sir. Mr. Tate stamped off the porch and strode across the front yard. His car door slammed and he drove away. Atticus sat looking at the floor for a long time. Finally, he raised his head. Scout, he said, Mr. Ewell fell on his knife. Can you possibly understand? Atticus looked like he needed cheering up. I ran to him and hugged him and kissed him with all my might. Yes, sir, I understand, I reassured him. Mr. Tate was right. Atticus disengaged himself and looked at me. What do you mean? Well, it'd be sort of like shooting a mockingbird, wouldn't it? Atticus put his face in my hair and rubbed it. When he got up and walked across the porch into the shadows, his youthful step had returned. Before he went inside the house, he stopped in front of Boo Radley. Thank you for my children, Arthur, he said. Chapter 31 when Boo Radley shuffled to his feet, light from the living room windows glistened on his forehead. Every move he made was uncertain, as if he were not sure his hands and feet could make proper contact with the things he touched. He coughed his dreadful, railing cough, and was so shaken he had to sit down again. His hand searched for his hip pocket, and he pulled out a handkerchief. He coughed into it, 
Then he wiped his forehead. Having been so accustomed to his absence, I found it incredible that he had been sitting beside me all this time, present. He had not made a sound. Once more he got to his feet. He turned to me and nodded toward the front door. You'd like to say good night to Jim, wouldn't you, Mr. Arthur? Come right in. I led him down the hall. Aunt Alexandra was sitting by Jem's bed. Come in, Arthur, she said. He's still asleep. Dr. Reynolds gave him a heavy sedative. Jean Louise, is your father in the living room? Yes, ma'am, I think so. I'll just go speak to him a minute. Dr. Reynolds left some... Her voice trailed away. Boo had drifted to a corner of the room, where he stood with his chin up, peering from a distance at Jem. I took him by the hand, a hand surprisingly warm for its whiteness. I tugged him a little, and he allowed me to lead him to Jem's bed. Dr. Reynolds had made a tent-like arrangement over Jem's arm, to keep the cover off, I guess, and Boo leaned forward and looked over it. An expression of timid curiosity was on his face, as though he had never seen a boy before. His mouth was slightly open, and he looked at Jem from head to foot. Boo's hand came up, but he let it drop to his side. You can pet him, Mr. Arthur. He's asleep. You couldn't if he was awake, though. He wouldn't let you, I found myself explaining. Go ahead. Boo's hand hovered over Jem's head. Go on, sir. He's asleep. His hand came down lightly on Jem's hair. I was beginning to learn his body English. His hand tightened on mine, and he indicated that he wanted to leave. I led him to the front porch, where his uneasy steps halted. He was still holding my hand, and he gave no sign of letting me go. Will you take me home? He almost whispered it, in the voice of a child afraid of the dark. I put my foot on the top step and stopped. I would lead him through our house, but I would never lead him home. Mr. Arthur? Bend your arm down here, like that. That's right, sir. I slipped my hand into the crook of his arm. He had to stoop a little to accommodate me. But if Miss Stephanie Crawford was watching from her upstairs window, she would see Arthur Radley escorting me down the sidewalk, as any gentleman would do. We came to the street light on the corner, and I wondered how many times Dill had stood there hugging the fat pole, watching, waiting, hoping. I wondered how many times Jem and I had made this journey. But I entered the Radley front gate for the second time in my life. Boo and I walked up the steps to the porch. His fingers found the front doorknob. He gently released my hand, opened the door, went inside, and shut the door behind him. I never saw him again. Neighbors bring food with death, and flowers with sickness, and little things in between. Boo was our neighbor. He gave us two soap dolls, a broken watch and chain, a pair of good luck pennies, and our lives. But neighbors give in return. We never put back into the tree what we took out of it. We had given him nothing, and it made me sad. I turned to go home. Street lights winked down the street all the way to town. I had never seen our neighborhood from this angle. There were Miss Mordy's, Miss Stephanie's, there was our house. I could see the porch swing. 
Miss Rachel's house was beyond us, plainly visible. I could even see Mrs. DuBose's. I looked behind me. To the left of the brown door was a long, shuttered window. I walked to it, stood in front of it, and turned around. In daylight, I thought, you could see to the post office corner. Daylight. In my mind, the night faded. It was daytime, and the neighborhood was busy. Miss Stephanie Crawford crossed the street to tell the latest to Miss Rachel. Miss Morty bent over her azaleas. It was summertime, and two children scampered down the sidewalk toward a man approaching in the distance. The man waved, and the children raced each other to him. It was still summertime, and the children came closer. A boy trudged down the sidewalk, dragging a fishing pole behind him. A man stood waiting, with his hands on his hips. Summertime, and his children played in the front yard with their friend, enacting a strange little drama of their own invention. It was fall, and his children fought on the sidewalk in front of Mrs. DuBose's. The boy helped his sister to her feet, and they made their way home. Fall, and his children trotted to and fro around the corner, the day's woes and triumphs on their faces. They stopped at an oak tree, delighted, puzzled, apprehensive. Winter, and his children shivered at the front gate, silhouetted against a blazing house. Winter, and a man walked into the street, dropped his glasses, and shot a dog. Summer, and he watched his children's heart break. Autumn again, and Boo's children needed him. Atticus was right. One time he said, you never really know a man until you stand in his shoes and walk around in them. Just standing on the Radley porch was enough. The street lights were fuzzy from the fine rain that was falling. As I made my way home, I felt very old, but when I looked at the tip of my nose, I could see fine misty beads but looking cross-eyed made me dizzy, so I quit. As I made my way home, I thought, what a thing to tell Jem tomorrow. He'd be so mad he missed it, he wouldn't speak to me for days. As I made my way home, I thought Jem and I would get grown, but there wasn't much else left for us to learn, except possibly algebra. I ran up the steps and into the house. Aunt Alexandra had gone to bed, and Atticus's room was dark. I would see if Jem might be reviving. Atticus was in Jem's room, sitting by his bed. He was reading a book. Is Jem awake yet? Sleeping peacefully. He won't be awake until morning. Oh, are you sitting up with him? just for an hour or so. Go to bed, Scout. You've had a long day. Well, I think I'll stay with you for a while. Suit yourself, said Atticus. It must have been after midnight, and I was puzzled by his amiable acquiescence. He was shrewder than I, however. The moment I sat down, I began to feel sleepy. What you reading? I asked. Atticus turned the book over. Something of gems, called The Grey Ghost. I was suddenly awake. Why'd you get that one? Honey, I don't know. Just picked it up. One of the few things I haven't read, he said pointedly. Read it out loud, please, Atticus. It's real scary. No, he said. You've had enough scaring for a while. This is too... Atticus, I wasn't scared. 
He raised his eyebrows, and I protested, Leastways, not till I started telling Mr. Tate about it. Jim wasn't scared. Asked him, and he said he wasn't. Besides, nothing's real scary, except in books. Atticus opened his mouth to say something, but shut it again. He took his thumb from the middle of the book and turned back to the first page. I moved over and leaned my head against his knee. Hrm, he said. The Grey Ghost by Secretary Hawkins. Chapter One. I willed myself to stay awake, but the rain was so soft. And the room was so warm, and his voice was so deep, and his knee was so snug that I slept. Seconds later, it seemed, his shoe was gently nudging my ribs. He lifted me to my feet and walked me to my room. Heard every word you said, I muttered. Wasn't sleep at all. It's about a ship and th- Three-fingered Fred and Stoner's boy. He unhooked my overalls, leaned me against him, and pulled them off. He held me up with one hand and reached for my pajamas with the other. Yeah, and they all thought it was Stoner's boy messing up their clubhouse and throwing ink all over it. And he guided me to the bed and sat me down. He lifted my legs and put me under the cover. And they chased him, and never could catch him, cause they didn't know what he looked like. And Atticus, when they finally saw him, why he hadn't done any of those things. Atticus, he was real nice. His hands were under my chin, pulling up the cover, tucking it around me. Most people are, Scout, when you finally see them. He turned out the light and went into Jem's room. He would be there all night, and he would be there when Jem waked up in the morning. The end. You've been listening to "To Kill a Mockingbird" by Harper Lee, narrated by Sally Darling. If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends "A Tree Grows in Brooklyn" by Betty Smith, narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt, and a separate piece by John Knowles, narrated by Spike McClure. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog. Including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So, to order another recorded book, or for a copy of our latest listing, please call us using the toll-free number found on the back of the book. You can order by phone with any major credit card, or by writing to us, or by faxing us. Don't forget to ask about easy thirty-day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse the catalog, hear about the latest releases, place orders, or tune into.